um, And I want to thank you all. There, there's some very distinguished guests in here. You make me feel important. Good. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gerard Dache. I'm the executive director of the Government Blockchain Association. I'd like to thank you for attending and welcome you to the future of Money Governs the Law. This is our second iteration of this. The first iteration of this we did at the United States Capitol in the Congressional Auditorium. Uh, we did it in January of 2020. That was the day that uh, President Trump banned all incoming flights from China, and it was also the day that he was being impeached uh, on the floor right above us. So uh, that was fairly historic, but then everything shut down uh, for quite a while. <clears throat> so we're just now starting to get back to in-person in events, and uh, this is somewhat uh, of a historic event. Um, I, I want to say, and I, I've told some of my colleagues a couple things. One is we were asked several times if we we're going to cancel this event, because the COVID numbers, uh, as many of you know, in the last month or so, basically went up to about 10 times what they were when, uh, uh, when we shut down the entire economy and, and, and threw $14 trillion of, of uh, printed money at the problem. Um, and so we, had an, we were originally uh, slated about 500, and uh, uh, the cancellations, people contacting us and saying, uh, I'm sorry, I can't travel. Um, then the mandate, the vaccine mandate came in, which knocked out about 30%. <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, so I was telling people, look, even if it's just me and a cell phone, we're going on with this event, right? We have a tr uh, our last event, we had about 11,000 people online uh, watch the event. Uh, I don't know what the numbers will be this time. We'll, we'll find out. It will be recorded on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to watch this. Uh, and if you can't make, you know, you have business meetings or anything, um, every session will be recorded and on that channel. <clears throat> All right. Um, I do want to say one, one last thing. This is somewhat of a watershed event, and I'll tell you why. <clears throat> Um, the sponsor for this event includes a uh, uh, senior policy guy for, uh, uh, for Bitcoin Magazine. And we've got folks who are going to be speaking to you about cities and states and municipalities adopting uh, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Uh, we're going to have a visit later from the ambassador of El Salvador, uh, who, who will be able to share with us uh, their experiences. And what's happening, there's, there's, there's two things happening. Right. From the bottom, there's a groundswell of this activity, cities and states considering and actually adopting cryptocurrency. And at the national level, there's somewhat of a degree of panic to try to figure out how to deal with this. And at this event, <clears throat> we have folks that are tuning in, um, including Deputy Assistant Secretaries of the Treasury, um, ambassadors, people uh, from World Bank, IMF, these, these global and national institutions, right? who for the longest time said, <clears throat> you know, talk to me about blockchain, don't talk to me about cryptocurrency, right? Cryptocurrency is a scam. And at the same time, we've got folks that are actually implementing it at state, at, at city, state, and national levels. And those two things are coming together. And I think for probably the very first time, we have a very, very serious discussion of those two, those two elements coming together. So I personally believe that this event that we're going to participate in the, la in the next uh, today and tomorrow is literally going to be historic. These videos are going to be watched all over the world. And the most important thing is the Roaring Twenties reception, right? <laughs> because for those of you who have been to GBA events before, those are the hallmark, and those are where the deals get made, right? So uh, we have a lot of folks from um, uh, the Congress that are not going to be here during the day, but they will be. There, so you'll meet a lot of really fascinating and interesting people. If you don't have your ticket, um, you know, come out to us on the front desk, and we'll get you that. So, without further ado, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce your MC for the next two days. Uh, David Hook is an esteemed guest. We're very fortunate to have him here. He's going to be playing the MC role, but he's a wealth of knowledge in, in the government, the federal space. Um, David is the chief of staff of the Veterans Affairs, the, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. National Artificial Intelligence Center, right? And so uh, uh, it is with d great pride that uh, I introduce to you your distinguished MC for the next two days, David Hook.
thank you so much for that warm introduction. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I'm going to keep my mask on today uh, for two reasons. Number one, I get incredible uh, beard mask going on. And number two, I, I saw in the news recently that people are more attractive with masks on, is, is what they're saying in recent studies. So uh, I'm going to do that today. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, part of the uh, approval process to getting here is why would the chief of staff of the VA's National Artificial Intelligence Institute be at a GBA event? And I said, first of all, I'm a member, you know, and so I'm, I'm really pleased to support this. And I said, but second of all, you know, we're both in, engaged in emerging technologies, and one of the things that we share is the importance of trust and trustworthiness. And I, so I think that there are themes and solutions and use cases to be explored to both artificial intelligence and blockchain that wouldn't be possible without both technologies. And so, you know, very interested in, in learning more and seeing, you know, as this evolves, and just excited to see what comes next. So uh, I've been asked to keep it brief so that we can stay on schedule. I'm here to introduce our next speaker. So we've got uh, Dr. Jim Liu from Johns Hopkins. He is uh, an associate professor of uh, finance. And we've got William Michael uh, Cunningham, who is a adjunct professor at Georgetown teaching uh, economics. So. Welcome to the stage, gentlemen. Come on up. Um, all right. Uh, you have two professors up here. Uh, first off, we would like to thank the GBA. If you guys are not members, uh, this is a call out to the world. You should definitely come and become a member for the Government Blockchain Association and get um, actively involved and help build this community. At the end of the day, Gerard has done a wonderful job, and David Hook is running sort of the DC component. David Hook is an amazing individual. He is the Chief of Staff of the Department of Veterans Affairs, National Artificial Intelligence Institute. They have a wonderful competition. I encourage everyone to sort of participate, and you could sort of talk to David afterwards about, you know, what are the requirements for the competition. But it's a great way for small businesses, especially emerging technologies, to get integrated into government agencies and organizations, especially the VA. So a big shout out for um, David Hook, and thanks for getting involved. We really appreciate that. Um, so my name is Jim Liu. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins Business School, and um, actually. I proposed this cryptos and blockchains course about four and a half years ago, and when I proposed it, I got yelled at. <laughs> so, so we've come a long ways from there. It's one of the most popular classes. Is It's always full of MBA students, and there's a lot of demand, and the next generation really wants to get involved. I also uh, co-founded SoCat. SoCat is a crypto asset management company, and also we develop software solutions for AI, machine learning, and blockchains. So that's me, and I'll pass it over to Bill. Thank you, uh, doctor. Uh, we didn't, we, you know, because everything is shut down, we didn't get a chance to, like, uh, rehearse this. So I just want to warn you guys, okay? So I'm Bill Cunningham. I'm uh, an economist. I run uh, Creative Investment Research. I'm also an adjunct uh, at uh, Georgetown. Uh, and that's really about it. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to step off while you go through your, so the way we set this up was, you know, he was going to start and kind of go through uh, uh, a lot of very good information on money. You know, functions of money, purposes of money, history of money, all of that sort of stuff. And then I'm going to step in and try to talk against all of that. Okay, <laughs> so I think, I think that's what, what we this, determined. This so. is the University of Chicago way, right? So we're going to, we want to stir some thoughts. And whether you agree with us or you don't dis or disagree with, that's perfectly fine. We're all learning together as, as sort of we're reaching out to understand how blockchain is going to change the world. And in particular, we want the U.S. and D.C. to lead that charge. Yep. One last thing, Mr. Kennedy, my new intern from American <laughs> University, showed up to the, This is like the first live intern event I've, I've had in two years. So thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for showing up. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll thank, come thank back you. Up. Thank you, Bill. Uh, what a great internship. <laughs> Hang out with the professor and go to a live uh, amazing uh, blockchains conference. So we're, let's get started here. Um, this is the functions and properties of money. And I'm just going to set the stage here and I'm going to put in a couple of uh, sort of thoughts as we're going through these slides. And Bill's going to come over here and he's going to wreck everything because we want people to start sort of thinking about these things. All right. So next slide, please. Uh, you have the oh, I got to do it. Sorry about that, guys. 
Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover today, a brief history of money, definition of money, Jabon's four functions, and we'll learn a little, um, um, little fun little poem, property is a money and digital money, and then we're going to hand it over to Bill to wreck everything. <laughs> So our little history lesson is actually very important because what's happening here is over time, let's look at the big picture, okay? Let's not just get caught up in the recent past century, right? Let's look all the way back in history. So what is money? It's something of value. 10,000 BC it was the beginning of bartering. People were bartering, right? With what? Well, you know, cattle and animals, that was considered money. Could you imagine paying some senators and Congress people, you bring over some cattle or some deers and give it to them as their compensation for their salary? That would be pretty interesting, right? But then we moved on, we became more sophisticated, we started using seashells as money. <laughs> now, I could just only imagine the counterfeit that existed there at the time where you just go to the seas and get more seashells and say, hey, I'm rich, right? Uh, next up, you know, uh, we started to use uh, metal. This is 1000 BC. Metal money co uh, and coins, bronze and copper. Not surprisingly, this innovation came out of China, and we'll see that China actually leads in the development of new sort of materials for money. In 500 BC, we started to use uh, silver, and we would stamp on it <laughs> gods and emperors. I mean, if you, you know, have any change in your pocket, you pull it out, you can sort of take a look at what we do now with, um, in terms of stamping faces onto our money. And uh, 118 BC, uh, China introduced leather money, okay? Um, and then now we go to sort of AD. Paper currency was introduced in China in eight, 806. In 1860, we went on to the gold standard. So now money was backed by gold. And this is actually pretty interesting because when you start asking people about what is money, you know, what about gold, they kind of sort of know that history but they don't really know the history of livestock and the history of seashells and so forth and leather, right? So, you know, what we're seeing now, beginning to the sort of modern day, we were on the gold standard. We sort of came off the gold standard. Bretton Woods put it sort of us back on the gold standard with the U.S. dollar being backed by gold, and everyone sort of linked to the U.S. dollar. And then we terminated the U.S. dollar and gold link in the United States, and now we started introducing fiat. And so what is fiat? Fiat says that your dollar is backed by the government. Okay, so if you trust the government, which I do, because I know there's a lot of good people out there trying to do good things, then you trust the money. However, however, this is the big however. Is the amount of US dollars fixed? Kind of like Bitcoin, remember? Bitcoin's only fixed, 21 million. Can we ask the Federal Reserve to say, hey, fix the supply and we'll kill inflation because what is inflation? Basically, the dollar loses its purchasing power. So you can't use the same dollar to buy the same amount of baskets of goods. This is well known and you know, we, we teach MBA students all the time about inflation, but we haven't really seen inflation in some time. So it's kind of a new sort of concept, especially for the uh, younger generation. So now we're in 2009, not surprisingly after the financial crisis, 2008, people started to lose some confidence in our system, right? And we have the introduction of Bitcoins, 2009. And here we are now, right, in 2022. And Bitcoin has become more and more mainstream. Everybody's talking about it, just turn on CNBC, right? And we're starting to understand what this thing is doing, which is very interesting. But who is the central player in Bitcoins? Who's in charge? Everybody. Is, is there a government? Is there a Congress? Is there a Treasury? Is there a printing press? Who's in charge? The community. The community, the network, right? And so now what we have done is basically the power of concentrated sort of controlling of money has been dispersed to the network. And now each of the individual miners and the people who are participating in the network, they're in charge. And now I would argue that this is a natural evolution of efficient markets, okay? This, it, it, let's view this as the market's behaving efficiently. And now the power is going to the edge of the networks. And Bitcoin, Bitcoin and Charles Hoskins last year came up here and said he was talking about freedom. And that is so un American. <laughs> America is all about freedom at the edge of the network, which is you guys, US citizens, right? So this is empowering, and this is very much in line in everything that sort of America stands for. And that's why I personally think, you know, America should lead this. Uh, blockchain's revolution, because it's in line with sort of what we, what we do. Okay, 
Now let's move on. So what is money? Money, according to Wikipedia, is any item, cattle, coins, shells, right? It could be electronic money or verifiable record, a digital ledger in the cloud that everybody can see that is generally accepted as payments for goods and services. So what does that mean, generally accepted? If the majority of people start to believe in Dogecoin as acceptable, right, it may not be our generation, it may be the generation uh, below us, or maybe it's a generation that hasn't been born yet. If they start to accept that as payment, then what happens to Dogecoin? To the moon, it becomes money, right? And so those are the things that we have to sort of think about, right? Um, what is sort of acceptable as payments for goods and services? Or repayment of debt, and we'll see this concept. Debt is just basically borrowing money today, doing something or lending money in the future. The money goes through time. So money can go through space where we can interact with money now across many different individuals, or we can sort of borrow from the future. And that's a lot of what we're doing, right? <laughs> we're borrowing from our kids' future and our kids' kids' future, right, to spend things now. But that's just basically the present value of money. Also, taxes. So we, 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 you could use payments for goods and services and repayments of debt, such as taxes. We all live in the United States of America. We all pay Uncle Sam our taxes. Um, in a particular country, we're in the United States of America. Now, this is where it gets really, really interesting. And I want to really challenge you guys to think about this and understand the multiple dimensions of you, 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 you as an individual. In a particular country, you're only in the United States, or social economic context. So what does that mean? That means I'm part of a government blockchain association. So if they launch a token, I'll, I'll, I'll hold that token in my wallet, and maybe I'll give it to Gerard or his wife, Kathy, right? Maybe they use that as sort of the membership fee. So now there's another social economic context. I'm part of GBA. What happens if Johns Hopkins launches their own token or coin? I'm a professor there. I'll probably buy some of that. So then there's another layer of my life that I'll be transacting with, quote, money in the Johns Hopkins system. Maybe I use the money to sort of book time with another professor so I can, you know, bounce some ideas off. So now I have the U.S. dollar in my pocket. I have a little cryptos, maybe Ether, ETH, and Bitcoins. I have the GBA coin, and I have a Johns Hopkins coin. But imagine that for your guys, for yourself, right, how many different dimensions are you going to be associated with, and which ones would you believe in, right? So I think money is fascinating. I really like this definition because it's all-encompassing. And this is what we have to sort of think about, right? We can't get so pigeonholed just to think about money as the US dollar backed by, you know, fiat, right? OK. Now, in 1875, there's an economist. Um, um, he was an English economist and logician. He kind of got money right. This is a long time ago, OK? And everything that you hear about money follows sort of Javon's four functions of money. Number one, a median of exchange. So you've heard that many times, money is a median of exchange. The other one is a common measure of value. So a unit of account, right? Because we have to count money. We use pennies, <laughs> right? Uh, Bitcoin uses Satoshis and so forth. Um, also, it's a standard of value. And the standard of value is deferred payment. So it has to do with sort of, you know, the present value of money. So think about money moving through time, right? If I gave you a dollar today, uh, you know, how much would it be worth in one year time? So it's going to be discounted. So we teach uh, business school students about present value formulas, present value now, how to push it to the future value. If you're going to receive $100 in the future, how do you discount it to the present? That's just measuring the time dimension. And what's really interesting about that dimension is most of the times uh, we use the risk-free rate of return, right? So you're going to pretty much certainly receive that $100. How much is it worth to you today? So it depends on the interest rate, right? Now, this is something I want to challenge everyone to think about. And one of the reasons why I got started out in finance was because of this simple story. And it had to do with arbitrage. And when the professor at the University of Chicago was going through and teaching me about arbitrage and the whole class as undergraduates, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. So the story goes as follows. You're walking down Main Street, and there's two banks. One bank has an interest rate of 5%. You can borrow and lend at 5%. And another bank has an interest rate of 10%, 5% and 10%. So what can you do? 
this thing called arbitrage. You will go over to the first bank and you will borrow money at 5%, then you go over to the second bank and you would lend it at 10%, and that 5% differential is your arbitrage profit. And how much would you do that? As much as possible until the market forces drove the 5% and the 10% to equal, right? Everybody sort of learns this in business school. I thought that was a fascinating story. I always thought to myself, would I ever see this kind of arbitrage, maybe on Wall Street, maybe on Main Street? Maybe whenever there's a crypto world and the real world, right? And so that's what's really fascinating about these things, is that there is uh, some arbitrage abilities between the real world and crypto world, and we're still developing. But the key point is that the safety and the belief of a, a bank that's on Main Street right now in the real world, if we can get that level of safety in the crypto world, then there's going to be this amazing arbitrage opportunity. And all that has to do with this uh, sort of deferred payment standard of value, which has to do with um, different interest rates in different worlds. So if we were in class, I'd make all the students memorize this for the next class. But basically, there's a, a little, little statement here. Money's a matter of functions for a medium, a measure, a standard, a store. Now, obviously, we're not in class, so you don't have to memorize this for <laughs> next year, but I thought it would be just kind of fun for you guys. All right. All right, uh, there's a wonderful uh, money flower, and I'm not going to go into this, but um, the central bank cryptocurrencies, these guys did a wonderful job of laying out a universally acceptable electronic central bank and peer-to-peer. -peer. This is a great flower, so uh, uh, hats off to um, these authors here. But you know, here's a little brief history. Um, Bitcoins wasn't the first. People have tried to create some kind of e-cash, right? DigiCash, David Chom, he tried to do it. It didn't work. That was 1983. E-gold e was tried. It was the first, quote, internet money. Government shut it down, OK? So then PayPal actually introduced the US denominated service dollars in 1998, and it was OK. So what is important to understand is that people are trying to develop this technology. Entrepreneurs are trying different things. And so the government is very important in terms of sort of allowing things to go through or not. They can absolutely shut things down. My point of view is we have to understand that there's a lot of entrepreneurs and technologists tinkering around trying to find a better way. And when they find a better way, and if it's acceptable, then we should encourage that. Because at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of jobs created. Um, I would love to go down to Congress and tell those guys to recruit all the top um, crypto engineers. And um, uh, there's a, some uh, crypto entrepreneurs who are overseas. We should bring them all back, especially in Baltimore. <laughs> we could get some you know, CZ and Binance and... You know, there, there's a, another guy who did polka dot. You know, if you could bring those people back to the United States, that would be amazing. Um, uh, Ethereum launched in 2015. It was uh, 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 basically Vitalik saw that Bitcoin wasn't enough, and they wanted to add smart contract platforms. And on top of um, Ethereum, other sort of founders said, "Hey, Ethereum's not enough. We need to solve this trilemma: decentralization, security, and speed." And they branched off. Okay. Now we're sort of at the down, we won't talk too much of that, but it's very interesting how this is developing. All right. Now I'll send it over to Bill, who's going to crush all these ideas. <laughs> That's an excellent job. Excellent job. I really appreciate you. Well, I've got about four minutes, so I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, you know, the bottom line is, is that one of the functions, oh, I think, I'm, am I pointing this the right way? Point it over there. Okay, very good. Let's see if that works. Other way around. Other way around. Okay. <laughs> Boy. There you go. All right. So here's the deal. There's a fifth function of money that cryptocurrency brings to the fore. It is social control. Social control. That's the fifth function of money. The other thing is, this is why the central banks are so worried about cryptocurrency. Here's a, a, one of, a modern example, or I guess kind of a current uh, example that expresses why they're so concerned. So as you know, Biden has threatened to kick Russia off of SWIFT, right? If you're Vladimir Putin, what do you do? What currency do you use if you get kicked off of SWIFT? 
use Bitcoin. Use something. It doesn't matter. Kick me off a of Swift. I don't care. I'll just, uh, you know, I will adopt my entire economy to a Bitcoin standard. So that's the issue with respect to social control. Now, what do we mean by social control? Dr. Lou put up this chart. Social control encompasses the entire flower. And there are two things I want to point out. Number one, money is not universally access accessible. There are certain groups, certain people who do not have access to money. We know that because there's a certain percentage of the U.S. population that does not have banking accounts or checking accounts or money. Why is that? And the other thing is, in terms of uh, being central bank issued, fiat currency being central bank issued, that's also a myth. It's basically issued by commercial banks. The way you know that is that there are no poor people who are on the Federal Reserve Board. There are no welfare, welfare mothers. There, yeah, none of that group is on the Federal Reserve Board. It's all bankers, which is fine. I mean, I get it. I get it. You want people who have technical expertise in finance to be on the board of the Federal Reserve. Bunch of economists. I get it. You know. But that definitely uh, relates to the issue of who controls money and how they control money. So, in terms of social control, the first level is, is that only a central bank has the right to issue uh, uh, fiat currency. The monetary social control theory that I've come up with kind of explains the manner by which uh, uh, money and currency determines the allocation of primary resources needed for life cycle survival in a functioning modern society. What are those things? Food, water, first aid, medical care, thermal resources and shelter, sanitation, hygiene, lighting, communication. You can't get any of those things in a modern functioning economy without money. You can kind of barter for them, sure, but at some point some money is going to change hands in order for you to be able to live. And then, and then finally, the racial monetary control theory explains why certain groups are, it, the, the current system supports the historical distribution of economic resources by ethnic or racial group. Once again, the way you know that is look at the black-white wealth distributions. Here's the thing about that, black-white wealth distributions. For that black-white wealth distribution to be valid and justified, it would have to mean that black people are inferior economically, socially, whatever, uh, actually inferior. But we know, we know through a number of examples that that's simply not the case. So then you have to ask yourself the question, why is money distributed in that way? It's because the, the, the systems that have been put into place exist to keep money out of the hands of certain people, certain groups of people. That's kind of what the, oh. This was a thing, Dave Chappelle on social control and money. I'm going to skip through that. Uh, he, he, no? Okay, all right. Um, you guys want to hit that? Let's see if we can. Economist David Chappelle, he really goes through this. Okay, there you go. Hopefully the sound will come through. Uh-oh, let's get that sound. Okay. Give us a second here, I think. Well, there we go. Let's see if I uh, get some sound here in a second. But basically what he does is he goes over all of these social control uh, issues. Uh, in a very funny, uh, very interesting way. I probably should have given you guys the YouTube link also, but we'll see if we can't get this going. Give, give me a second. Again, this is the first, uh, the first uh, event uh, that's been held uh, in a while. Yep, Dave Chappelle. I don't know if I... Um, 
Go back to the, it's whatever the picture is of him uh, uh, that's uh, on the video. I think, uh, keep going, keep going. It's him in like a yellow shirt. No, 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 not, not, not there yet. Um, all right, give us a second. We will work this out. It's worth the wait. It's, it really is worth the wait. search on YouTube with him in that yellow t-shirt and that uh, gray jacket. Uh, you, I would encourage you all to do this at home also, you know, kind of take a look at it. And it's, it's where he's talking about money. And he's talking about the role that it plays in society. And from a very specific perspective with respect to his vacation at Disney World. <laughs> Basically, because Disney has their own money. And it's an interesting take on the social, con I think, an interesting take on the social control aspects uh, uh, of money. And then he also talks uh, uh, later in the video about U.S. currency. He says that, you know, we took Saddam Hussein off of the currency uh, uh, in Iraq. And then he said, well, I thought about our currency. Our currency looks like uh, uh, slaveholders. Uh, uh, it looks like baseball cards for slaveholders, you know? So, so it really does start to speak to uh, uh, issues of, of social control. So this is the key. There is a fifth function of money, which none of the Western economists have dared to discuss and talk about until now, because cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, forces that functionality into the open. You can't ignore the social control aspects uh, uh, of money. And until we do that, we're always going to be behind the curve because surfacing that social control functionality explains the reluctance of central banks, of regulators. It also explains the attraction of the technology to people like El Salvador and to Russia, kind of why they are glomming on to this technology. It's because it gets them out from under a social control mechanism which has not necessarily helped them to maximize social return for their societies. So it is with any underserved, discriminated against group in the world. That's why you can't stop this. You can try, you know. And, and again, it's not like Bitcoin will be the end all and be all. I, I don't think, I think you're going to get Bitcoin 2.0. I think you're going to get Bitcoin 3. I don't know what it looks like. All I know is that once this type of technology has surfaced and has proven its utility in helping people to self-actualize, then uh, you can't really get rid of it. You really should try to uh, get along. Final thing I'll say, final thing I'll say is this. If you think about why Satoshi created Bitcoin and by extension blockchain, it was because of the failure of regulators to protect the public interest in the years leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. What happened was investment banks utilized the dollar standing as global reserve currency to distribute and sell fraudulent financial products around the world. Regulators should have stepped in. They should have said, hey, you can't use the U.S. dollar status as global reserve currency to sell subprime loans and securities in the U.K. and in China and in all other places, because that's what you're doing. You're using the fact that the dollar is distributed all over the world to sell these securities in, uh, knowing that those securities did not represent the kind of value that you claim that they represented. In a normal world, in a fully functional uh, uh, financial regulatory regime, the regulators in the U.S., because it's our dollar, regulators in the U.S. would have stepped in and stopped that. Say, hey, you can't use 
the dollar's status as global reserve currency for uh, profit maximizing motives for individual financial institutions. My hope, and one of the reasons why I'm so engaged with GBA, and thank you, by the way, Gerard, for uh, inviting me and letting me talk, because Gerard said, whoa, you know, man, if you think that, hey, we got a conference coming up, maybe you can say that. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm so engaged here is because I do think that this new technology represents an opportunity to help maximize social return uh, using these, these new digital, uh, uh, digital tools. So I think that's about it. Look for the, we'll post the, the Dave Chappelle uh, thing online so that you can take a look at it. But please take a look at that. I want to thank you. I want to thank Jim. I want to thank uh, my intern, Mr. Kennedy. I want to thank uh, Gerard uh, uh, for allowing me to get up here. Uh, are we doing Q&A? Are we doing questions? OK, no, we're not doing questions because we're running into time. We'll do it at the end of the day. So uh, please write down your questions. And uh, I'll be around also. So if you have any comments, questions, concerns, please let me know. With that, I'm going to invite our moderator back to the stage and uh, say thank you very much. I'm supposed to have a cheat sheet, but I'm going to go off of what I've got in the program here. Our next speakers are going to be talking about monetary monitoring, influence, and control. We've got Mark Montoya, who is the CFO of our own GBA, and we've got Pamela Clegg, who is the Vice President for Financial Analytics at CypherTech. So welcome to the stage. Oh, there they are. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, meeting and a lot of people here than, than last time, which is awesome. Uh, so I'm, I'm Mark Montoy. I'm actually the CDO for the uh, Government Blockchain Association. And I'm going to be speaking with uh, Pamela Craig, Clegg, Pamela Clegg. And she's with CypherTrace, a MasterCard company. Right? Yeah, there you go. So that's, uh, that's great news. So I want to talk about, um, and it ties directly into what Professor Liu and Professor Cunningham said. I want to talk about Bitcoin and fiat money. Um, and you guys already gave definitions. I have definitions also. But um, I want to talk about it because it is a competitor to the existing social contract. And look, uh, Professor Cunningham talked about the monetary social contract theory. It's the same thing I want to talk about today. But uh, the social contract between established institutions, society, and people. So it fl flows right into what they talked about. OK, let's see. There we go. Um, so I want to talk about definitions. We already talked about social control, but to give you an actual definition of it, uh, uh, social control is a set of rules and standards uh, in a society that keeps individuals bound to a certain standard. And we find that a lot throughout society now. There's, in, there's informal and there's formal. So from an informal standpoint, we find it in schools, in clubs, right? So we have that in uh, various families, right? We have this informal socialization of social control, right? How we actually fit within the society and how we actually interact. Like, like me, I'm talking, I'm speaking on stage. Uh, the social understanding is that everybody's gonna be quiet and listen to me talk. I mean, you guys could stand up, turn your backs to me. It's just, it breaks that social contract within society, right? Um, and then you have the formal type, which is through regulation, right? How do you enforce this on a society? You have regulation, right? And that's one type, and you're starting to see that now. We, we, we have it throughout everything, finance, through uh, FDA, FDA, food food products, stuff like that. And how do they implement this type of social control techniques is through law, right? They establish laws to enforce this. If you break this law, you have penalties, either financial penalty, penalties or, you, you know, if you go to jail, you have some kind of prison time. And then that's mainly social control, but we get into the actual social contract. And money is a social contract that we all have within society. So social contract is created when a substantial percentage of society uh, desires the same results. That's a social contract. And we find that throughout all of industry, right? You have that in economics, right, with game theory um, at focal point. If people who study economics, you have that in business, and we can understand this a little bit more. You have the employer and the employee, right? You have that social contract on how you work within the business. And then you have it in finance, right? Um, you have, um, geez, uh, um, taxes, right? So you can have public goods after, after the fact. So there's a whole social contract behind that. We follow that. Um, 
And then actual social contract is, here's the characteristics of it, as, as you see in the last bullet, that uh, individuals uh, relinquish some of their freedoms in order to follow this social contract. They uh, accept and dictate to an authority, whether it's government, whether it's a state, whether it's an institution, um, they exchange these protections in order to protect their remaining rights that they have, right? And um, essentially it's used to, to maintain the social order, right? And um, Edward Ross has a great, great quote, and we see this now, especially with the crypto markets, right? That the belief systems exert greater control on human behavior than law imposed by a government. And we see that now. And I'm gonna get into that. I'm gonna get into why this, uh, the crypto markets and a lot of stuff happening with Bitcoin, why it's so popular. And again, it comes down to a social contract we have with these uh, various networks. Okay. Yeah. So let's get into the next part. So social contract and money. So laws and regulations are not they're not, they're a human construct. They're not naturally, they don't happen on a national uh, basis, right? They, they're, they're a human construct. And it provides a, a structure, these, these human cons constructs provide a structure to achieve a desired end result. And we see that again through regulation, through laws. We're starting to see the, the regulators start looking at some of this, some DeFi to protect the investors and protect the consumers, right? So you're starting to see a lot of this. And the, um, it's only legitimate, and this is the key, it's only legitimate as long as they continue to ensure the end result. And we see that throughout, not just with the crypto markets and finance, but you see it throughout, right? There's some laws, okay, they're, they're kind of too tight, we need to change the laws, right? You see regulation, the regulation is too tight on these financial institutions, let's lessen it up. You see that throughout time. So you have the social construct, or the social contract, and then at times, it, it's either too tight, and it's only legitimate until a lot of people start complaining about it, right? People come start complaining about it, the society, you're going to change it, right? So the question here is, why would rational individuals voluntarily consent to give up their national freedom to obtain the benefits of some type of social or, or political order? And I'll give you an example from a data standpoint, right? We're part of an ecosystem, an information ecosystem. I have an Android phone, so I'm part of the Google ecosystem, right? A lot of people have Apple phones in here, so you're part of the Apple ecosystem. I don't know how many of you, when you update the, the OS, if you do a new you know, software update you know, for some kind of security reason, do you read through that? Do you actually read through the, um, you know, what they're doing, what, you, what you're agreeing to? A lot of people just click through it so they can play their games or whatever they want to do on, on their phone, right? They click on it. If you read that, you're given your data and the rights for that company to take your data, to mine it, and to sell it. So you're agreeing to follow what they, what they have for using the OS, and you're subject to what they do with their data. But you're giving up that right of your personal information to use that OS. Uh, just deny it, don't click on it. It's gonna not allow you to use that OS, right? Or that operating system on your phone. So that's one of the things, right? The other one is what, what Professor Liu and Professor Cunningham said was it, the moving away from the gold standard. That's another thing. We moved away from that gold standard. And from a social contract standpoint, we agreed that money is a form, medium of exchange, a store of value, um, and a unit of account. So that's where we're at now with, with money. Um, are you changing it for me? You are, aren't you? <laughs> this is good. So the definition of fiat money, let's talk about fiat money. And um, again, the definition was given. Essentially, it's legal tender in the form of paper and coin, and it's uh, backed by a US government, right? And it, it's essentially a contract with the, uh, with the people. But fiat money does have its benefits from a monetary sovereign, uh, sovereign standpoint that governments can print money in order to support you know, the welfare state or social, uh, social projects. Um, the governments can then pump liquidity into the markets in case there's a, some kind of economic crisis, right? We, we see that with the pandemic. We print it. it's a lot of money, but we had to do it you know, for the greater good to pump, pump up the economy because of the COVID pandemic. Um, and also a lot of countries stabilize and devalue their currency. A lot of times they devalue it on purpose so they can have um, you know, better exports and help you know, down, make their trade deficit lower, right? And then also you can regulate the flow of the currency for financial crime, um, and that's happening now. I think the US and UK are gonna put sanctions on, on Russia because of what's happening in the Ukraine. Um, and then from, I don't know if you guys still follow what's happening in Afghanistan, the Taliban wants their 13 billion or $12 billion 
unfrozen so they can start using it, that the Federal Reserve froze on them. So that's, that's, that's some positive things happening from a fiat standpoint. But as we go on, there's been fundamental problems with fiat money, and we've seen that recently with um, a lot of the uh, financial crises that have come up, especially the 2008 crisis. But, you know, if you want flexible money, um, you need someone to manage that information, right? So central banks and governments gave that management of, this, of the fiat money, of the fiat system, to the commercial banks. And the commercial banks, it's interesting, the liabilities for their customers, they um, have only fractional deposits in reserves, right? It's called fractional banking, right? Fractional banking. And doing it, it's, it's very well, it, it, it's needed in, the, in, in financial systems, right? You need to have this fractional banking because you have the payment systems, you have loans, you have insurance. Um, you have, the, you know, also obviously the deposits. But what happens, and we saw with the 2008 crisis, it's, it's tightly, tightly coupled, tightly integrated, right? Remember the whole too big to fail? When something fails and it's very tightly coupled like that, you don't want the, the ramifications to go, go throughout the economy and you need to make sure that this financial institution does not fail. And that's the whole point of the too big to fail, right? And that actually starts bringing us into what Bitcoin offers. I don't know if I'm changing or not. No, oh, there you go. Thank you. So the, the promise of Bitcoin. Um, I can get the definition of Bitcoin, but essentially it's a digital type of currency or money, right? Uh, maintains a record of account. It also publishes new type of currency uh, through various mathematical computations. But the most important part, it op operates independently from an in independent institution or a social institution. Um, so that's one part, but here's the, here's the key to get out of this, right? Bitcoin was created not to replace fiat money, but to compete with it. It's competition. And um, I talk later about it, but the whole point about that, it makes for a better environment, right? It, it's, it's not to replace fiat money, but to actually challenge governments and institutions to do something better, to fix their problems, right? It's competition. Go, go back to the example of Apple. So if Samsung comes out with a better phone, Apple's gonna come out with a better phone, right? If there's a, you know, uh, I guess Meta comes out with Oculus, Apple's gonna come out with their Apple go uh, glasses. So it drives the economy, it drives the, the progress of, of technology and, and, all, and all of us. So you see thing, the same thing with Bitcoin. It's a competition and you see it now that the central banks are doing central bank digital currencies. A lot of the uh, commercial banks are looking at stable coins, right? In order to compete with what's happening in DeFi. You see that, and, it, and it's good, it's good, right? So going back to the social contract of money, Bitcoin said, hey, we're not gonna replace the social contract with the money. We're gonna actually see if we can make it better, right? We're gonna compete with it. And the idea behind that is freedom of choice, like Professor Cunningham said, you can actually start using the, the crypto coin networks, the Bitcoin networks, or you can stay with the traditional finance. So you have freedom of choice, right? And the great thing about it, it makes us question money, right? Later on, there's a little point about crypto economics, right? Crypto economics, the first instance of that is Bitcoin. You start asking the question in crypto economics is, money is a problem. So money is the issue and you're trying to solve it, right? And Bitcoin does the same thing. You wanna evolve money, that's the whole point of what, what Satoshi Nakamoto and the white paper is doing. Um, and also better society, uh, make it more stable than the current financial markets or financial systems and have it more decentralized and distributed. So the basics, and I know we, we talked about it already, but the basis of Bitcoin, you have no confiscation, only one person can have the right to spend it, uh, no censorship, right? Uh, anyone with, uh, um, can, can participate in the uh, system without permission. Uh, there's no inflation, right? There's only a certain amount, 21 million Bitcoins are gonna be released. Um, no counterfeiting, right? So only the uh, user can verify the rules of the system and the providence of the transactions are maintained within, within Bitcoin. So coming down to the rules of Bitcoin, this is an important slide. So as we talked about, Professor Cunningham uh, mentioned that there's a cycle with all these institutions, right? There's a cycle with any type of institution, not just financial, just any type of government institution and stuff, right? It's, they talk about protection, control, and then eventually abuse, right? So we trust the institution, whether it's financial, any type of social institution, we trust them to, we give up some of our rights, trust them to enforce the laws, protect us, save us from harm, right? Then as we give them the control, they start taking over that protection and that, and that, that I guess, um, um, the, 
the reason why they have this uh, influence over us, they start controlling it, right? And we see that with the financial markets now. They start to get into control and to control that money and control what happens. Again, good and bad behind that. And then eventually becomes abuse. They abuse their power, their control, which society then reacts to, change laws, change regulation, hence why Bitcoin came around. And that's very, very, uh, very good point about this particular slide. The second one is the social contract of Bitcoin. Again, we talked about there's a social layer and there's a protocol layer within Bitcoin. And the social, social layer, they essentially saw what they see in the, uh, the financial markets and said, okay, we're going to actually make it more stable and have security. In the system, security becomes a commodity, becomes a resource within the Bitcoin network, right? And security is not from a government agency, it's actually from the miners, right? It's from the miners, they enforce that commodity within Bitcoin. And it's interesting, this is a novel part of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network too, is that the security is done through consensus, right? There's no one involved, we're not sitting in there doing certain things, it's all part of that social layer, it's done through consensus. So this becomes the rules of Bitcoin, right? That's that social layer. Second part is that protocol layer, the technical layer, right? So they're symbiotic. You can't have that social uh, layer without that protocol layer. And the protocol layer then automates and agrees on that social contract, right? It enforces the rules that we talked about before, no confiscation, no inflation, um, and also the, the security aspect of it. And it maintains the credibility of that social contract, right? So it becomes symbiotic, right? Social layer, protocol layer, and how they interact. If the protocol layer starts straying away, then, you know, that's not that great, but eventually has to come back because everybody agrees that consensus, everybody agrees that that social layer, this is the way it happens. Um, I'm going to go into the next slide. Okay, so that, that slide's very important. Understand that social layer and, and protocol layer and the, uh, the uh, symbi uh, how, how it works together. So let's talk about a little bit, real quick, little ben benefits, right? Um, Bitcoin provides that uh, personal sovereignty. Um, it allows you to have per personal property able to trade, exchange uh, for individuals that can't, don't have the means to participate. They don't have an ID, they have very little funds to participate in the financial markets, but allows them to actually have some kind of personal property control. Um, and then uh, I mentioned before, uh, competition in the, fi in the financial markets. It's making the existing traditional financial system more competitive, right? It's saying, okay, there's something new out there, DeFi, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. They, they're, they're doing something that we should be aware of. We need to do something better. We need, to need something better than what people are doing with uh, cryptocurrency networks, hence CBDC and, and stablecoin. Um, financial inclusion, we talked about that. Ease of transfer, ability to exchange information on these networks with, with other individuals. Um, but it does have some drawbacks. Um, lack of ease of use from a, from the, for the non-technical. The example is the, when the internet first came out, the internet folks were, they knew that they, they created these interfaces for the end user in mind. So it automatically was based on ease of use for the end user. But, you know, the cryptocurrency networks in Bitcoin are, geez, it's, uh, it's was came out of the crypto uh, cryptography uh, blog sites, and you need to know some kind of coding to, in, order, in order to work with uh, a lot of these uh, systems, right? Um, and the hardware wallets are a good example. Um, then going into financial scams, right? You get scammed on, um, on the cryptocurrency networks. Uh, good examples, Squid Game. You guys watch a Squid Game? I have. So all these people were buying Squid Game currency or coins, right? And eventually being scammed, those guys had the Squid, go squid Game uh, tokens left, took off with all the money. And then finally, um, financial crimes. Uh, it's, you know, we've had financial crimes in the traditional markets for years. Uh, it's just a new way to do some financial crimes within the cryptocurrency networks. And um, it's, uh, I think it's a uh, good and bad. You just have to look at it. It's, again, Bitcoin network is not really anonymous, it's anonymous. So you do have a trail. So that's one thing to understand about these crypto networks, unless you get into the privacy coins. That's a whole other discussion. Um, and that's it for me. Pamela? Thank you. Hello, everyone. All right, so I am going to jump ahead and we're going to combine both of these worlds. We just talked about fiat versus Bitcoin. I want to talk about how we're melding these two worlds together, right? So CBDCs, totally different. We're not talking about those today. We're talking about cryptocurrency. CBDCs are not cryptocurrency, just to clarify in case anybody had any doubts. Um, it's right there in the name, right? Central bank digital currency. Crypto is not centralized. 
or so we think. We'll talk about stablecoins in a minute and what Tether and USD coin have done as far as clawing back transactions. All right, so to clarify, stablecoin is a cryptocurrency. It is a type of cryptocurrency, just to be clear. It is pegged to something. A stablecoin is pegged to fiat. It's pegged to gold. It's algorithmically pegged to other cryptos, right? It's pegged to something. The idea of a stablecoin was to take away the volatility that people often complain about with Bitcoin, right? Stablecoin, by the way, the name is a misnomer. They're not coins. They're tokens, right? A coin is the native currency of a particular blockchain. So you've actually built infrastructure for your coin. Tokens kind of refer to them as parasites as a good analogy. They run on other people's infrastructure, right? So somebody built a toll road and then they're charging others to run on their toll road. Okay, so Ethereum is the majority of the traffic that we see for stable coins. It still accounts for about 70 to 80 percent of stable coin activity, DeFi activity. The majority of the activity still takes place on Ethereum. You're paying the toll with ETH, right? And that's one of the major differences when we talk about Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin versus ETH. ETH actually has a demand because it's being used for something, right? We're using it to pay the toll to run on that toll road. All right, so tokens, which it's important to understand, anyone can create a token. There is no requirement for that, right? I mean, there's a PAM token. My engineers at, at CypherTrace created a PAM token. It's not worth anything. Nobody wants it, but it's out there, right? Anybody can create a token. Talking about where stable coins fall in this kind of categorization, right? We have digital currency way at the top, big umbrella category. Then we fall into virtual currency, second largest umbrella category. Then we get into crypto, and then stable coins fall under cryptocurrency. Even though they are pegged for the, when we're talking, about, when we're talking to FIs, when we're talking about the majority of stable coins, what we are primarily focused on right now are the stable coins that are pegged to the dollar, pegged to the euro. They are still cryptocurrency at the end of the day, right? They are still running on distributed ledger technology, i.e. public blockchain, okay? All right, so where do they kind of fall out there? We have Bitcoin. This is just a basic heat map from a couple days ago. Bitcoin, obviously, still 40% of the market. You've got ETH um, that's hovering around 18, 20% uh, dominance of the market. Tether and USD coin, they have a pretty prominent place. They generally fall within the top five of all cryptocurrency. That speaks volumes. What is the most circulated cryptocurrency? It's Tether, it's not Bitcoin. When we talk about 24 hour volume, it's Tether always, and it's double the volume that Bitcoin is. That, that's not for speculation, right? Tether's pegged to the dollar. People are using stable coins already for payment settlements. They're using stable coins to fuel DeFi. This is how I move in and out of DeFi protocols. I want a crypto that is stable as I'm moving between different protocols, as I'm moving between different aspects of the crypto world, NFTs, if I want to purchase an NFT, okay? So just to give you an idea of kind of where they fall, um, here is an overview of tokens. These are all tokens on the screen, not coins. Right? So you can definitely see their impact on the market when we talk about tokens. BUSD is Binance US dollar. Um, DAI is also stable coin. Um, some other stable coins, Paxo Standard, Gemini Dollar, right? There's a whole host of stable coins out there. When we talk about volume, just to give you an idea of what I just mentioned, right? 24 hour volume for Tether um, on the particular day and time that I took this was 55 billion in 24 hours, whereas Bitcoin was 25 billion, right? I've seen tether volume as high as 90 billion in 24 hours, okay? Just to also kind of break it down a little bit and where they're used and how they're used, tether's primarily used outside the United States. USD coin is mostly used inside the United States. A lot of that has to do with who's backing it, right? USD coin, circle and Coinbase, right? Center. Tether, tether.io, Bitfinex is its primary backer, okay? All right, so these stable coins have been out there for quite a while. We've definitely seen growth over the past year fueled by these new, new, I call them new, but buzzwords like DeFi. It's not new, but it's definitely come into its own in the past year, right? So 
the OCC said all the way back in 2020 and in January of 2021, hey, banks, you can use stable coins. Banks, you can use, uh, you can custody crypto, second and third lever, and hey, you can hold the reserves for stable coins. Okay, all the way back in 2020, banks started to jump on the bandwagon. Most of your top 20 banks are either looking at using a stable coin that already exists or creating their own stable coin. Right? So the OCC came out and said this. And then we saw back in November of this year, they said, oh, um, from the executive branch, we're going to take a look at stable coins because there's really no oversight on stable coins. So the executive branch, FDIC, OCC, right? They put together this report with recommendations on stable coins. Okay. And then we saw the Fed last week put out the paper, finally, on the digital dollar. Right? And I don't know if you guys have read through it, but our interpretation is that they really don't have any intention of creating a retail CBDC. And this is why. Stablecoins are already filling that role. Right? Stablecoins are already filling that gap. Mentioned SWIFT earlier. SWIFT won't exist in a couple years. SWIFT just started getting into the crypto bandwagon. It's a little late. Stablecoins are already filling that role of payment settlement. Both Visa and MasterCard, CypherTrace is a MasterCard company now, are accepting USD coin for payment settlements. Okay. So the report said from the executive branch, hey, if you're a stablecoin issuer, you should be an insured depository institution. Right? A lot of people will argue that that's taking a step too far because stablecoin issuers are not actually doing loans. Um, they also said, that stablecoin wallet providers should be subject to regulatory oversight. Basically, we need oversight. And the reason for this is because when we talk about stablecoins, who is actually verifying the reserves for these stablecoins? Right? So if we go back to the slide where I was showing you circulation, there's 78 billion tether in circulation. Right? There's 48, um, the numbers are probably have changed since a couple, a couple days ago, but 48 billion USD coin in circulation. If there's 48 billion USD coin in circulation, there should be $48 billion backing each one of those coins. So where are the reserves? How do I verify the reserves? Right? Tether ran into a little problem in 2019, didn't they? Okay. They settled out of court. Criminal charges and civil, they had enforcement an enforcement action, and then they also had the, the criminal side. Okay? Bitfinex and Tether eventually settled out of court on the criminal side. They did have the civil enforcement action. Okay? That point was is that they couldn't produce all of the reserves for all the Tether that were in circulation. So who's watching over this? Circle has decided that the writing's on the wall, that oversight is coming, so Circle has decided that they're going to be fully transparent. And they contracted with Grant Thornton to do audits of their reserves and post it on Center. This is from Center.io website. Okay? And it's not only where are the reserves, are the reserves actually there, but how are the reserves being held? One of the other issues with Tether is that there was a lot of commercial paper involved. You can see clearly that Circle has made a concerted effort to make sure that they are cash reserves. Okay? So who is overseeing this? As of right now, the issue with stablecoins is that the burden falls entirely on the consumer. And this is why we see banks like New York Community Bank, who created the USDF stablecoin, right, running on Providence blockchain. The issue is, how do we verify those reserves? This burden falls on the consumer. The consumer needs to understand the smart contract. I mentioned this, I foreshadowed this, both Circle and Tether have frozen tokens. They can claw back tokens, and they've done it. So for something that is truly decentralized, now we have the ability for those issuers to actually claw back those tokens. Now they've all been, I've worked cases where we've tracked down stolen Tether, and that was the impetus for them clawing those back or freezing those. I mean, they generally have good reasons, but they do have the power to do so. It's important to understand that. Which is why, again, we see banks creating their own stable coins. Okay. So burden falls on the consumer right now. That's what we saw the President's Working Group report really kind of calling out who's going to take on the oversight, 
We don't know, right? We could all guess maybe somewhere in the Department of Treasury, right? But who's actually going to take that on to protect the consumer, to verify this information? When we talk about looking at smart contracts, understanding how those tokens are set up, I don't read Solidity, right? I'm not doing a smart contract audit. So now I've got to contract out and have somebody else come in and do smart contract audit on the stable coin that I'm going to choose to use at my institution. Or if I'm going to build my own stable coin, then I need to bring somebody in who can create that smart contract for my stable coin token, right? All right, so um, just a really quick uh, overview. I just, I love this chart. I love this little rainbow chart talking about DeFi because stable coins are the base, right? So this is where we've definitely seen an increase in stable coins um, and their growth, their very precipitous growth. Um, a lot of that is fueled by DeFi, and then conversely, it is fueling DeFi. All right, I think that's my last one. I got through quickly. Thanks. All right, so we're heading into our last session before the first break, and the topic for this group is money, inflation, and debt. And coming to the stage, we have Ralph Benko, and we've got George Pullen. And Ralph Benko is the co-founder and general counsel for New Pavilion Art, uh, and he will be speaking about the history of science and money. And I do not have the uh, intro slide for our other speaker, but uh, I'll be happy to introduce him once she gets here. So. for having preempted my whole first page by doing a brief history of money. But let me give you the metadata first. By the way, my name is Ralph Benko. I'm the co-founder and general counsel to New Pavilion Art, which is an NFT consultancy. So the, uh, all of the, let me give you the metadata, which will explain why I'm going to tell you what I'm about to tell you. And that is Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, wrote a famous book called On Common Law, which opened with the phrase, the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. And this is also, this also applies to money. And I want to uh, interrupt myself very briefly because uh, Professor Cunningham, are you here, sir? Well, this is, this is for you. You're in really good company. Uh, I'm going to give you very briefly the secret origin story of Ethereum. So we know what, we know what culture we're coming from. Okay, Vitalik Buterin, straight quote, I happily played World of Warcraft during 2007 through 2010, but one day Blizzard removed the damage component from my beloved Warlock spell my beloved warlock siphon life spell, I cried myself to sleep. And on that day, I realized what horrors centralized services can bring. I soon decided to quit. I saw everything to do with either government regulation or corporate control as just being plain evil. And I assume that people in those institutions were kind of like Mr. Burns, sitting behind their desks saying, excellent, how can I screw a thousand people over this time? Buterin conceived of the platform that would become Ethereum in late 2013, announcing it along with three financial backers at a Bitcoin conference in Miami a few months later. So this is where Ethereum, which is the basis for cryptocurrency, comes from. And this mistrust of centralized authority is baked right into the cake from the foundation. So since this is the life of the law has not been logic but experience, this is the experience it comes from. Now, I was going to take you through Javon, and thank you for teaching me how to pronounce his name 
gem. I had always mispronounced it mentally because I'd never heard it pronounced by an erudite soul like you to define money, but he's taking care of that. And I'm going to embellish that a little bit before I'm going to get you into the scientific provenance of money because I want you to understand it's important the money was invented by scientists not by economists and not for nothing did the United States Senator Nelson Aldrich who was the chairman of the National Monetary Commission in the beginning of the uh, 20th century speak before the Economics Club of New York and he and uh, he archly quoted economist Henry uh, I can't even read, Henry McLeod, to say, the study of monetary questions is one of the great causes of insanity. Now, he was probably making a sly dig at William Jennings Bryan, the great, you know, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. But I think he was prophesying the advent of Gerard Dache, Jim Liu, and me. Yeah. So who were the great scientists who invented money as we know it? The first was Nicholas Copernicus. 500 year, almost exactly 500 years ago, he wrote a, 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 a brilliant essay called On the Minting of Money. This is the same fellow who persuaded the earth to stop, the, the sun to stop going around the earth and the earth to start going around the sun. So he's no slouch. Uh, and I had the arcane privilege of being the lead co-editor of the most esteemed modern translation of Copernicus's essay on the minting of money. And here is what Nicholas Copernicus warned us of. Although there are countless maladies that are forever causing the decline of kingdoms, princedoms, and republics, the following four, in my judgment, are the most serious civil discord, a high death rate, sterility of the soil, and the debasement of coinage. The first three are so obvious that everybody recognizes the damage they cause. But the fourth one, which has to do with money, is noticed by only a few very thoughtful people, since it does not operate all at once and at a single blow, but gradually overthrows governments and in a hidden, insidious way. The Prussian nobles who commissioned this study by Copernicus ignored his wise advice and eventually suffered the fate he foretold. So let's go fast forward a few hundred years to Sir Isaac Newton. In addition to being generally recognized as the founder of modern physics, Newton served professionally as the master of the Royal Mint in the early 18th century. And just to uh, implicate the first celebrity economist, John Maynard Keynes, his last words were a speech he wrote and was delivered posthumously after he passed on in the 1940s by his brother Geoffrey, which was a celebration of Newton. Keynes' last words. Newton was not the first of the age of reason. He was the last of the magicians, the last of the Babylonians and Sumerians, the last great mind which looked out on the visible and intellectual world with the same eyes as those who began to build our intellectual inheritance rather less than 10,000 years ago. Isaac Newton, a posthumous child born with no father on Christmas Day, 1642, was the last wonder child to whom the Magi could do sincere and appropriate homage. So what was Newton's monetary legacy? By happy accident, Newton led us to the gold standard by uh, um, a monetary system which helped Great Britain prosper and was instrumental in Britain's becoming a dominant world power. The Wikipedia summarizes it beautifully. Great Britain accidentally adopted a de facto gold standard in 1717 when Sir Isaac Newton, then master of the Royal Mint, 
set the exchange rate of silver to gold too low, thus causing silver coins to go out of circulation. A formal gold species standard was first established in 1821 when Britain adopted it following the introduction of the gold sovereign by the new Royal Mint at Tower Hill in 1816. As Great Britain became the world's leading financial and commercial power in the 19th century, other states increasingly adopted Britain's monetary system. The gold species standard came to an end in the United Kingdom and the rest of the British Empire with the outbreak of World War I. Now we're going to go over to the dark side of the force, the economists, when economist John Law in 1716, the same time that, you know, within a year of Newton making this, this happy accident to create the gold standard, and he created the paper standard for France, which, both, which rapidly, the gold standard worked for almost 200 years, the paper standard brought France to its knees financially and destroyed John Law, its inventor, within less than a decade. A Scottish economist, he served as controller general of finances under the Duke of Orleans, regent for the juvenile Louis XV of France. In 1716, Law set up a private Banque Générale in France. A year later, it was nationalized at his request and renamed as Banque Royale. Law also set up and directed the Mississippi Company founded by the Bank Royale. Its chaotic collapse has been compared to the 17th century tulip mania in Holland. And the Mississippi bubble, which by the way almost destroyed Isaac Newton, who I'm paraphrasing here said, I can predict the movements of the stars, but I cannot predict the madness of the crowds. I have the exact, uh, I have the exact phrase in my notes somewhere if anybody wants to. Uh, steal it and, and use it, You're, uh, uh, come up to me and I'll track it down for you. Um, the Mississippi bubble coincided with the South Sea bubble in England, which allegedly took ideas from it. The term millionaire was coined for the beneficiaries of Law's scheme. Speculation gave way to panic as people flooded the market with future shares trading as high as 15,000 leaves per share while the shares themselves remained at 10,000. By May 1720, prices fell to 4,000 leaves per share, a 73% decrease within a year. The rush to convert paper money to coins led to sporadic bank hours and riots. So we've got the physicist Isaac Newton creating a gold standard that propelled England to greatness and persisted as a source of prosperity for almost two centuries, and the economist John Law, who created chaos, panic, and financial ruin. You decide whether you want to go with science or with economics. And then we go on to Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen. Prior to Joseph Priestley, we were all breathing phlogiston. Uh, Priestley was also the inventor of carbonation on which our entire soft drink industry is based. And he wrote extensively and eruditely on the gold standard, providing an extensive lecture on the mechanics of money, later published in his lectures on history and general philosophy, 1793. The lectures cover an array of topics, once again quoting from Wikipedia's summary, forms of government, the feudal system, the rise of corporations, uh, law, agriculture, commerce, the arts, finance, and taxation, colonies, manners, population, war, and peace, demonstrating how all-encompassing Priestley believed the study of history to be. Priestley offers a version of history in which all events, all events are, quote, an exhibition of the ways of God, unquote, studying history and nature, uh, according to Priestley, quote, leads us to the knowledge of God's perfections and of his will. Understanding history thus allows one to comprehend the natural laws God established and the perfection toward which they allow the world to, to tend. So we've moved from Copernicus to Newton to, am I, does this mean I'm out of time? I got three minutes left. Good. I've got 
two and a half minutes of stuff left to say. Okay, we now move to today. Scott Stornetta uh, uh, and, and uh, Stuart Haber, who in, in, in uh, 1991 invented the blockchain with a paper published called How to Timestamp a Digital Document. This was the breakthrough. Satoshi quoted this paper three times out of the eight quotations in his white paper. Per CoinGeek, working at Belcor Labs in the 1990s, Haber and Stornetta were allowed to pick their own research projects. Stornetta says, we were waiting to go into a restaurant, and fast forward, Stornetta, uh, Scott says, as he was waiting to go into a restaurant, and he told me it was Friendly's ice cream, okay, which played a big role in our lives, uh, uh, with his family, he had a brainwave. If you needed to keep adding extra trusted parties to vouch for the honesty of the existing players, then logically the list would expand infinitely until the whole world was required. And that still wouldn't be enough. Scott's insight was, as he explains it, I realized that if you turn that upside down and created a system of interlinked documents with essentially everyone as a witness, then you had, in fact, solved the problem. And so there you have a potted history about the scientific providence of money, from Copernicus to Newton to Priestley to Haber and Stornetta. And so uh, what possibilities for, creative, for greater prosperity, equity, and financial stability does the blockchain create? So glad you asked. Let us reprise the view of Priestley who said, these are an exhibition of the ways of God, leading us to the knowledge of perfections and of his will. And to round this out, this brief history of money with Stephen Hawking's brief history of time, he ended up saying, he concluded by saying, if we discover a complete theory, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we should know the mind of God. Thank you for your attention. Wear glasses, you know why I'm doing that. <laughs> Hello, GBA family. I want to do that because um, A, I'm staying in between you and your next cup of coffee, and B, if you get the reference, I hope it caused you a little bit of levity there. I'm George Pullen, I'm an economist, I am here to help. Um, that should be scary when you hear that. Um, <laughs> Um, I will give a quick disclaimer. I am here in my personal and my academic capacity. I also wear another hat, which I am not wearing today, but just to be explicit, I'm also the senior economist for division market oversight for the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. But I am again speaking today in my academic capacity. So without further ado, um, when Gerard first asked me to participate a few months ago, he said, how about you do an easy one like money, inflation, and debt? And I go, inflation? Who's going to care about inflation? I'd be happy to do inflation right before a coffee break. Um, so people care. <laughs> people care a little bit more about inflation now uh, than they did a few months ago. But I am very pleased with the groundwork and the critical parts of the theory that was already laid out for you by Dr. Liu, Professor Cunningham, and of course the wonderful job that Dr. Benko did. To make this very simple, how many people here are, mm, don't use the scared, worried about inflation? We're gonna do this real quick. All right, I got 85% of hands, so I expect the highest rating on the survey. Um, I'm also going to keep this to less than six minutes. I've already hit my timer. That way I give you back your time for the networking and the coffee. And this also ensures me that Gerard will invite me to a fourth event, this being my, my third uh, GBA global event. Um, all right, so let's get going. <clears throat> what is inflation? We're going to put it really simple here. Inflation is how much it costs 
for you to purchase something relative to other things, right? Let's be more specific here for a quick second. When we talk about inflation here in the United States, oftentimes as an anchor, we talk about the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which is wonderfully put together by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. When we look at CPI, that is a relative basket of goods that is supposed to approximate our purchasing habits and what we spend our money on. A broader way, however, to look at inflation is relative to all forms of money. Okay, this is how we're gonna tie it into crypto. All forms of money, okay? So this relates back to foreign exchange, okay? How much is your relative basket in the United States compared to that same or similar relative basket in Canada, Argentina, or wherever you like to spend your summers? Um, yes, I like to spend my summers in Canada. I'm from Maine, so it makes complete sense if you know me. Um, but with that out of the way, this is what we're talking about, right? Where you have to realize that when we talk about foreign exchange rates and we talk about CPI, we're really talking about two sides of the same coin. And what cryptocurrencies have done is they've created a three-sided die, okay? So explore that for a second you now have exchange rates relative to baskets of goods, exchange rates relative to other currencies that are backed by nations, and exchange rates relative to cryptocurrencies. Okay, so I want you to, to house all three of those when you're thinking about inflation in relative terms. The other thing that gets confused in discussions about inflation is people start to talk about volatility. Ah, the VIX, the VIX index. Um, so VIX, the VIX index, you should all be tracking on your phones if you're not. Um, volatility, or the VIX index, which is a fantastic measure of that volatility, is relatively speaking how much things are moving around, okay? Again, this is not gonna be any quizzes. This is in my Econ 401 class. You're all completely safe. It will be multiple choice. It'll be answered by black coffee only in the lobby. Um, but, the, but the way this is gonna work <clears throat> is think about it relative to how quickly things are moving around. That's, that's volatility, right? Now, when people talk about how volatile a given cryptocurrency are, unless they're talking about it in a given scale of time, they actually don't know what volatility means, and that's okay, you can tell them that, and you can say an economist told them that they don't know what it means. Um, because volatility is only relative to time. You have to have a time factor to properly understand volatility, okay? So let's look at volatility on wider time frames, okay? Um, I'm not gonna do a whole bunch of messy numbers. I just want you to hold a couple very briefly to drive this point home. The first is that, um, the first is if you look at the, the pre.com, era, right? So some of us might not have been born or those were, we're still in grade school. But if you look at the pre-dot-com bubble, you're, you're looking at a money supply. So how many of those bills are circulating around? Of about four trillion, a little less actually than, than four trillion, right? That's their, their money supply, how much money is in the economy, right? <clears throat> if you think about that relative, let's do an index, all right, all right, relative. So instead of giving you CPI, I'm going to do relative to the S&P. The S&P, around the same time, pre-dot-com bubble, was only around 1,000. S&P at 1,000, doesn't that sound amazing? Um, now, let's fast forward a little bit. Today, today, or sorry, not quite all the way to today. Let's go to that way, way back to BC, before corona, right? We're going to BC. And so, <laughs> and so in BC, in 2019, um, the money supply for the United States was 15 Trillion, okay? We're gonna be talking all in T's here, so no, no one confusing B's and T's, all T's here. So 15 trillion, at that time, at that time, the S&P, again, a basket, relative, think relative terms, that's 3,000, okay? Now, let's go to today. Today, today, two years later, money supply is 21.4 trillion. 15 trillion, 21.4 trillion. We got that, okay? That's 6.5 trillion. We'll all just say that's about a third to 40%. We can all just say a third for conversational purposes. More money supply, okay? During that same time period, the S&P went to 4,400. Well, that's also about a third more than it was in 2019. 
So you actually didn't make any money. That's what inflation means, right? In inflation is something priced relative to something else. That's how currencies work. It's our currency relative to theirs, whether theirs is a crypto or theirs is a yen. That's how currency exchange works. That's how inflation works. Now, what does this mean, and why did everyone, when I asked if they were worried, I got 85% of hands. <clears throat> the reason is, and this is why it's important to keep this in mind, the third piece, okay, we have exchanges, we have volatility, the third piece is velocity, okay? So, I know there's some wonderful Isaac Newton references. I'm not going to have anything about physics on this, I promise you, even though I am an econometrician. Um, I'm not going to do the science thing. Um, but what I will do for everyone <clears throat> is think about velocity. What velocity means is not how quickly things are moving up and down. Velocity in this instance of the word is the derivative or the measurement of speed. Okay? So that velocity, that measurement of speed, is how many transactions are occurring. Okay? The quarterly velocity of dollars has historically been sub-2. It's been like 1.6 to 1.9. Awesome. I promise you I'm going to give that time back. 1.6 to 1.9. Okay? Right now, velocity is anemic. It's between 1.3 and 1. That means when a dollar goes out, <laughs> it stays out. It stays in your pocket. It stays in his pocket and her pocket. It's not moving around. There's no velocity of that money, okay? Let's compare this velocity to the velocity of Bitcoin. Now, that was a, th these were wonderful presentations, by the way, and I particularly thought the stablecoin presentation was very interesting. It's going to completely destroy my math, and that's okay. Um, as an economist, I can say, always say, but on the other hand. So we're just going to go with this hand, because I didn't prepare that one. And what I'm going to tell you is if you look at the velocity of Bitcoin, what you see is you have a velocity of around three X. Again, I have standardized the periods to make it comparable to USD, okay? So that means Bitcoin moves around with a velocity of about three times that of dollars currently, and about twice dollars in more regular times. When you think about inflation, just remember those three things. Remember, we are talking about the relative values. You always have to keep in mind exchange rates. And do not forget about your friends, volatility, and velocity. Um, for anybody interested in space economics, we can talk about that later. I see some friends there who I've talked about that before. Um, and for anyone who is an intern, I heard there's already two interns here, uh, please let me know and I can give you a complimentary copy of my book. And everybody else, thank you and let's do coffee. We are at our first break, so I've been uh, asked to uh, instruct everyone to come back here promptly at 11, where we're going to kick off the next session. So thank you all for being here. Excuse me.
million dollars, they're giving that money back. So they, they scrapped the whole uh, digital, digital currency. So I guess it's Meta. I know Facebook and then Meta is the, the, the parent company. So Facebook scraped, sc uh, scrapped DM. I think they're focusing more on the, on the metaverse or their metaverse stuff. I don't know if anybody, has anybody got the Oculus yet? The Oculus Quest 2 or the Oculus Rift? It's really cool, you should check it out, it's awesome. You know, during the pandemic or before the pandemic, what the professor said, BC, right? I used to go into work and work out every morning, but I bought the Oculus, now I'm doing like virtual boxing, it's awesome. It's kind of the, the equilibrium messes with you, but uh, the virtual boxing's pretty cool. Um, I like it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's cool, isn't it? We should try it. Next time we'll do it virtual. Oh, like this? No, 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 like walk this way a little bit. Oh, the podium? Or me? Am I too loud? No, 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 you're not in shot. Oh, okay. Okay, don't move the podium. Oh, okay. And walk around like this? Stand in front of the chairs? Yeah. Am I going to be like this the whole time? No, I'm not in a panel. I'm just a moderator. I'm just a voice. I'm the soothing voice like Matthew McConaughey, soothing voice. You guys do listen to Matthew McConaughey's, uh, if you guys want to sleep really well, just listen to Matthew McConaughey's little podcast. It puts you right to sleep. He's got that, that voice. So we're waiting for one more panelist. We have Silvio. We have... Uh, we have Mark uh, waiting for uh, John. Oh, okay. Well, come on up. So, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, oh, go ahead. I guess he's going to start recording. Good. We're good. Yeah. Let's see. It's okay. I think we're. Uh, are we recording? We good? Good. Okay. So thank you everybody, thank you for coming back after the break and getting your coffee and your little, like, I don't know the kind of food they have out there, they may have that protein bars or I don't know, Bitcoin chocolates or something. But um, I'm glad uh, everybody's back. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna introduce a distinguished panel. We're gonna talk about blockchain and crypto at the state and local level. So again, everybody knows who I am. I'm Mark Montoy, I'm the Chief Data Officer for the Government Blockchain Association. And I'd like to introduce Mark Stewart, who's the um, uh, Vice Mayor of Chandler, Arizona. Good morning. Is this clicker working here? <laughs> I think we do like a quick intro or do we do yeah, well, well I, I think there's slides going to come up here in yeah, a second. So, so, so Mark can we get the next it. slide? It's, um, maybe because it's a PDF, it's not clicking? No, there you go. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, it's just a little slow. There you go. It's Mark Stewart. Good morning, everyone. And uh, next person is John Baudre. He's the chairman of the uh, Miami-Dade Cryptocurrency Task Force. Yeah. Good morning. Zhao Xiong Hao. We're in China. So, uh, and then uh, Silvio Popo Casco, he's the uh, um, CEO of the Logos Capital. Hey guys, Zhao Xiong Hao. Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming, thanks for being here. Thank you everybody for the attention, the GBA for the invitation, and of course our uh, incredible colleagues and their leadership. Hey, really excited about everything we're going to be talking about today. Um, as you know, uh, as you know, GBA focuses globally. We're doing things federally, but today's panel is exciting to have uh, state, uh, county, and sort of city conversation. So, really excited to jump into that. Okay, great, great. Um, so, let me just start into it. So, I don't, we don't have a lot of time, and I think we have a lot to talk about. But um, can each of you describe, you know, some of the possibilities that you see with this tech, with the, the blockchain and cryptocurrency technology, how it can actually influence you know, your communities? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great question. I asked this question to one of the task force members of the state of Florida, uh, Commissioner Ronald Brzee, uh, yesterday, or the day before. And I said, and he, the first thing he responded was, are we talking about blockchain or are we talking about crypto? And I think this is a very important uh, point, something that we've been uh, really distinguishing with the GBA chapter and GBA Miami to only really, when we've met, talk about particularly blockchain applications, not crypto. Um, and, and I think that that has been the long time conversation and today we're now crossing that chasm. In fact, John is part of the, is the chair of the cryptocurrency task force versus the state uh, blockchain task force. And I think that here um, what I've done is shared the state CIO uh, survey where we see that most 
uh, state CIOs are already on the record saying informally they're investigating blockchain, blockchain applications, um, and we have a link that we'll share later of the uh, Florida blockchain um, task force and the recommendations that they've come up with. And here you can see some of the main use cases, property, financial, public records, private records. I'm a big fan of FinTech, of course, um, but I think that as a resident, the key foundation is gonna be um, being able to digitize and anonymize our own data to make sure that we protect ourselves, our data, and can interact uh, more transparently. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, sort of high level. Well, you know, as it relates to the future, um, you know, Arizona and, and my city in particular, Chandler, is a bit in its infancy, but I, the opportunities abound. And uh, we're seeing it happen all over the world, and we're seeing it happen uh, in Arizona. And the adoption's happening quickly. So from a future perspective, and the whole idea is to, to, to give the power back to the people, right? And to decentralize a lot of the things that we're doing from a monetary perspective. And also from just something as simple as uh, Sylvia was saying, digital identity, right? Uh, medical records, whatever that may be. Think about just, just going to a clinic, right? Uh, and, and not having to bring your, you, you can't bring your own medical records with you. You have to make a bunch of faxes and, and things like that. So there's so many opportunities in the future is, is definitely here now, uh, but I'm excited about, about what's going on in, in Arizona for sure. Um, most definitely. Um, I just kind of echo their sentiments here. Um, I think we'll go to the next section. Uh, it kind of flows into the other thing we're going to talk about. Yeah. Okay. But um, you got Silvio and Mark, you bring up good points. The thing about data, having people get control back to it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about it. Maybe through the meta universe again, we talked about meta, right? And being able to have those avatars, you have a whole other avatar within this environment. So you have one for finances, you know, you just pay bills, one that you actually do stuff with your kids. So you have these uh, individual, um, I guess, avatars or, or security aspect to uh, tokens to actually take your security back, take your data back. Again, your data is already out there. How do you get that stuff back? Mm -hmm. So the next next uh, question is, what, what are some significant uh, accomplishments that each of you uh, have seen within the state and local municipalities? Oh, most definitely. Uh, so um, uh, I'm Elijah John Baudre. Um, you know, blockchain Baudre uh, in my private work as a journalist, um, but as the uh, number one crypto public official, I'm a public servant, and leading the, uh, the task force, um, Florida is a unique place for a number of reasons. Um, but um, the actual uh, um, transient nature um, that's kind of inculcated there with the people, uh, remittance is a big uh, part of our state. Um, travel, logistics, you know, it's the capital of the Caribbean, it's the capital of South America. So the fabric there, we've been able to get a lot of strides. Um, so we've actually, uh, in Florida, we have um, the blockchain task force that was created at the state level. Um, I submitted, I wrote resolution for a blockchain board for Miami-Dade County um, at the Bitcoin 2020 conference um, that eventually turned into the Cryptocurrency Task Force, which I'm now the, uh, the chair of. Uh, but also last year, uh, I was able to, uh, my partners and I, we made a $150,000 donation to um, Florida a I'm a Rattler, Florida a University, uh, to our business school. But we didn't have Ethereum. Shout out to Wyoming and our friends there. Uh, we took a play right from the University of Wyoming and uh, uh, Ms. Long and since FAMU is a state school, they couldn't take custody of it. They had to get guidance from the state. Uh, and so when they went and got guidance, we already had our bill submitted. And so um, usually when you submit a bill, you get six or seven committees you know, to kind of flesh it out. If they want to kill it, they'll give you 11 to 13. Mine's got three. So if all goes well, February 1st, my bill will be law for the first, excuse me, our bill will be law, for the first blockchain legislation for the state of Florida. March 27th is a deadline where Miami-Dade County will fully accept crypto for taxes and fees and for payments to employees as well as deferred payments. Oh yeah, give it up for that. Yeah, that's great, you can give it up for that. This time in history is not lost on us. I'm humbled by this position. Um, since coming back from uh, China, so 
I'm sorry, we kind of want to go here, but uh, uh, um, that is probably the biggest thing, is when we pierce that municipal veil between the public and actually taking crypto, we believe that that's going to have a domino effect. And then when you actually line it up with what's happening at the state level and now at the federal level, this is the trifecta that's needed. See, everybody asks is, why is the derivatives market four quadrillion dollars and the total crypto market is one point whatever it is? What is hell? Easy. No law on the books. No law on the books, courts can't adjudicate. Courts can't adjudicate, insurers can't insure. Insurers can't insure it, companies aren't gonna integrate it. If companies don't integrate it, you won't have mass adoption until 2022. We're all a part of history. In Miami, uh, Wyoming, this is why I wear this hat, because um, all my companies are formed in Miami. Uh, most of my real money, which is the Bitcoin money, is in Wyoming. But they're connected with us. They are the pioneers. Miami's the premier. But together, we're building this. That's all I have to say. Great. <clears throat> well, you know, I couldn't say it any better than that, John. You know, locally in Arizona, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we're we're in our infancy, right? We're we're exploring what's going on in other states, and I want to thank Mark for really being a guide during uh, this process. So I I joined the uh, I was asked to be on the a subcommittee for the Arizona Legislature to talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency and how that can fit within the framework of Arizona. And uh, Mark was able to give me incredible information about what was going on in other states. And so we're going to draft off of states like Wyoming, states like Florida, Rhode Island, and areas like that in order to craft the best legislation, in order to be globally competitive uh, in not only the United States, but in the world. You know, Arizona is now attracting companies from around the world. TMC is coming in from Taiwan. We have Intel in my hometown in Chandler, Arizona, uh, is the largest uh, manufacturer of chips in the world, and uh, recently announced a $20 billion uh, investment in our, in our small city of 280,000 people. But moreover, I think stepping into what we're doing locally is we recognize that blockchain was the future. Our community is a community of innovation. We call ourselves that in Chandler. And, and our public expects us to provide a customer service. That's what cities do. That's what counties do is we provide services. We're not a lawmaking body, but we can certainly make it easier for people to connect with the city. And as a customer service option, we have uh, explored a few things. And I don't know if there's a slide on it here, uh, just a couple up, yeah, right here. We've explored a few things, which is we've submitted an RFP to accept payments in cryptocurrency, right? In Bitcoin or Dash, we have a local company in Scottsdale called Dash, and I know the CEO. Um, so we can pay our utility bills. If you uh, are in Chandler and you get caught speeding, you might be able to pay your uh, speeding ticket with Bitcoin. You know, recently in November, we had a mock election using uh, the Votes app, which is really centered around blockchain security for the database of the, the, the voting, uh, of the votes, right? We want to be able to instantly audit. And if anybody's familiar, it takes Arizonans three weeks to understand, uh, to get the results of their election. Um, and it, it's, it's, it makes uh, Maricopa County and Arizona somewhat of a joke uh, as it relates to being able to get uh, election results. I'm not saying mobile voting is the answer, but certainly being able to put the database into the blockchain so that it can be, uh, it can be audited by multiple different groups. The public can audit the, the election results instead of having it centralized in what could be a partisan uh, head of that department. So, Furthermore, you know, we are looking at blockchain in our city as, as a method to increase cybersecurity. So we are, we are pushing our chips in, we're exploring these things, um, but thankfully with the support of our mayor and council, which is a, is a very forward thinking uh, council, we are uh, journeying forward and we are trying to be pioneers in our state and we hopefully will be the first to take, well we will, we'll be the first to take cryptocurrency as a form of payment, we'll be the first city in Arizona, so thank you. Uh, it's a great work, um, and yeah, good shout out, and, and good to know that the GBA has been also resourceful to help give support, guidance. I know that we even need to uh, give some information presented in front of the cryptocurrency task force in the county a couple times. Also, sort of uh, GBA had put out around the time that they were considering this, the impact of crypto on local government. So it was actually a perfect report to refer to uh, while we were in the middle of the conversations with the Miami-Dade County. 
uh, task force meetings, right? And I think what's interesting about Florida and the Florida Blockchain Task Force, just to think, take a step back for a minute, in terms of accomplishments, you know, countrywide, but particularly Florida, that I think is worth noting, is that we have right now a trifecta going on. You have a state blockchain task force. The state blockchain task force has already gotten together. They had to deal through the pandemic, uh, but they were able to put their recommendations in place and it's already sunset, right? So, I mean, everybody, it, it happened. Then you have the city, right, at a hyper-local level, start experimenting with a new way of accepting cryptocurrency, like this Miami coin uh, um, a, a project, right? For better or worse, right? I'm not gonna give too much of an opinion on this topic, but just the fact is there's a Miami coin not endorsed by the city or the residents, by the way, Okay, just there's a lot of confusion around this, but they said, okay, well, the protocol is gonna donate this money to us. What are we gonna do? Oh, it's just a couple million bucks. A couple million bucks turned to five, turned to 10, turned to 20. The commission's like, there's 20 million bucks waiting for us to do something with this? Okay, fine, what do we need to do to access this, this pool of money? So it's the first time we start to see this sort of precedent at a hyper-local level saying, okay, well, city attorneys are like all confusing, and I know, John, you've, you've had a lot of experience dealing with talking to the different city attorneys and interviewing them and drilling in and grilling them in many cases. So there's still a lot of things up in the air, but it's happened. So now there's a protocol, not a particular individual, not a particular company, that's donating money to a hyper-local uh, uh, municipality that could then choose what they want to do with it to be able to help the greater community, right? And so the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, is saying, all right, well, let's, um, let's take that pool of capital to get the, you say the commission, you know, let's say, okay, each one of you guys gets a million bucks to figure out how you want to experiment with your district or, or, or your different uh, respective, you know, community. And then we still have this pool of capital to figure out what to do with, right? So there's, they're buying themselves time. At the same time, while that project is happening, now you have the overseeing group, which is the county in this case, where, where, where John is the chairman, is saying, okay, well, what is the, not the blockchain task force, but what is a cryptocurrency task force for us to consider whether or not we accept payments or we accept crypto? Um, uh, the mayor already accepted his first crypto, his first check in crypto, uh, in Bitcoin, particularly. I think he accepted it in crypto. Uh, and, B, and, and I don't think in Miami coin, I think in Bitcoin. Uh, I could be wrong, uh, please fact check me on this. Uh, in any case, you're seeing the trifecta, which is now the county, which under oversees 34 cities, right? More than 4 million residents, city of Miami. And a lot of people confuse these things. They hit up John's like, hey, where do we get money to the Miami coin? He's like, man, this is Miami-Dade County is not city of Miami. You know, the, it's a big confusion there. But in any case, now we have 34 different cities that are all looking at their, their other city, Miami, and then the county that's also thinking of, okay, how do we start to sort of uh, interoperate with some of this stuff. Um, so very exciting. I think these are all big accomplishments to have the blockchain task force give recommendations, to have the first uh, uh, sort of city coin. This is, by the way, the third iteration of a Miami coin. I've worked on two of them prior. Um, uh, this, was, this is the one, you know, which are much, a little more complicated, a little more philanthropic. Uh, so this is, you know, there's some lessons to be learned there, which we can get into at some other point. Uh, I've put a link to the report. If you guys want to learn and you're looking at state legislation, uh, our goal today is to give a little bit of a roadmap to anybody that wants to try to emulate some of this. You can look at the state legislation of the Florida Blockchain Task Force. It's on the, the state CFO's office, the financial, um, uh, the financial officer's office, to see some of those recommendations. Um, so anyhow, that's, uh, I think that that's what's interesting. And in the end, just to give a little bit of takeaway and pass the mic over, um, how do we these things now start to interoperate? That's what's key. Okay, great. You got the state, you got a county, and you got a city. And all, everybody's a, practically in alignment. By the way, mayor of Miami is on the, was on the board of the Florida Blockchain Task Force. Um, and, and so the first thing is you need to prove identity. What if, for example, in Miami, we're looking at a decentralized autonomous organization? Last year, a Miami-Dade DAO was launched, and now the residents are trying to sort of self-organize. Hey, what are the projects we want to do? Can we access this pool of capital? Can we, do it in a, can we do it in a decentralized organization where everybody votes on what we want to do with that capital? Can we implement some pilot projects and self-fund it? Very tricky territory, a little bit slippery, but it's happening, right? So we have community-led DAOs. You have all these other uh, legislative bodies, which are, were absolutely key to get this stuff done, and some precedent of people that are already tinkering and going into um, how to accept, how to deal, and interchange, specifically with crypto, not necessarily 
blockchain. Um, and for blockchain, I think, like we mentioned in the beginning, DMVs is probably gonna be one of the important frontiers to consider um, because with the digital ID, you can say, hey, I can vote in my own city DAO because I'm a resident, I'm your constituent, but I can prove I'm your constituent. So when I'm on Twitter, I could just be trolling or I can be like, hey, I should pay attention to what Silvio says, he's actually a constituent in my community, we should pay attention to that, right? John can do the same thing, or he can say, no, Silvio's in Arizona, he's just trolling me, I don't care what his comments are on social media, it's just noise, it's not actually a constituent. You can't do that unless you sort of prove um, um, you know, the, the, the digital ID. So I think the goal here for all of us is to say, we need to work together now that we have some of these foundations in place to share data. Uh, Commissioner Brise mentioned uh, on our call that maybe one of the biggest promises is the fact that we can use Web3 to, to store some data on a permission basis and then share it with other states. Or the city or the county can then share some data and share it with other cities or other counties. My goal, I'm wearing a sustainable development goal pin, are the United Nations goals, right? A little bit of like climate accounting, environmentalism, making sure that we improve the commons, the air quality for everybody. But we can't do this in a place like Miami-Dade County. We have 34 cities. Each city has their own way of accounting for this. So we need to have an inter-alliance agreement. We need to be able to share data. We need a secure way to share data with each other. And because of this, last year, um, uh, Gerard and a couple of the other uh, 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 leaders at the GBA suggested that we start to create an interstate alliance of all the blockchain task force members to get together so that we can compare notes and compare data. Um, uh, 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 Mike's out, out there, he's been working on, in the West Coast. And we need this now the same thing I think this year for municipalities to also have the same kind of alliance to share data. Um, we need to do it in Miami-Dade County. I hope that that would be the next step that we take with the 34 cities to share their data, then the county to report into the state, then the state into the region, the region into the country. And that's, I think, how we can get interoperability going, which is really key for smart cities, sustainability, and any other objective that we want to accomplish. Um, pass the mic over here. Uh, actually, that's perfect, actually. Uh, you're absolutely right. And um, having uh, interoperability is the next phase. Actually, last year, um, um, we had an envoy to, uh, to Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, I'm on the county level, but we were able to, um, with our good friends at the uh, um, uh, um, Crypto Fed, as well as with the legislature for uh, um, Wyoming, um, have these high-level meetings with the Deputy Secretary of State, with their banking director, um, with their, their representatives. And we actually launched uh, a, uh, the U.S. Crypto Policy Alliance. And what it basically is, is Cheyenne as the pioneers, Miami as the premier leading the charge, but it's also a, a collection of 28 other states, state level blockchain associations um, that we actually launched and did right there uh, in Cheyenne. And what the basic premises of it is, is that we will share information, we will support, but also emulate and uh, the actual legislation that uh, Matt, the attorney who was one of the, you know, central to uh, drafting it, they've already set the, the precedent back in 2017. And what you're gonna see is a lot of state level uh, houses submit and pass blockchain legislation and it'll look familiar to that as well. So our basic call is that whatever level you're at, reach out, find and identify the crypto or the blockchain contingent or task force or, or group that's represented. And if it's not one, reach out to us and we can help you create one, right? Once we do that and we have at each level a power base that's actually letting uh, people know what's going on and connect it back with us, then we can have a more comprehensive uh, integration as we move toward adoption yeah, as well. Awesome. So Awesome comments. So that's the thing about it. I think education and, and training yourselves on what this all means. That's why you're all here. Educating yourself, hearing what's going on. And the beauty about GBA is when we get together, you communicate, right? And then you start collaborating. Start working on proof of concepts, right? You know, again, the whole famous saying of uh, fail quickly, right? Fail fast, fail quickly, so you can move on. That's the whole point. You guys are on the cutting edge, bleeding edge. It's a green field still, and a lot of stuff needs to be figured out. Um, and you know, you also had the regulators coming on, state regulators, uh, trying to figure out the same thing. So it's, it is kind of a race, but it's it's actually fun. It's exciting. So next question. So I know you guys are doing a lot of these initiatives and stuff. What are some of the biggest obstacles you guys have faced 
within your states and jurisdictions? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at this real quick. You know, the obstacle is obviously education, right? So uh, I, I use the analogy a couple of times of, of we've all watched football. We understand how the game is played. We have to imagine this as a football game that 90% that, uh, of people have never heard of or have never seen before, and we have to explain the intricacies uh, of this game to them on the fly and why that's important to the community. And so one of the challenges that, that we're faced with in Arizona, I think one of the obstacles is, is a, an adoptive community, right? Understanding why this is important to the public in general. Like we all get it, right? We're in the, we're in the game. We're, we're actually coaches and players in this game, but there are people that have no idea what this is about. And our role and our task and our job is to be ambassadors for this technology. Um, the media is starting to, to, to adopt some of the language that we're using. But uh, we need to figure out ways in 140 characters or less to be able to explain what it is that crypto does, what it, explain what it is that blockchain does, and why it's so important for democratizing uh, the world again, and, and, and to, I guess, uncentralize what's centralized so that the power to the people can be attained again. And I think that's ultimately why uh, America, as was mentioned earlier, can be the center of the world for this, and we'd love for Arizona to be the center of the world for this as well. Um, to, to be this democratization and, and this, uh, I guess, what we'll call is a new era of crypto uh, currency uh, information sharing, where it's peer to peer. So the biggest obstacle, as I see it, is, is education. Yeah, uh, I just have a quote. I, I usually say that. Uh, Ignorance is our greatest enemy, but also our greatest friend. For the masters, their ignorance is an advantage. So we get unprecedented space to develop this, uncorrupted by human fragility. But for the masses, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. And it's a race against time. Like, how can we explain it the simplest way that the most people get it. And what I do is, um, you know, being in politics, it's, it's breaking down the complex to the very simple. And what I tell people is, I say, listen, new things come all the time. This is it. This is not a penny stock, no, some new far-flung gizmo. The blockchain will consume all. And I tell, and a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't know, I'm going to get into that. I said, well, well do you like money? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Well, then you need to understand. Don't be just um, um, you know, automatically, oh, crypto, blockchain, I don't know about that stuff. It's like, yes, you do. You do know about it. Because nothing is new. It's completely different, but it's exactly the same as everything else. Mm -hmm. I, said, I wasn't around in 1993, but if, say somebody came to you and said, hey, your church, your friends, your family, your games, it's all going to be on this place, man called the internet. People are like, what, the internet? How, how, is that a mall? Like, no, 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 it's a place. But honestly, who could fathom that with, with how total it is right now? Raise your hand if in 93 somebody told you all those places, you would have been like, yeah, yeah, I could, I could see that. Of course. Oh, somebody, oh, I see it. <laughs> I got you, but you probably was in it. Yeah, you was, <laughs> right, right. This is what I tell them. You don't know about it, but you know the feeling. Don't allow your weakness your uh or pride or i've got money i've got money in real estate and i've gotten stocks i said not for long not for long anybody that thinks they're rich thinks they're smart and they're not in crypto will experience pain soon there's a correction coming maybe some of you guys don't agree i said there's a correction coming and soon whether it's a crash or a collapse, I'm not here to speculate that. But I do know that we have to start looking at not just crypto, but the blockchain applications more comprehensively. And that's why you know, pushing these efforts forward is so critically important. It's not extra. It is the thing. I worked for JP Morgan doing hedge fund private equity sales from 2006 to 2009, um, 345 Park Avenue. Um, my first job was, I was the analyst doing uh, investment review committee. So I had to walk up and down Park Avenue, bringing on uh, um, um, hedge funds or private equity that wanted to get money from the bank. Yeah, 
Okay. But the, the biggest obstacles is actually the trust that we have. We seem to go up and now it's going down. We ought to connect with our people in the government in all ways, not just the ones who, who actually understand it or have access to it. And actually, that's one of the biggest things about uh, um, our process. So right now, we're in the process of uh, um, putting together our policy recommendation. And we've interviewed about nine different companies um, who want to actually service State County. Um, I won't mention their names. Uh, you, you know all of them. But one of the biggest things I ask them is, OK, well, not just how much, how much money would you like to make from this deal? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we, don't, we don't think about that. We'll ask them, how many employees are at, in Miami-Dade County? And they're like, well, you, gee, that's a good question. I don't know. It's 29,000. But these are the people that's like America. I've been in crypto since 2012. But you cannot assume that a, 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 a chat talk or a, um, a, a Zoom is going to be sufficient to properly make them feel secure about what's happening. They see their paycheck, they see crypto government, and it's ignorance is a driver for fear. So the biggest component for anybody who wants to service us is what is your actual spend, what is your resources to bring education to Miami-Dade County, to our citizens, to our aunt that's been there 17 years, to, to my uncle that's been 27 years working. Yeah, um, they want to have a better future as well. They want to be more secure, and they're looking toward it. But blockchain being transparent, being immutable, being the system we have is the best way, and we're making them realize that. Yeah, since 2017, uh, since I came back to America, I, I spent eight years in China uh, running our business uh, and creating companies out there. But since 2017, since I've been back, I've personally pulled up to quinceañeras, uh, bar mitzvahs, in the homes of, 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 of county mayors, of commissioners, of department heads, and I've personally helped them download their blockchain.io or uh, uh, however wallet they had and sold them their first $100 or $1,000 of of, of Bitcoin or ETH, not knowing that this time would come, not knowing that, that well, knowing that this, this error would come, but not specifically this. And now it's here, it's almost unbelievable. Uh, Silvio, do you, do you have yeah. any obstacles you want to bring up? Yeah, yeah, I think that, I think that it's uh, um, an important point. I mean, anticipating some of the obstacles that, for example, we're accomplishing in, in the state, in the federal, uh, in the city level, and we'll talk about just piggybacking off of, of John's example right now with the county trying to select who can be a vendor, for example, to accept crypto payments or to be able to accept somebody that wants to pay. Um, one of the mayors in Miami asked me to come and present, for example, in front of Sunshine. They had a Sunshine meeting, open meeting for everybody to talk about these different options. And so how do we make sure that we don't, that we really localize the benefit, right? Miami coin, my biggest critique is like no locals know how to actually access Miami coin, right? Um, in the case of, of the cryptocurrency task force and a lot of the people that are going to be providing services, there are not really like any local companies that can do it. And I said, okay, well, why don't we do this? I proposed, I said, well, why don't we, you know, for sure education is the biggest obstacle because it's fear. People that don't know something fear it. And when you fear it, you fight it or you run away, right? That neither of those are very like, a, good to, pro to make progress, neither fighting nor, nor fl no fight nor flight. Um, so, so education, I think, is that comfort and then the alliance of saying, okay, you do a great job at a city level, then you're gonna have to go back to the state, right, just like John experienced at the state level to propose policy at the state so you can do something at the local level. So you, you need that, you know, without that you, start, you have all these challenges. And then, um, uh, so definitely ignorance is one of them. Uh, interest, uh, like the example of the protocol donating, now you got the interest of people. Uh, the trust factor, whether or not people have faith or losing it, the, or the volatility of what's happening. And, uh, and I think ultimately uh, being willing to make mistakes and being okay with that, right, as a norm. I mean, we're not, like in Japan, you know, entrepreneurship is tough. They don't accept mistakes at all. In the US, we're really successful because we accept mistakes. In government, not so much. Right, so if we want to adopt, let's say, we need to be okay with saying, okay, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna fail, and we're gonna do it again, and we're gonna fail, and we're gonna take it, and we're gonna say, okay, that's okay, let's just try it again, and you're gonna get better, and that's how it's gonna get done. So that, 
That factor of education, combination with community, collaboration, the GBA has been an incredible platform, I think can be in a very promising platform for anybody else that wants to incubate and know that it's okay to make mistakes, these sandboxes. But the time it takes to pass a sandbox, the time it takes to pass legislation, right, um, is the biggest, I think, obstacle because there's still a lot of uncertainty and having politicians that are willing to step out on the, on the, on the edge, if you will, and be like, hey, this is, you know, let's, let's do this and let's be okay with failure, I think is, is definitely um, a hurdle. In the case, for example, of accepting, uh, we have, right, the GBA has, has, has been working on a DAO that's, a, that's a, a credit union, right? So I said, well, let's use the credit union and partner with the local Miami-Dade County credit union, which all the 28,000 employees in Miami-Dade County already have accounts with, and enable them, and then you keep the money locally. Right, um, and so, but there's so much fear, right? For example, chairs, like, chairman here is like, how do you know that's gonna work? How do you know we're not gonna get hacked? How do you have the balance sheet for that? How do you know it's gonna be serviced? How, how does a credit union get on board in speed? So that collaboration is, is another sort of big, big obstacle. So there's many of them, but I think certainly policy, being okay with mistakes and being educated as a first step is, is the way to go forward. So um, yeah, I think that that, that covers that main point. I don't know if there's anything yeah. else you want to. Yeah, well, so I guess the human element, right? With like, like any other industry, the human element's the biggest obstacle, right? So in, in, in summary and in, in closing out this, this session, thank you guys all for being here. Um, what, what's the last thing? What, what is some advice you want to provide the people in the room and also the people online somewhere? They're online up there somewhere. <laughs> um, for uh, just what kind of advice you want to pr uh, provide them from your experience with uh, implementing this stuff at the state level? Um, I think that they should join the GBA. I think that's the first, that would be my first recommendation, join the GBA. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of resource that's already available for free. Everybody that's in state, in, in government, whether it's federal, whether it's local, whether it's an agency, they can join. Um, and then they can resource themselves and then get plugged into their communities of interest and then zero in on what's relevant. When they zero in to what's relevant to them and what's interesting to them, then they'll meet a community of people, right? So education, so access, right, join, you get access. Then two is a community of interest, the collaborators. And then three, don't be scared to fail, right? And, and, and you know, uh, accept that as part of the process. And, and, uh, and I think that that would be definitely the recommendation and make sure that you have enough allies along the way. Yeah, awesome. thanks for Thank the question. You. Yeah. Uh, so um, I just wanna make sure that we actually understand what the true mission and value is. When you look down the road and you scenario it out, it's a technology It's gonna come on, there's gonna be policies and regulations that go to it, but what of it? What is the main consequence? What is technology's mission if not to improve the human condition? We know that the incredible efficiencies, access, and effectiveness of the technology is gonna be, is transformational and will be. Subsequently, there's going to be money savings and money made from it. Governments like money. Why do they need money? Right? They want to maintain power. They want to do whatever their interest is for. I'm not a politician. I've been a political operative. But my thing is for the people. The windfalls are created from the fees of an exchange or from a coin need to go immutably, transparently, and expediently to those accounts openly for the homeless crisis that's happening in Miami, for the affordable uh, home crisis squeeze, for the children's trust, for these things that are ravaging my, our county and, and, have, and are similar in other counties. Everybody here, we're good, we're fine. It's not about us. It's not about my money or your money. We know the future and we are right. So what would you do if you knew the future? If you knew a secret, how would you act? we we'll say, oh, you know, I can put that money there and get rich, fine. But if you're not thinking, this is the government blockchain association. The government is about the people. We know that the wealth gap is gonna get hyperbolic Yes, shake your head. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can, you can wave, you can shake your head. 
No, it's not going to get hyperbolic. Oh, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. It's going to get much more dispersed. Who's thinking about the people who are not in? There will be a need for some type of UBI once this ruptures. Where are you going to fund it? Who are you going to tax? How about on the front end, creating a system and say, oh, you know, we're going to have fees for this, we're going to have fees for that. This is going to automatically fund this. Here, we'll automatically fund this. Not into some account to be swept or to be or some, some, some discretionary fund for someone else. So some people can get it in and their friends can spend it. So John, we got, we got one more minute. Can, okay, uh, sorry, sorry, I was trying to quote this. All right, let me, let me end, end with this. This is a, called the crypto invocation and pledge. And we do this before every meeting that we have. Because a lot of people know this is serious and everybody understands it. Peering over the precipice of a paradigm, preparing to pioneer a new path, realizing that the physical world can only be accepted as first, and that our digital reality can no longer be denied at last. Tectonic transition caused by technology's position, prodigious potential to transform every tier in class. Entrusted this vision with prudent decision. May we all be multiplied by this immutable math. I'm Elijah John Baudre, and I solemnly swear to always espouse, to emulate the benevolent idioms of this immutable ledger. Transparent, distributed, Immutable forever. So help me God. <laughs> you. <laughs> you can work. Well, I don't know how you follow that, yeah. but okay. uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know who comes up next. I'm going to go home and fail, by the way. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> He's ready. That was very exciting and very, uh, I would say moving actually, a very passionate and uh, interesting look at local uh, government and, and integration with blockchain. So we are headed into a session on retail banking and I'm very excited to be introducing Michael Hiles and Joseph Lowe and here they are. Well, once again, I don't know how we follow that one. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Come on up. So uh, Joseph and I have met recently as we started to prepare for this particular session. And uh, how's that? Perfect. I'm not hiding behind it, right? So. Uh, our session's retail banking, and so uh, when I talked to Gerard uh, and offered up, hey, we can talk about a few of these things, and then, of course, Joseph brings uh, a completely different perspective with the uh, awesome project of the Maven Federal Credit Union. Kind of seemed like a natural fit to talk about both sides of the equation. So uh, my background is I'm the founder and CEO of a company called 10XTS, 10XTS. Uh, we're based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, my personal background, you know, really uh, kind of spans information architecture, spent uh, about a decade in public record systems. In fact, Hamilton County, Ohio's clerk of courts, courtclerk.org, we won a Smithsonian Laureate Award for being the first to ever connect a judicial management system to the browser so that you could do a case search over the web. And a couple of years later, we were the first to put a biometric device on a judge's bench so a judge could e-sign a document directly into public record with a thumbprint. So 10XTS we formed as you know, essentially a compliance and government uh, workflow automation system. And our approach is to you know, revolutionize capital markets and banking. Joe, you wanna come over? And... Oh, okay, awesome. So 
we want to put blockchain and cryptocurrency into the perspective of the larger uh, fintech banking universe. And I've kind of got it highlighted as you know, number one on the list because it really does impact and affect the rest of the uh, segments of fintech and banking. Starting with regtech, because anything in banking, of course, has an immediate supervisory implication for the ability to uh, actually uh, you know, launch and, 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 and put together uh, an information system that meets with the banking regulators. Now, the reason I'm talking about banking and retail banking is my company actually incubated and launched the uh, fourth special purpose depository institution in Wyoming, and uh, we received approval for our charter uh, back in August of last, you know, last year in 21. And so Commercium Bank was a effort to bring together the technology from both the uh, front end crypto side, uh, but in particular with a, a focus on capital markets that I'll talk about here in a few moments. But you can see each and every single one of those pieces has an implication. So retail banking is going to absolutely change. The regulators know it. Um, and by the way, I want to throw this out. I'm going to go off script here for a second. If you guys haven't seen, there's two immediate legislative actions. We're very proactive in the legislative space. Um, in the past few days, a couple of big things have happened. Uh, the Competes Act is terrible. Call your representatives and ask why the director no longer needs to solicit input from the public commentary uh, based on the change to the law. And then, of course, the SEC put out a comprehensive 600-page ATS, Alternative Trading System, update for public comment, but the window is only 30 days. Commissioner Hester Peirce uh, has already dissented uh, because it effectively will require even uh, EtherScan to become licensed as an alternative trading system. So I don't, I don't know why and where these crazy ideas are coming from, and I say that as somebody who is very neck deep in banking and crypto regulatory uh, function. Uh, I, I think that uh, it, it's really a power grab and a power struggle between our agencies. We're still waiting on the White House to come forth with their executive orders. Apparently we have a new entrant into the space, but everybody who has a passion and an interest and you know, any kind of a financial stake really needs to get on the phone. And uh, you know, we were active during the infrastructure bill. Uh, senator Portman uh, is my senator. And so I was working alongside uh, Square at the time, Block uh, now, uh, and their legislative affairs, who was coordinating the private sector side, and that we were running point with uh, Senator Portman uh, office. And we were able to you know, mobilize the industry in about two weeks' time to uh, broker a deal, which of course got submarined at the last minute by a senator who also wanted an amendment for his defense industry in Mississippi. So um, it, it's going to take the voices. And you know, it's not just private sector versus public sector. So now I'll get back on script, but you know, this is definitely, if you've not seen the, the current situation, you only have 30 days to respond. So legislative alert, uh, get out on Google and look for the uh, ATS SEC uh, documents that were published yesterday. So there's four C's of crypto banking, computing, currency, commodity, and custody. So let's talk about commu uh, computing. We, of course, have payment solutions. And then a corresponding to that is the transactional audits, leveraging blockchain to be able to do the supervisory and the auditing in an immutable fashion. And of course, we had CypherTrace earlier and uh, did a wonderful job. They are certainly leading the field. CypherTrace and Chainalysis are both uh, forensic auditing companies. And when it comes to KYC AML identity, tracing the uh, transactional history of actual uh, transactions for wallet purposes. It's going to be very important to keep track of uh, you know, the, 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 down, the upstream and then you know, certainly the downstream transactions that take place under a global uh, uh, FATF and OFAC standpoint. Then there's currency. Of course, we have fiat currency and stable coins. I think that uh, you know, the very recent discussions about uh, the central bank digital currencies and particularly uh, the folks across the street, the Treasury Department, and a little bit of a departure from being so adamant about pushing a central bank digital currency. I think that there's a recognition now that the private sector has forwarded a uh, you know, adequate solution for uh, fiat-based accounts that have been represented by a digital token-based form of account. Then, of course, there's crypto-based savings accounts. 
crypto-based lending, you will see in particular when the Uniform Law Commission gets done working on the revisions to uh, Section 12 of the Uniform uh, Commercial Code, that uh, banks will be able to actually collateralize lending and take cryptocurrencies as a, a collateral and, and perfect that uh, collateral um, for much cheaper than a rate that you're going to pay by collateralizing your interest in the DeFi markets. So that's actually emerging right now. Uh, over the next couple of years, you're gonna start to see the Uniform Law Commission and states taking up the amendments to the law that will impact retail banking. There are banks that are sitting on the sidelines and we're in favor of small institutions. We like banks. I, I like having a local bank that I can walk into the branch and sit down and talk to the uh, president of the bank. You know, we've lost that in the United States. Banks have been consolidated upwards to these giant monolithic organizations. And we need a return. We need choices as consumers. We need personal relationships. And this is a wonderful leveling of the playing field opportunity for banks to actually uh, enter new spaces and create new products and, and leverage these products. Not all banks are bad guys. In fact, when it comes to the stable coin versus the central bank digital currency, in our current world where up is down and black is white, the banks kind of become the good guys when it comes to Fourth Amendment and privacy issues. Right? They're the last stopgap between the United States Treasury having direct real-time access to every single transaction that occurs in your personal finances on a, on a real-time basis. Not real exciting to a guy like me. Then you have commodity. Of course, you have banks that are seeking uh, the entrance into crypto exchanges, being able to buy and sell cryptocurrencies through uh, trading desks. And then, of course, uh, development of uh, derivatives and uh, closed-end exchange-traded ETNs and ETF products. Uh, you're starting to see banks leaning in, and there's a very strong interest. I speak very regularly to uh, bankers' associations and really work uh, at, at the state level with a lot of institutions. And I can tell you that it, it, two years ago, when we started the application process with the state of Wyoming, we did it because there weren't any banks that could service my customers that were looking for custody for securities tokens. You know, we're talking traditional securities, not even anything fancy, like you know, uh, you know, pure play digital assets. So uh, now, two years later, they're all leaning in. They all know that it's coming. So then let's talk about custody. You know, this is where you know, a lot of folks don't like the idea of uh, banks having control over your uh, assets. But there is federal legislation, particularly in the security space, that requires custody. For example, if you buy and sell investments with qualified money, 401ks, uh, for example, it requires a fiduciary custodian. Hard stop. And I can tell you right now, not a single regulator is liking the idea of roll your own wallet with a multi-sig approval. They really want the custodian to actually create and control and own these things. And then further, the SEC has very succinctly defined the three-step process for the settlement and uh, clearing of secondary markets transactions of tokenized securities. So if you're buying and selling and trading shares of stock that have been tokenized in a company or limited partnership units and you're trading on an alternative trading system or a licensed exchange, the SEC has agreed. Let's simplify this process. And we like that because now we're making things more efficient, which is ultimately going to result in better capital efficiency and performance for investors in the secondary markets as they're finding liquidity and buying and selling and trading in uh, traditional assets that are now represented in a unit of account that's tokenized form. So part of our exercise is, you know, let's take a look at some banks and see what thing, you know, the banks are doing. So one of the big banks that you know, we follow is Silvergate. Um, we like Silvergate. They started life as a traditional uh, industrial loan company, actually, in the 80s, and then ultimately have converted uh, into a, a formal bank charter and uh, became a Federal Reserve member bank in 2012. And um, they really kind of blazed the trail as a uh, chartered institution. And as a result, they now have uh, upwards to 13 billion in assets. Um, and a lot of that is crypto asset and cryptocurrency base. So their goal was to create the uh, Silvergate network. And the, uh, the, the, the ultimate goal was, can we consolidate the, uh, the, the, the situation to uh, uh, streamlined and um, you know, put together a, a more streamlined approach? to settlement of cryptocurrencies. 
what we're doing, of course, is uh, our focus is in securities tokens and securities markets. You know, one of the reasons we spawned Commercium Bank was to, to provide a, uh, an efficiency and bring you know, radical efficiency to the uh, legacy securities market infrastructure where you have you know, many intermediaries in the process and you have one giant monolithic monopoly called Depository Trust Corporation and we're effectively eliminating that in conjunction and, and working alongside the Securities Exchange Commission so that the network becomes the clearing and the, and the custody for uh, the exchange and transfer of securities tokens. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Joseph, who can now talk about how blockchain and crypto are changing credit unions with the awesome project of Maven Federal Credit Union. You guys are pre-charter, so I mean, yeah. I can be on your board of advisors, right? Um, well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm definitely not a master of toast or a public speaker. I barely have my associates and I burn toast a lot. Um, so if I, but this is something I'm very passionate about and it's, uh, so Gerard asked, hey, could you speak about it? So how is blockchain and uh, crypto changing credit unions? Let's start with it. First of all, uh, the crazy guy in the picture, that's me, obviously. Um, I'm the co-founder and the, uh, lead organizer for the proposed Maven Federal Credit Union. We are currently in pre-charter status, which means we have been given uh, approval by the federal regulatory body called the NCUA. I'm also a director for a company that builds what's called a CUSP, which is a credit union service protocol, which we uh, are looking to build deployable credit unions. No different than you would go and download uh, your copy of an Ethereum blockchain or a big, uh, for your, or your own uh, Bitcoin blockchain as well. Uh, we want to make uh, credit unions uh, very um, accessible and again, um, easy for people to deploy. So what are credit unions and how did they start? Let's start with a little bit of history. So in 1933, obviously we're dealing with the Great Depression in this country and they created uh, what we call the Banking Act. Uh, so the Banking Act is what introduced the FDIC and the SEC. FDIC was to basically bring confidence back in the banks. We were seeing a lot of collapses and it was to ensure the funds that were in those banks. SEC was to regulate the markets and how banks participated in them. Um, but one thing they found uh, was the people were not protected still. Uh, businesses and large commercial banks were. So in 1934, they introduced what's called the uh, Federal Credit Union Act. And it was a form of regulation to allow depository institutions for the people without excessive controls and regulation, okay? It's a very good framework. So let's, a uh, couple pointers on that. Um, anybody that decides to uh, start a credit union um, under the NCUA, which is the National Credit Union Administration, it's a federal regulatory body again, um, they are exempt from the SEC and the uh, CTFC, okay, so, or the CFTC. Uh, what we see in this, uh, what's going on right now, it seems like to be a big debate where people are like, we should be completely unregulated and the other side of that is the SEC saying, SEC saying, well, you're selling securities. Uh, what nobody's looking at is what we found is why not just uh, regulate your DAO as a credit union? It's near the same language. Uh, they introduced with the Credit Union Act something revolutionary. The count holders at the institution are synonymous with the shareholders. Okay, uh, there was no separation. So if you deposit money in a credit union, you own a share in the credit union. So what are some different innovations that credit unions brought to what we call today uh, FinTech? Uh, well, for their day, <laughs> they uh, created the concept of peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Since we're all shareholders in the credit union, uh, we're peers. We all, uh, you could have a million dollars in a credit union, I could have a dollar, but we all still have one vote. We can trade uh, in the credit union at the uh, local tables there. And uh, that was a big concept for its day. Uh, they first used uh, touchstone phone banking. 
It was actually Stanford Federal Credit Union that introduced in 1993 the concept of internet banking that we have today. And because we had internet banking, uh, they introduced the concept of digital receipts. And digital receipts are what allows us to create things today like tokenized assets, right? All right, uh, first employee, shared branching. Shared branching is where you can go to any ATM within the network. It doesn't matter what uh, credit union it is. You deposit the money and it goes in the proper account. Uh, you could be at ABC Credit Union and deposit money at XYZ and it still goes to ABC Credit Union, okay? And it was a federal credit union in Charleston, West Virginia that actually was the first to deploy remote deposit captures where it's, you could scan a check in versus coming into the branch. So what are the future, uh, what is the future of credit unions? Um, well, digital receipts can now be issued as tokens, creating a second layer of liquidity while assets are static. This will reduce costs and friction and it'll increase velocity, okay? Uh, centralized bank course can be effectively converted uh, to a decentralized and distributed ledger. So we talked, to, uh, so we've heard some people talk about what if we get hacked or what if there's attacks, uh, there's, you know, the information is not stored in a centralized place um, and uh, any uh, pain point or any uh, part of the uh, network can basically relaunch the blockchain and put it back up to uh, operation, okay? Um, peers can transfer shares like currency because when you go and deposit your uh, money into a credit union, you get an exchange what's called shares, okay? So now you can trade the shares like currency from member to member. You have zero transaction cost. And now um, you can do other things as well. Like what if we could have uh, federally insured uh, Bitcoin? I mean, something as simple as that. A lot of people are asking, hey, I have Bitcoin, but I can't access my wallet. I lost my private keys. Uh, people can uh, hack it, they take it, you send it to the wrong person, and that money's gone and it's gone forever. Uh, one of the benefits of depository institutions that are insured by the federal government is uh, mistakes can be fixed, okay? Uh, so it would, a, a blockchain credit union would actually be a uh, fully insured Web3 bank. The other thing is uh, a, certain, a recent request for information was put out in July of 2021 by the NCUA. They wanted to know how could credit unions uh, basically work with crypto. Uh, a lot of uh, the members of credit unions wanting to buy Ethereum and Bitcoin. So uh, I answered that RFI and what they put out was um, they can start with third party integration. This is obviously a slow process, not over something that's gonna happen overnight, but it's making tons of progress and they're very excited. This is the federal government, by the way, we're speaking of. They're uh, very excited by the concept of uh, this new concept, not just integrating blockchain, but actually making the blockchain itself a credit union, okay? Let's talk about an example of a credit union that's actually accomplishing this. Maven Federal Credit Union, it's the proposed Maven Federal Credit Union at this time. It should be, um, we, we're looking at submitting for full charter at the end of February. Uh, the beginning of March, it's sponsored by the Government Blockchain Association. Let me explain what this means for a second. So uh, banks, when you go to join banks, all you have to do is walk in, fill out the application, give them some money, and uh, promise to keep your you know, deposits at a certain minimum, and there you go. With a credit union, you have to have a common bond, and those common bonds uh, to become a member are based on a couple different things, uh, geographic common bonds, so a city, you could have a common bond based on an association. Uh, so our association here is around blockchain, right? And then uh, the other is industry. So you could have plumber credit unions, you could have electrician credit unions and so on and so forth. All right, so it is the first um, pre-chartered uh, blockchain credit union in the United States and perhaps the world. It's a branchless network. Um, your deposit accounts, one big thing is, is if you go to one bank, you start an account. If you want to go to another bank, you got to shut down one account. You got to move all your drafts to the other account. You lose your routing number and your account number and it makes the, it's a little bit of a nightmare. So with the invention of things like wallets, all you have to do is uh, take your account and routing number with you and join another blockchain credit union without disruption, okay? 
the blockchain itself becomes a savings and equity uh, platform to where you can facilitate peer-to-peer -peer loans, savings, and transfer of tokenized assets. Uh, you can find all this information at mavenfederal.org. Uh, the other thing is just to dream build a little bit. Like I said, what if we could have uh, federally, federally insured Bitcoin, federally insured Ethereum, any type of digital asset? Uh, what if we could have a, a tethered currency or a peg currency where we know how, much, uh, how many dollars are backing that stable coin or that peg currency? The books are open. They're updated live, and we all have the ability to audit uh, at any time. Nothing's hidden from us, and we all own the bank. Um, real quick, just to kind of show you the difference between a legacy bank core and a blockchain bank core. There's uh, subtle differences at the top. Uh, this is, and this is different, eh, a little bit different than just regulation. So regulation allowed for peer-to-peer -peer transactions. But when they created bank course in the uh, ledgers, yep, there we go. I think we're coming back online. I'll wait. So basically when they started creating these ledgers, uh, they became this centralized technology where if you wanted to begin moving your assets between you and other peers, I'm going to talk about something you guys have no image to, so I'm going to give it a second. So um, I made this really beautiful picture for you guys, this diagram. <laughs> I really want you to see it. Um, but anyways, I'll, I'll try to convey the message verbally. So they created this technology, bank whores, where if you want to trade your assets with a peer, you have to go through a, um, a clearinghouse, a centralized clearinghouse, which then you have to have a third party involved. They have to... Uh, they have to transfer the assets for you, and they have to record it on the ledger, which, induce, which creates labor and creates cost. So what is the difference between that and a blockchain bank core? Well, now individuals um, will each have a copy of the ledger. They can trade assets between one another, so there's no intermediaries. Uh, they mutually agree to uh, the settlement of the transaction. They record it to their ledger and accept it by the blockchain as a whole. No labor's created and no uh, intermediary costs are created. Therefore, um, we save money, zero. And uh, if you can see it, we're open up to Q&A. If you have any questions or... Thank you, sir. You mentioned member-to-member uh, -member loans. Would the member making the loan have access to the uh, applicant's credit or anything like that? Absolutely not. Okay. Oh, no. And, and to, to augment and kind of go off that, uh, we had a recent discussion with a, a partner of ours. We have a corporate credit union that is uh, backing our deposits worth about $15 billion. And we, had also had, we have direct conversations with the, uh, the federal agency that oversees this. So the, the concept of is you come in, you KYC, all that personal identity. Once we have verified and approved you, uh, that I, information would then be stored into a security token into your profile. It would not be stored on a central server. Okay. okay. And uh, there would be no way to validate the, either the identity or the, the worthiness of a of an applicant it's for a good loan? question so the the funds are federally insured so you, you're not worried too much about the losses now a couple things that are different so with a bank um, they're looking for the best applicants for the loans with a credit union you're looking to build credit you're looking to help people who have no credit or may have bad credit so what we'll be able to do is offer lending um, and a 
fixed interest rate and where anybody can get approved. Um, I have a question from Michael yeah. um, in regards to that 600-page uh, ATS uh, report. Yeah. Um, can you explain about the EtherScan or the government pressing for EtherScan to become licensed? Yeah, so they're apparently trying to expand the definition of the requirements for the application of the licensure to include things that would ordinarily not require a full-blown uh, ATS license. Um, you know, we're working through the 600 pages right now. Uh, my chief legal officer is here, and I'm not going to put her on the spot, but uh, Andy Birchfield, uh, we've been, you know, working heavily on the, the dialogue. Okay. Yeah. They're, okay. they're trying to pull it back, basically. But in doing so, just like the infrastructure bill broadly expanded the definition of a digital asset mm -hmm. and what constitutes the requirements for registration of these things, and do miners need to be licensed, uh, you know, based on a, you know, brokerage side, this broad brush stroke of expansion of the definition of what requires a Series 24 principal broker dealer license within the additional form ATS application. It's pretty broad, and uh, it's very disconcerting that they've compressed the comment period to only 30 days, very. and uh, you know it's 600 pages to start with. So it's going to take a, at least a couple of hours to just read the whole thing. <laughs> so, is there, are there um, implementing any regulations on uh, da the data science? So how EtherScan is basically like a, a ledger. You can see everything that's that's. Yeah, they're basically on. saying that any network that pairs up buyers and sellers in a transaction for anything. Mm -hmm. would require an ATS license, as I understand it. Is that true, Counselor? Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what they're saying, is if, even if it's game tokens or rewards tokens, has mm -hmm. nothing to do with securities or currency or any of that, if you provide a, a service or a network that matches buy side, sell side, which of course is, you know, any network marketplace that, you know, even open C, you know, right, would be Man. subject to an ATS requirement. Yeah, okay. And does that trickle down to uh, individual um, sellers on OpenSea? So if an artist, let's say I create um, my project and I put it on OpenSea, does the, doc have you guys had enough time to read through it and see if the, there's documentation that regulates like for artists? Um, I don't know that I'll have time with Commissioner Purse tomorrow morning. We're meeting with the SEC Commissioner uh, okay. directly, and I don't know that I'll have time to get that specific clarification. If you read her dissent. Okay. That is something she's calling for. She's yep. wanting more commentary from stakeholders in the industry to ask those questions. Yes. So get out there today. I mean, literally, you got 30 days to submit a formal commentary or question asking these very questions. So. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks, guys. Great work. Um, how do we start taking advantage of this in different communities, um, like uh, like like I mentioned, Miami-Dade County, and other credit unions? Is there a way that you can offer some kind of like a layer or participation or collaboration with other credit unions for them to take advantage of this? Or maybe you can give some suggestions on like how to, to the yeah, side. on the. You can speak to the credit union. So for us, yeah. part of the strategy originally going in was to provide banking as a service to other banks. Mm -hmm so that we become effectively a clearing bank on the back end. Since then, we've also engaged, this year we will likely be filing an IFE charter in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. uh, who recently launched a form of bank charter there. Um, and so that gives us access to some international banking rails. Uh, from a state bank standpoint, you know, the jury's still out on whether the Federal Reserve is actually going to give us access to the Federal Reserve window because there is a bit of a, a political tussle between the state of Wyoming and uh, the folks across the street at the Treasury Building, um, which means that until then uh, we have to correspond uh, with another bank. Um, the SPDIs are non-lending, so there's a little bit of a distinction there, but our goal was basically to empower other local community institutions institutions that would then want to engage in these things and we just become a service bureau processor on the back. But I think, Joseph, you probably got some comment about, you know, even Miami-Dade Credit Union for the good folks in the Absolutely. community. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, there's a 
couple ways or a couple forks down this. The main uh, focus we're putting down right now is if you want to be involved um, as far as MAVEN goes or how do other credit unions get involved, uh, credit unions can join other credit unions as a depository institution. So if, uh, say, Miami-Dade or anybody is interested um, and they wanted to acclimate to this concept of a blockchain credit union, they could join uh, the GBA or they join to join MAVEN and they could begin uh, putting their deposits there. The second phase could be we could look at creating a blockchain credit union template for them and slowly create a transition. Uh, what they're going to see, though, is they're going to see um, a reduction in building space uh, because it's, it's branchless, right? There's, mm. there's no need to come in and out, or they could turn their, in, uh, they could turn their internals of their building into um, a place where members could come in and conduct business together as peers. Mm. So. And this is already, you guys are already operational, ready to, ready to go, or are there any other, any other things in the, in the roadmap ahead? So uh, Commercium Bank has not been approved by the Wyoming Banking okay. Division to actually operate yet. They're mm -hmm. still going through their pre, you know, the charter was awarded and mm -hmm. granted. Um, and so there's an independent board, an independent management team. They are working right now to, uh, you know, basically build the tech stack, integrate with, you know, whatever you right. know, other tech stacks. But they've got to have a core processing system in place to just open up an account, right? And uh, so they're going through those, you know, current steps. Uh, probably late this year, um, you know, if things continue to progress uh, forward, then the Division of Banking would then, of course, come in and approve us to operate. None of the four SPDIs have actually been approved to operate yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Kraken was the first, Caitlin Long with Avanti, yep. uh, Wyoming Digital Trust, WDT, mm -hmm. and then Commercium Bank was the fourth. I don't believe that they're going to accept any more applications mm -hmm. currently. Um, so it'll be the four of those institutions, and um, yeah, you know, I think Kraken's probably the furthest along. They were the first charter to be approved, um, but it's, it's quite an undertaking. You know, mm. It's you know to to meet all the checks and balances from a supervisory standpoint. Uh, you know, regardless of what line of business that you're in, um, you know, your policies and procedures from a compliance standpoint, and we had mm. to submit all of those as part of the application process. Our uh, charter application was like a thousand pages, so it's, mm. we we wrote a big book, War and Peace kind of a <laughs> tome, and uh, so then they go through and they check, okay, this is what you said you were going to do. Did you do it? You know, and so all that compliance and that audit process is, uh, you know, pretty strict. And you know, when it comes to the identity and the KYC, AML, and the uh, account opening processes. Uh, it's serious business. It's not just, you know, hey, can we just go hire Jumio or, you know, Okta or, you know, some provider, uh, because it's criminal. You know, when it comes to a, a bank, there's no private sector institution that has higher compliance requirements than a banking charter because of the fact that OFAC and uh, FATF, uh, you know, they can lead the, the compliance officer out in handcuffs if there's, a, you know, an issue. Um. You want to add something to that? If not, I'll have one more, one more question, um, which is there have been some requirements, capital requirements, to be able to apply uh, to some of these uh, uh, programs, some of them very, very large capital requirements as well. Uh, could you talk about the process and your journey you know, as a, sort of an alliance with the GBA, also a bit of a startup, also applying, and then some of the you know, applying in an area that has a lot of stringent re capital requirements and, and how you've maybe been able to bootstrap to, to get to this point? Yeah, for us, the capital requirements are much higher. I think the credit unions have a very significant advantage based on the percentage of dollars that have to be put on deposit. Uh, you know, Joseph can speak to that directly. Um, you know, we, we had to demonstrate that we had five million before they even accepted right. our application. Right. And then it becomes, you know, really a function of how many assets are on deposit mm -hmm. and a percentage of that on an ongoing basis. Now, the cool thing about the SPDI is the uh, crypto assets that are on deposit are considered off balance sheet. Hmm. So it's not actually counted as part of that depository side. It's really only what's in cash accounts uh, that's counted as, hmm. as part of the depository requirements. Just Has that worked in your favor or made it more, more difficult? Oh, it makes it much easier, mm -hmm. significantly easier. 
Absolutely. Yeah, so um, to try to wrap this up for you really quick, Celia. So the uh, capital requirements for us to submit charter, right now we had to go through what's the hardest part. It's called pre-charter, getting our field of membership approval done. We uh, So the uh, again, the NTUA, a federal regulatory body, has approved GBA as a an official and legitimate organization and said the field of membership is legitimate. So um, the capital requirements to submit for our charter, we're going through a fundraiser right now. Everything's donated capital, uh, 300,000. Uh, we can take all kinds of different assets as well. So we can, and we count that towards the balance sheet. So we can take Bitcoin, Ethereum. Uh, we can actually take, uh, if anybody wants to donate uh, GPU mining uh, <laughs> computers, we would love that, uh, appreciate that as well. Uh, we're going for a million dollar raise, obviously, overall, because we need some capital for uh, operational costs mm -hmm. and in um, building um, what we call income earning fixed assets like Bitcoin mining uh, operations. So this way the credit union pays for its own operational costs and any uh, profit earned from lending or investments can go directly back to all uh, the uh, members. Wow, this is a huge accomplishment. Uh, good job, guys, and uh, good job to the GBA. Correct. Thank you. All right. All right, appreciate it. All right, thank you, everyone. We did run a little bit over, um, but we'll keep going so we don't run into lunch too much. Um, we have a great video. Uh, that we would like to play next on central banking. Um, and then that will be followed by uh, Daryl Hubbard, uh, who will present his piece uh, in person uh, following that. So um, this is a great panel. Jim Kuhn is on that from the Fed. Uh, and we will uh, be playing that shortly. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Anyone still alive? Yeah. yeah. So I'm the contrarian today. I'm, I'm here to talk about central bank digital currencies. I see we have a very anti-government audience. I'm going to help you guys today, OK? Because <laughs> I actually um, spend most of my time talking to governments and central banks and all their concerns. So this should be an interesting uh, discussion. So I'll start at this Lowe's. Um, my name is Daryl Hubbard. I'm the, a founding member of the Digital Currency Monetary Authority here in Washington, D.C. 
I started my journey in um, CBDC, or I shouldn't say CBDC, actually digital currencies and blockchain back in 2013. My team and I won um, several grants from the European Commission to work on uh, various social and civic uh, projects um, from the Horizon 2020 grant program. And from there, we got um, lots of worldwide recognition. We were written up in the European Commission, um, the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. And we began collaboration with the Central Bank of China, as well as the Korean government on the Smart Cities Initiative and other digital currency projects, which led to eventually forming the DCMA here in DC. And um, the DCMA, our, our role is to, uh, we are the in innovation leader. We could, we, we could say that's what the worldwide innovation leader in digital currency solution for governments and central banks. Um, I, I will go through some of our innovations here. We provide digital currency solutions, digital trade solutions, and digital payment solutions. Um, CBDC is focused on national currencies. Um, actually, the DCMA, not only do we look at national currencies, but we also look at continental and global currencies as well. Let's see if I can get the flicker working. Do I, do I hit the... Bring the mic up a little closer. Do I to trade this to change the slide? Oh. Okay. Um, so this is the Bank of International Settlements. They um, they do sort of research and innovations for um, banks, and most of the banking communities are part of this. And they've sort of put out guiding principles for CBDC and digital currency solutions. Um, we sort of agree with much of the recommendations from BIS, and we sort of incorporate those guiding principles also in our recommendations to, to central banks. Um, so I'm, today I'm going to talk a little bit about national currencies, continental currencies, and global currencies. Um, like we have the G7 and G20 coin, for example. We have Africa coin for all of the continent of Africa. But I get into those details a little bit later. We, we have an issue on the Slide, can we try to get it, okay. So first I'd like to sort of address what's the difference between CBDC and what we all know as sort of the traditional crypto ledgers like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple, et cetera. Um, and what some of the functional requirements, can those ledgers work inside of banking um, as we know it today? And I would say the part of the most fundamental difference is, you know, what Bitcoin operates in a what anonymous trustless environment so it has, you know, very complex consensus proof of work to try to to manage a trust as a protocol. Whereas CBDC, the, the, the central banks are a trusted monetary system of an economy. Um, so its consensus architecture should not necessarily be as as sort of complex as a proof of work in a trustless environment. So. The, the speed of being able to do uh, transaction consists in the CBD environment should look quite different from something like a Bitcoin or Ethereum type model. And the functional requirements are quite different. Most uh, Bitcoin was designed for cash, the exchange of value between parties. Banking is far more complicated than simply a cash ledger. You have debits and credits and all types of ledger accounts. Um, you, know, you you can have negative balances in the bank, you have overdrafts. You can't have that in a, most of the public ledgers, right? So how do you solve the complexities of banking inside of a, these types of technology? The answer is you can't. You have to build a different type of ledger technology for CBDC. Um, and probably one of the most controversial things I like to start with is most of the, so we talk to, we talk to um, advanced economies like the G7 central banks as well as the emerging market economy central banks. And there's a common theme of, you know, questions we get to how do we solve this, how do we solve that. And the number one question across both of them is how do we make CBDC um, both private and completely traceable, <laughs> right? That's the, that's the oxymoron. Um, but, it, but it's very solvable, right? And, and the myth I want to dispel right now is everybody said, well, we don't want the government spying on us and doing surveillance on CBDC. The earlier gentleman said, we don't want the government to be able to see our transactions in real time, right? Well, let me give you a wake up call. The government can see all your transactions today, right? Every electronic payment is traceable, whether you're doing debit or credit cards, bank to bank transfers, 
or PayPal or whatever your favorite cash app is, it's all traceable. So CBDC is not introducing new traceable um, capabilities to government. It just makes it faster, cheaper, and better. So yes, it can maybe trace faster, but that's, a, that's not the point. Government should be able to trace transactions for AML, terrorist financing, and any other bad actor deal. So this thing the government should not be able to to um, have a security architecture that can to make uh, this monetary system more safe than secure, just a false idea and a false start. Even the GD, GDPR, which is the general protection um, regulation by the EU, when we build our proposals to the EU on blockchain and digital currency, the number one thing was how can we implement GDPR in our systems. And, and GDPR allows for security analysts, people who have the specific role of security to be able to audit and trace transactions. So um, now cash to cash transactions are not traceable. So if you still want to do cash to cash as people do today, that's in a um, CBDC won't affect that. But if you're doing digital currency, digital currency is mostly is an alternative to electronic currency or electronic payments, which is completely traceable. It's just not very efficient to trace. Um, so our ledger technology can support private transactions where no one can understand and see the, the digital signatures on the blockchain. However, those who have the role of security should definitely be able to, to monitor and trace those transactions for AML and other things of that nature. Right, so one of the big differences between CBDC and sort of the public ledger technology is KYC. In the banking industry, you can't open up a bank account without them knowing who you are, right? You gotta have identification, et cetera. So these types of technologies must be enabled on the blockchain as well, where you can actually have uh, um, KYC along with all your crypto, or I should say CBDC transactions, right? So we recommend a, a registry because not only uh, most of the AML that's happening in, uh, in today's world is happening across banks and across country lines. So people, you know, if you send a million dollars on a, on a bad trade deal, uh, once the recipient receives that money, they're automatically, what, moving it out of the country and moving it to another bank to an offshore haven. So uh, in order to be able to track these transactions globally, you really need a more of a global register where everyone, every bank can submit uh, the credentials of their, their client and we give them a global ID. So everywhere they have a bank account, everywhere they have a, whether it's an onshore or offshore, have the same identifier. So every person has a global identifier, whether it's a business or a person. And now we can monitor that any AML activity that's happening across state or across country. Now, how can CBDC, CBDC support all banking transactions? Well, again, you know, Bitcoin and Ripple and all these other uh, techno public ledger technologies are cash ledgers, right? How do you handle debt? They normally do smart contracts. On Ethereum, there's a bunch of smart contracts that every financial uh, institution is writing to implement all types of DeFi and other applications. But the problem with that, that's not very scalable, right? And everyone is implementing these solutions in their own way. So you don't get a consistency in approach and compliance, legality, and sanctions if, if everybody's implementing their own algorithms for how to do, do DeFi. What you really need is more of a, what I call a multi-ledger DLT. We're not only supporting cash, we can support every type of ledger transaction. So cash is where we started, but loans, distributed, dis disbursements, disbursements like with coronavirus, uh, with the coronavirus, the government wanted to be able to send out money to all the citizens for, you know, some type of financial relief. Investment ledgers, we've, imp we've implemented about 14 or a dozen different types of ledgers, all in the ledger technology. So these are not smart contracts that's written on top of the blockchain. This is part of the basic out-of-the-box ledger capability. So unless CBDC can support every type of banking transaction, what's going to happen? You're going to have the fiat world and CBDC only for money movement? Or to have a real true current digital currency or digital bank, you have to be able to support all the functionality of the bank on top of the, in my view, on top of the ledger and not having each bank or financial application writing their own smart co contract with inconsistencies and, and compliance and security to implement them. All right. Now, what we find is uh, in, the, in the advanced economies, most of the G7, G20 countries, they are looking at CBDC and digital currency more for B2B transaction, commercial and capital markets, mostly around instant settlements, right? How do we, how, how do we improve the velocity of money 
so we can sell a transaction faster and get more revenue. And I think we had the economists earlier talking about the velocity of money. Um, this is really the big, the big idea in capital markets. And of course, digital currency can solve that problem, or at least in speed up that velocity issue around settlements. In emerging markets, they are, they, are, they are more focused on retail CBDC. How do we, you know, you know, the sustainability issue, financial inclusion issue, how do we offer CBDC to all the customers in an equitable fashion where everyone ha have access to this future economy, right? How do we minimize the, the constant pull, this wealth gap that people talked about earlier that's going to happen? But can we bring, you know, the unbanked and the, uh, the unconnected into this, to this new world of um, CBDC, right? So there's a couple of, of um, R&D projects that we're undertaking right now for, for those that's not connected. One is, it's sort of like prepaid Visa cards. Um, this, you can have prepaid CBDC cards for your wallet and everything's on the card and you can go and spend that CBDC with the merchants even if you don't even have a phone device. But there's many phones in you know, these emerging markets. They're not smartphones. And we, we luckily, literally, I have three smartphones, one too far too many. But um, most of the emerging market countries, many of them don't, they have feature phones, right? They, they, they're not smartphones. They, they, they're the old Nokias. And they have Bluetooth, some of them, but they don't have Wi Fi connectivity. How can they participate in this CBDC economy? So we've curr we're currently building a prototype right now where you can do um, point to point. Bluetooth money transfers without any type of Wi-Fi. Well, how would that work? Because they're not connected to the general ledger, right? So the, all, the transactions are happening totally through Bluetooth offline, and at some point there is some network connectivity, and we sync up to the to the to the main node network. But these are the type of ideas you see the differences between emerging market companies, uh, countries, and the advanced economies. Now, again, one of the uh, another one, one of the bigger issues is also interoperability. Um, right now we have SWIFT that sort of handles you know, wire transfers between countries. We have a whole fragmented distributed network of different payment systems. They all use the SWIFT messaging protocol. Well, how is this going to work in the CBDC world? You have different nodes, right? That, that, that every bank has to host hundreds of nodes for every other CBDC. It's, it's not really practical of a solution, right? So we, we've created what we call the multi-currency wallet. My big innovation around this is called CBDA. We're going to introduce that term right here today, cashback digital assets. What's a cashback digital asset? It's basically a stable coin that's governed by the banks. So Tether is a stable coin governed by a centralized private enterprise, um, but I can assure you most banks are not going to adopt Tether, right? The banks want to control the, the, the issuance and the governance of money. Um, so we introduce in cash back digital assets, which is the same concept, except it's governed by the bank, meaning only the banks can issue it. So it's, a it's a decentralized model where any bank that's part of the central banking network can mint that coin based on their customer deposits. Um, that way we can have one wallet. So this is a proposal we have for the African Union right now. The African Union has ins instituted what we call the African Union Free Trade Zone of 54 countries in Africa, right? And they, they introduce and trade amongst each other. And so we are going to the, the different central banks. They're suggesting our technology here that will help them figure out how to move money between these countries without having to do FX rates. So each, so we have a coin literally for every single country, but this, to this, for this slide, so if this, this thing about every country of Africa, they have that CBDA, which basically mirrors each of their CBDCs. But by having our CBDA, they all can have one wallet from the DCMA for every single currency. And, that, and then, then that multi-currency wallet will interface with the CBDC. So we, we basically become the middleware between all the currencies. Therefore, every bank doesn't have to try to host all these different nodes, right, and manage all that, that, that connectivity. So um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty big innovation. And, and it's done by, again, through decent, decentralized governance. So any, any bank will be able to issue the CBDA based on customer deposits. And, and mint that coin accordingly. Um, now, compliance, legal, and sanctions. Now, in Bitcoin, do you have compliance, legal, and sanctions review <laughs> on transactions? No, right? Of course, in the CBDC world, uh, you have to be able to, to follow the regulatory compliance, FinCEN compliance, and things of that nature. So right now, every financial services company are responsible for, the, for their own compliance, legality, and sanctions implementation. I think that's not efficient. 
what if we can centralize this at the CBDC level and every transaction that happens, the, the network ensures that it meets compliance regulatory and sanctions uh, rules and enforcement, right? So we're not relying on each institution to implement these protocols distinctly. We actually can actually build this into the currency protocol. So this is one of the things that we've done and we are suggesting to each central bank that they um, build sanctions and, and compliance and legality into the protocol and not rely on each financial services company for that. Um, let's talk about some of the specific innovations that we are doing. Now, um, the, the, the four things that can really impact banking of the future is artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, tokenized digital assets, and sustainability. This was an article that was published by the Future of Finance. And we've seen all four of these areas. So I'd like to talk about, especially number one and number three, how does artificial intelligence work with digital currencies to create smart money? This is an area that I've been very keenly involved in for a few years. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Blockchain Week in Hong Kong. Uh, back in two, just two years ago, we submitted, before, uh, before we formed the DCMA, an innovation to Blockchain Week of an income producing stablecoin. It's basically a stablecoin that generates yield intrinsically using our AI without having to subscribe to some third party offering. And we, we won the innovation of the year for that. And we use that as the basis for many of our currency innovations today. I'll explain some of them to you now. Um, so AI, think about AI and money. So there's all these DeFi systems out there that's generating yield. So your money should be making money for you while you sleep. Uh, my, my vision is the future will have smart wallets that can know, know your customer behavior, know your, your spending, and know your availability of cash. And it should be automatically subscribing you to yield producing um, DeFi situations, why you, you know, automatically should have your, your KYC, your profile with your credit investor, not uncredited, and your smart wallet should constantly be making money for you. And this is also going to happen on the banking side. Central banks, they are affected by FX rates, especially global banks, right? Many, many of them are offering interest rates based on how well they fan against the U.S. dollar. And they need to be able to have risk mitigation technology that can generate yield through AI. Um, and, and they FX and they cash reserves. So we built um, one for the, for the last four years an AI system that basically handles treasury management and, and based on market fluctuations, know how to generate yield to protect against market fluctuation. And we are bringing that technology into digital currency. Um, let's get this slide and come back to it. Um, but one I keen innovation is called the neutral monetary unit. Now, the, across the world, there are several free trade zones. Like we had the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, we had the Euro, um, U European U U Union Free Trade Agreement. Asia, Southeast Asia has its own free trade agreement in the African Union. So we've created a currency for each of these free trade zones. The reason is um, whenever you trade across country, there's FX rates, and there's always money loss in that conversion. Right, so if you have a currency for each free trade zone, um, now you can store a balance for that currency. And you can minimize those FX rates and actually generate interest on that balance. Right now, FX is only a transaction. What if we, what if we can turn FX into a currency that you actually can hold a balance? So if you, what if you actually receive money in the North American coin, for example, you can hold that balance and pay someone else in the future. The real benefit of that with that neutralized monetary unit is it, would, it eliminates FX depreciation. So you know, the U.S. to Mexico, I don't know if you many know, was started around 1994. One dollar gave you how many pesos? Anybody can guess? How much, how much was one dollar to the U.S. peso in 1994? Ten? Five? No, 3.3. .3. One dollar gave you 3.3 .3 pesos. Today, one dollar gives you 21 pesos. Mexico don't like that. We should get out of the drug business and do better. <laughs> but my point is, um, many currencies around the world is being affected by the, the, you know, the advanced economy to the emerging market slide. Even the U.S. Is, in the last year has taken some serious deals with the coronavirus and our treasury printing a vast amount of money. But the point is, our innovation here at the NMU is, um, 
if you, if you buy a currency, whatever the FX rates that you purchase, you will maintain the FX rates for the duration of that transaction. So you, you are not exposed to any volatility um, up or down in, in, in the currency, right? So this is, this is a pretty big innovation, and it's not a security, right? Um, it's actually a product that we can actually sell to, re, you know, to, to small businesses or even to re, retail consumers. Um, now, the, another innovation is called the CDC, the Composite Digital Currency. Now, this is, in the U.S., considered a security um, because it's like a composite index, like a basket of currencies. So we can implement a content currency or a global trade currency, both as a CDC, which we could take the G20, for example, the G7 countries, and put them in one currency. And some people may prefer to hold their money there versus one, one native currency, right? Um, or the NMU, they can get total, total FX exposure, um, minimize any FX risk um, by holding the NMU. I think I already gave you some information about myself. So that pretty much concludes my presentation. Any questions on any of the, any of the um, ideas I presented here today? Give me one. Um, so, step up to the mic. Okay. Um, with this uh, CDMA type multi currency wallets, mm -hmm. um, with debits and credits, so can you start to incorporate like natural assets like emissions trading and different types of? Uh, financial instruments like swaps and other types of things. Yeah, so the, um, the multi-currency wallet can we support various types of um, assets today, but no private assets. So this is only for the banking industry. So the DCMA, we had no interest in private sector tethers and things of that nature. So we only mint coins that's governed by banks. So any assets that's controlled and governed by the banking industry, we're allowed to adopt it. How you, how you doing, sir? Uh, sure. My name is Randy Schwarz. I'm director of the New York Bitcoin Association. How you doing? Good. Um, question is, um, you mentioned all these blockchains that don't scale or whatever. Um, with Bitcoin, with the original protocol, with op returns, we can do all this stuff, this banking stuff that you're talking about. We can trace money. There's, you know, all this stuff that you're talking about, and you're talking about inventing a new currency. Um, backed by, you know, but it's, we already have that with Bitcoin. So with these, with these uh, closed blockchains that you're proposing, that the banks run and these nodes run, why wouldn't you just use Bitcoin that scales, Bitcoin SV? Okay. Well, it's two reasons. One, the banking industry, even though stable coins and other technologies, the, the Feds have already said that banks can adopt those. And some banks will bring those technologies in, maybe through intermediaries. Um, but um, the banking industry wants to be able to sort of manage and govern money. That's what, what the role of the central bank is, right, to manage and govern the monetary system and control the monetary system. So uh, now, even though Bitcoin you may can scale through other technologies, other innovations, what I was suggesting, the ledger itself. People are writing smart contracts to take, I guess, the deficiencies that's in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is really only a cash ledger, but you can, if you can write other software code, on top of it, you can implement anything. That's not true. You can put it right in the blockchain. We put NFTs and all sorts of stuff right in the blockchain. Yeah. Pictures, video, everything. You can do everything. Yeah. But of course, again, you can build a blockchain to solve any sort of any problem, but you're writing unique code for each of these use cases. Um, the ability to have a multi-ledger is out of the box. The banking industry has a ledger that supports all types of transactions. Um, but of course, you can write you can write smart contract code on Ethereum, possibly to, to, to solve any of these problems. But the problem is, each each institution is writing it their own way. Uh, I mean, this is only our proposal and suggestions to have a, a multi-ledger technology that can solve debts, credits, you know, all the different things I listed in the presentation. Not that it can't be solved through other programs, but as you can see on Ethereum, every time someone writes a different smart contract. They typically have security vulnerabilities and other issues and inconsistencies in thought. If you have one ledger, you can monitor and trace that entire ledger versus having everyone writing their own smart contracts to implement that functionality. So, so how do we audit the banks? 
Audit. Yeah, how will we audit, like, to make sure the assets are really there? Oh, yeah, so the blockchain still could be transparent. It's but like, it's, if it's controlled by centralized. Well, it's still whereas, a transparent ledger. So with proof of work, with a real proof of work blockchain, it can't be stopped. You know, even if some miners drop off, more miners can jump on. But all these central bank currencies are all proof of stake, whereas if they all agree to shut down or whatever, they can shut down. And uh, as far as me, I, I can't, I don't want to see the world shut down. So. Okay. I mean, I hear your point of view there, but... Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. That's well, thank all. Thank you. Uh, sorry, guys. We got to move on. We're just getting into our lunch spot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm available if anybody have any other questions afterwards. Thank you so much. This is, this is Mike Wise, Wise with the, the Boston, Boston Blockchain, Blockchain Association. Association. December, December 2nd, 2nd actually. actually, I know we're recording this for January 22nd, 22nd. And, the and the future of money governance, governance and the law. Uh, uh, really, excited really excited for that, that, for that for upcoming that session, session hosted by the by Government the Blockchain, Blockchain Association. Association. We have a distinguished yeah, panel here today. today. We have we Jim Cunha in Boston. Boston. He's the Executive, Executive Vice President of the Boston, Boston Fed and, and a great a champion, champion of, of digital, digital currency, currency, I might add. Uh, we have Suleiman Barada in Beirut, in Beirut, and he is the head of UAB, UAB Digital, Digital and part of, which is part of the Union of Arab, Arab Banks. Banks. And we have Mark and Montoya in DC, the Chief Digital, Digital sorry, Chief, Data Chief Data Officer of the Government Blockchain, Blockchain Association, and a and senior and analyst with a US financial regulator. So, so we want to kind of go through, through some of the some essential, essential elements, elements for the listening, for the listening audience, audience of, of CBDC, CBDC and stablecoins. Stable so, so Jim, what's the, what's role, the role of the central of bank, the central and, bank and, why and why is it important? Is it important? Yeah, so, um, so our primary mission is monetary policy. Like most central banks, that's pretty core to all central banks. Uh, we also supervise banks, uh, which is sometimes within the central bank, sometimes not. Uh, we've got a role with other federal agencies in thinking about financial stability. So what could go wrong on a macro basis that could affect the economy? And unlike other central banks, we actually build and run payment systems, both wholesale and retail. And lastly, we're a fiscal agent to the Treasury. But that means that we get to help control the money supply, the, the currency, and distribute that currency through banks to the public. So those are our, our major roles. And obviously, they're, you know, they're critical to the uh, economy itself, how it runs, how it stays stable. Uh, and then we're also, obviously, the reserve currency of the world, which also comes with uh, international agencies. How are current trends and advances, advances in technology, in technology impacting, impacting or changing the role of central banks. So, Suleiman, let's go with you first on that. So, the, the technological advances that have been accelerating over the last uh, decade uh, uh, really uh, gave birth to what we all refer to today as the, as the digital economy, right? That's, that's the broader uh, dynamics, and that's how we, we try and, and, and refer to it. And the term digital economy really implies that the constituents within these various economies and, uh, and around them are actually, uh, and within a monetary system, are becoming largely dependent on digital means of payment, digital storing of money, digital ways of spending and, and earning uh, additional money. And then, so, so, so that is the changing behavior of the constituents that together is referred to as the uh, digital economy at large. This shift in the, in the market from high concentration of cash to high concentration of digital transactions is, is turning uh, um, a little bit irrelevant or, uh, in the best case scenario, uh, outdated some of the monetary policies of the uh, central bank around the, uh, around the world. Uh, market. And, um, and the impact of, of digital is, is therefore calling for a new uh, set of monetary policies that can accommodate this snowball and, and network effect uh, of the digital economy. And it's not a simple task at all. Uh, you know, if we want to put our, you know, ourselves in the shoes of central bankers, uh, it's not a simple task. And, and in a citizen-centric uh, world, central banks should ensure that the uniform monetary policies 
are not only apt for the short term, but they also would, would, would remain apt for the longer term, and, and that depositors' money and, and interest remain intact and, uh, uh, you know, and, and maintained and, uh, and protected all the way through life. Does that get diluted at any stage throughout this development uh, phase? How would you say, Jim, new technologies are changing the role of central banks? Yeah, so you've been to Boston. Uh, you know our roads are pretty crazy. There's a saying in Boston, don't pay the cow paths, but you get Boston roads. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll leave that in a bit later, but uh, I guess to, to compliment the last, the last set of comments, um, I think it doesn't change our role, it changes how we do our job. So for instance, uh, if we're examining banks, those banks may have new risks, new opportunities because of technology. We have to understand that to make sure that the safety and soundness of those institutions uh, remain, remain sound, which is our, our job. How we do our payment businesses, be more efficient, more effective, and also reach new constituents through new technologies. Um, uh, and monetary policy may have to change in some cases as the instruments change, or, or maybe it's a matter of reinterpreting existing policies to take care of that uh, shift in technologies. But also, you know, basically not just the newest technologies, but technologies over the decades have been flattening the world. So movement of money internationally, uh, the reserve currency of the U.S., they're all affected by the fact that now the world is flat using a very old term, I guess. Yes, yes. Uh, and the uh, technology has interconnected us in new ways. ways. Just think about what the internet did to moving data. Um, there isn't a financial institution in the world that isn't connected through the internet, whereas when it first came out, they wouldn't touch it. So this thing is evolution is always ongoing. It's just really accelerating now. But I'd say it's more about changing how we do our jobs than what our job is. What are some of the various public positions around CBDC announced by central banks. Suleiman, let's start with you. We're having a lot of conversations, uh, Mike, and I just was very, very uh, uh, privileged to, uh, to be invited into, into add to a lot of conversations that are happening all the way from uh, from the uh, from the extreme west, extreme east, and and we, we uh, throughout these conversations, like you know, my my personal observation is that there isn't anyone against CBDC or, or taking a posture that uh, that says no, no, this is not something that we would. Want Want to pursue, want to pursue right? right? So the so spectrum is, 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 you know, uh, is, is on the extreme left. You've got people saying, uh, uh, we, we act, so there is acceptance, but uh, and, and immediate uh, uh, pursuit. Uh, we we want to start it now, and we want to be a pioneer. We want to enable our digital economy, and we want to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, to uh, to allow for growth and, and, and prosperity to happen through all the possible digital means. And and CBDC is is seen. As one, uh, as one good digital mean that may accelerate and add, add agility to, to the monetary system. So that's on the on the extreme uh, left of uh, of the of the spectrum. On the extreme right is is, is also acceptance, but a deferral of uh, of adoption. Right, and that deferral may be to, uh, uh, due to various reasons, uh, which we are trying to address through capacity building activities or the uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, the that slowness in uh, in adoption may also be attributed to uh, to the fact that the central bank is still deciding on the design choices, trying to establish the necessary uh, uh, business case, national business case of the CBDC, so that it delivers the intended. Uh, outcomes. Uh, so that's 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 what I see from a spectrum uh, point of view. Okay, great, um, Jim. I know you're also really uh, focused um, longer term and more broadly on the idea of financial inclusion and the impact that, that this can have on that. Can you just, while we're on this topic, can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I've been beating my head and failing miserably in trying to look at financial inclusion and how the payment systems help in that area. I thought the phone was the answer, and it's helped a bit, but it's not. It's going to be a mobile phone, obviously. But I think if a CBDC uh, was designed well with a public good specifically stated of financial inclusion, 
And if you do that, you may build it differently such that, for instance, it may be cheaper or faster you know, if your goal is financial inclusion. You know, I can think of innovation, and this is always going to be a public-private partnership. I can see innovation by the private sector um, creating ways that those that are financially excluded, unbanked or underbanked, can have better access into financial products at a very you know, reasonable price, uh, if not free. So take an example, a single mother of two may get a paycheck. And it still happens. She goes to check capture, uh, pays a fee. She gets some remittances sent home to her own country, costs a lot of money, buys money orders because her landlord won't take uh, cash or a check. Um, and so, you know, basically all that can be done with CBDC, with innovation by the private sector. So I think there's great opportunity, but I do think it has to be a public good, the currency itself, meaning free, or relatively free, and it has to be a stated public policy goal of financial inclusion. Like I said, if you do that, you may build it differently to help support this particular area. Yep, because if you don't have it as a goal, it's hard to track your results to the goal, right? Yep, absolutely. So we've got to get it out there, so to speak. Okay, so, yeah, go ahead, so much. Second, uh, Jim's uh, comment, uh, you know, there's a, there's a global class on, uh, on inclusion uh, that, that has now, you know, uh, become uh, more, uh, uh, you know, supported yeah, yeah. than ever, and I think uh, you know the business case for inclusion within CBDC is quite evident. It's just it's just a matter of uh, bringing it into the design phase while making design choices by the central bank, so that the outcome of the CBDC, CBDC deployment does deliver on that promise. So, so uh, the advice that we're extending here to central banks within our region is that inclusion has to happen by design and at, and at design stage, and 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 that central banks must make design choices that are inclusive in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the in the designs and therefore in the uh, deploy, deployment afterwards. There's another there's another social economic motivation that we see in this part of the world, uh, which is the uh, the, uh, the cross border inter and, and the interoperability uh, of, uh, of payments and that and, and bringing the uh, the burden of uh, moving moving money from one jurisdiction to another uh, to a to an absolute minimal level. Uh, that too has been Learning, uh, learning, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, people working abroad and, and sending, sending uh, money back home. Uh, so that too is, is a uh, um, uh, is a cause that is that is worth considering while designing a CBDC. And that is that is being uh, addressed in, in, uh, within initiatives that are of a uh, cross border nature and an MCBDC. Uh, 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 conversation. Uh, uh, we see we see a few examples of that already, and and that, uh, that are very promising. Yeah, and, and my going off what Solomon and, and, and Jim was talking about was you know, there needs to be characteristics behind a CBDC. Um, you know, it's universally accessible, accessible like you said, from an inclusion standpoint. Is it interest bearing? Can it be exchanged? Uh, is it tied to actual real world accounts? Uh, can you withdraw from it? Uh, there's a lot of different characteristics on these, these central banks doing projects to look into that. And um, just from a global standpoint, it should be universal across, you know, across all the central banks in order for it to interact uh, you know, interoperability between the networks. Uh, there's a lot of big things, a lot of big decisions that need to be made by, by the central banks. But, you know, they can drive that. They can drive that change in design. One of the things, you know, at the Boston Blockchain Association, we do bi-weekly or sort of bi-monthly meetups on different topics to inform and educate the blockchain community around the world. And one of the comments you made, Jim, on that was the whole idea of regulatory nodes on the chain. And I thought that was really good. Can you just say two, two, you know, a couple sentences about that? Okay, so this would be if there's a private um, exchange or a private blockchain that say, well, let's take Finality. You know, Finality is a wholesale token network that is being built by, I think it's 15 of the largest banks in the world. So they'll have this whole, basically stable coin, and they'll move the stable coin amongst themselves relative to um, when they're buying and selling securities, they need money on the chain, that token is the money on the chain. And so, you know, if I was a supervisor of that scheme, I think it would be good to actually have a node on their network so that I could see the flow of money, uh, I can see the flow of, you know, is, is a particular bank, you know, on the street, they usually know when someone's in trouble before it's obvious to most other people. 
you know, so if you are on the blockchain, might you see something developing uh, through AI and other in, in analysis that gives you a sense of what may be happening to a particular financial institution or to the scheme itself. Uh, so it's really a, a, an advanced view, a real-time view of what's happening within that scheme. And I just call that mostly a regulatory note. All right, so uh, back, to, back to Mark. How might stable coins impact national economic systems? So I'd say the interaction between uh, central bank digital currency and the stable coins and the coin networks working together. Uh, again, that's, that's, that's just uh, my view. Uh, if you look at stable coins now, um, I think it has a market cap uh, as of October 2021, it has a market cap of 100, 100 billion, which is kind of small in the grand scheme of things. But uh, the USDC Tether and the US, uh, US coin, digital coin, uh, has uh, three to five trillion process daily. So that's, that's a lot of money to, to, to look at. at. So, so the, the impact, impact that stable coins are having now, you can, you can see that it's going to continue to grow as we go into the future. But the interaction between the legacy, I call the legacy uh, central bank digital currency, uh, and the stable coins and the coin networks, how those all work together, I think it's going to have a big impact in how we exchange value in the future. Um, as you see now within the, the crypto networks, um, when the market's becoming a, a bull market, you know, they're buying it, the, the market's buying into the, the, the crypto markets, right? As it starts going down into a bear market, Market, they, they, they dump everything into stable coins until the market starts going up again. So you can see how that interaction happens now. As CBDC comes on, on board, I think it'll be interesting to see how that, that value can then move into the, the traditional and legacy environment. Cool. So stable coins can be sort of like a safe harbor, a safety net, if, you know, to, to uh, um, positively impact somebody's um, uh, the impact of um, uh, uh, instability on somebody's um, holdings. Um, uh, Jim, how would you answer that? How will stable coins impact national economic systems? Well, first, I agree with Mark that they, I think they will coexist. I think CBDCs, traditional payment systems, uh, crypto, and stable coins will coexist. I think there's some um, complementary use cases, but some different use cases. Um, I, I think I would get, I take the, the major point being if they became systemically important, then they may have implications beyond just being, you know, a, a type of payment or storage that coexists with others. And so to the extent that um, monies are moved all by private sector solutions, be it stable coins, we call them private sector in particular instance, uh, or um, CBDCs, that creates another dynamic. Uh, that would mean uh, that, that, that mean the, the U.S. dollar, US for instance, and maybe even bank, bank, bank monies, bank liabilities are not being used within the payment system, system or the storage. storage. I mean, that could have a significant yeah, impact yeah, on both on the banking bank environment, environment uh, the central bank, bank, and the central bank's ability to do monetary policy. policy. So, so that's one that's thing one that people think about is if all storage and movement of money was done via crypto and stable coins or other private sector actors per se, you know, that would have an impact on the banking system and the central the bank for all itself. So that's on the extreme. So around the horn real quick, uh, Suleiman talked about the shift from, from cash to digital currency. Obviously, we're going to go through a period of running parallel, running the cash, the fiat, and the digital currency. Um, so, you know, we have outdated monetary policies that don't apply to digital currencies. Uh, we need to come up with a new set of policies. It's not a simple task. Starting with Suleiman, what's one piece of advice if you were, if you knew that a regulator or you know a policymaker was on this meetup, what would you say to them, Suleiman? Quickly, short. So it's, it's really regulatory agility that I'm trying to extend as an advice to each and every regulator that I get to. We, uh, they need to be as agile as everybody else within uh, within the ecosystem. And that means that their, their ways of working uh, uh, do, do not, may not necessarily uh, serve the, the era. So regulatory agility can be achieved by becoming a, you know, by leveraging technologies themselves through, uh, through the super 
back, uh, 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 you know, and, and what it brings to the table for them to, to, be, uh, to act uh, uh, better and, and, and faster to, uh, to the growing needs and demands of the digital economy. So they also need to be relevant as a regulator, not only, not only culture and investment. Amen. How about you, Jim? What would you say? Yeah, so I think part of it's what we're doing today, which is trying to understand the technology, understand what's possible through our joint experimentation, and there's still work. There's also work being done at the Board of Governors under something called Tech Lab, uh, which is doing the same thing, understanding deeply the technology. The other is to work with other regulators, because there's some overlap of responsibilities, we can't be doing it in isolation. And the third, which is also what's uh, going to happen soon, is, you know, talk to people in the public. We have a public consultation coming out of the Board of Governors fairly soon, imminent, I'd say. Uh, and I think it's important that we can't do this in a vacuum. I also quote Chair Powell that says, we can't do this ourselves. We have to do this in conjunction with Congress. You know, we need the support of Congress because this is, this is big, this is significant. Right. Mark, what would you say to a regulator? So, yes. So the regulators need to ask themselves, what does it mean to be a regulator in this day and time? Right. Ask what that means. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? Um, I I know all the central banks and regulators understand their business and their purview very well, but going back to Jim's point, you need to educate yourself on this new type of technology. Educate yourself on what's going on, what's happening. Don't do it in a vacuum. Like Jim said, we need to collaborate and talk. Learn from what, especially learn from the policy that's doing and other central banks that are in this type of uh, technology now and research and they're understanding it. Don't recreate the wheel. Collaborate, work together, and come up with common solutions. Well, great. Well, thanks, you guys. Really appreciate it. That concludes our our big cast for the for the future of money governance and the law. Thanks, everybody. All right, everyone. I just want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, as as you know, this is now our lunch break. Uh, I want to also. Uh, I was in a rush this morning when I took the stage because we were a few minutes behind schedule, but I want to take a moment to recognize, first of all, the NIE for allowing me to be here, our YouTube fans for, for being here, and members of our NIE team, including Joshua Kakian, who's here today, and uh, Sandy Barsky, who, who was a part of the NIE before uh, he, he went to Oracle, but uh, he was actually who connected me with the GBA through Gerard, and uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, so thank you so much for that, and Gerard, if you're here, Thank you for having me today, and I uh, look forward to seeing you all at 2 p.m. as we continue this. All right, thank you.
So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'll just hand it off to you so you can go. Yeah. Well, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, it's always great to be at the National Press Club and uh, to be a guest of the uh, 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 um, Government Blockchain Association. Um, I will say in advance, I would very much appreciate that you do honor the rules of the National Press Club, which is to be masked. It may not be important for you, but it is important for me. Um, thank you. Okay. So, um, I have a very broad topic here, um, and I understand there hasn't been a lot of foundation set with respect to the uh, structure of the approach of laws and regulations, especially in the United States, um, uh, but really worldwide. Um, and um, I decided the best way to start out here, a couple of things we need to sort of establish. And the first is uh, with respect to the securities laws. Um, are they under assault or is crypto under assault? Now, uh, I should probably ask that question. How many of you believe the securities laws are under assault? How many of you believe that it's crypto itself that's under assault? Okay. And I'll, I'd, I'd like to engage, and we'll come back and engage a little bit more in conversation on that point. But bottom line is that we have new technologies um, we've got the issues around uh, creation of new products and new services and the people to whom they're being sold uh, and where they're being sold. You know, no longer is the marketplace just a, a local marketplace, a, a countrywide marketplace. It's global. Push the button with respect to crypto and you're in every country, every jurisdiction in the world instantly. Um, and there are issues around how they're held, who's going to hold them, who's going to manage them. Um, and then we've got the age-old question of disclosures, and we'll come back to that in a bit. But we also, one of the things that this technology is, uh, uh, um, issue, or, um, brought to us is a new way of governance. Um, we're just on the very front end of figuring out how we interact with each other, um, with our other investors, with our other participants, using technology where code is the, the dictating force. And then I, I put on there the last thing. Has anyone heard of the dividend? I don't see a single hand go up. First, first Bitcoin crypto declared dividend of public company. Um, uh, which is yet another uh, new uh, face of, of uh, where we're going. Um, so I, I think what we run into, and I'm going to focus on the U.S. perspective, is that our, our securities laws and the SEC's mandate in particular is investor protection. So what does that mean? Who are we protecting? Um, and then also ensuring the functioning of the markets. Now, clearly, this technology has disrupted many things on many kinds of levels. And we're trying to sort through those right now. Um, I think often, and I'm going to be critical on both sides of, this, of the table, is I think often the crypto space doesn't necessarily fully appreciate the laws and regulations that have been developed over time and what the purposes of those laws and regulations are. Um, I, then I can tell you from the perspective of one, uh, one securities regulator that I know well um, who made the comment, at the end of the day, let's say that it's not a currency, that it's not an insurance product, and it's not anything else, and, and some, something goes wrong. Who is the holder of that crypto asset going to come to? They're going to go to the securities regulators because the way the securities laws in the United States are set up, it's really a catch-all. So if it's not protected anywhere else, our securities laws provide a, 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 a soft landing at the very least. So I, I would like people to understand that from the beginning in, in terms of the comments that I'm uh, going to be making. And I'm not sure this is functioning quite right. Okay, so 
Um, what are we talking about here? And I want to, again, sort of level set because I know there hasn't been a lot of conversation about what we're really talking about here. We're talking about blockchain and cryptocurrencies, but what are really cryptocurrencies? Cryptocurrencies uh, really break down into, uh, really, I, I would say they're crypto assets is the way we're really referring to them these days and the way we need to think about them. And they break down to a number of different categories and God knows that, you know, in the not too distant future, we may be adding some other categories there, but as they flushed out in the last several years, we've got the native currencies. Those currencies, cryptocurrencies that are native to the blockchain uh, on which they are developed or associated with, or whatever, however you want to use the phrase, but Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. Um, then we've got this class of tokens and largely fueled by the, the development of the RC20 token standard uh, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, but tokens have become very much part of the world that we live in. And the tokens were what gave, that, that fueled the fire of the, the initial coin offerings, the ICOs in the 2017 timeframe. Um, but they break down to a, a number of categories, and I've caught a few. The security tokens, you know, at one point, our Securities Exchange Commissioner, or Chairman, uh, SEC Chairman, said uh, that in his mind, there really wasn't a single token out there that wasn't a security. Um, many people like to yell, argue that this is a, what we're dealing with is a utility. Um, uh, that, that, that the token has utility and it shouldn't be looked at as a security. And there's a lot of fine lines we'll break down. But the other is that we've seen the sort of category of payment token that's emerged as well. And when we get into the payment token area, we get into a little bit uh, fuzzier conversation around our money transmitter licensing laws as well. But then we've got this world of stable coins. So my guess is, uh, how many of you are crypto holders in this room of some form or another? Well, I was, I, I was expecting that probably you're getting fairly close to that 100% in audiences like this. Um, how many of you own a, a stable coin? Okay, so many of you do. How many of you have used a stable coin in the past to facilitate your transactions? They're pretty useful, right? They allow you to know what the value of your, your investment is, your, 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 the value of what you're holding today, and to know that if you use it tomorrow, it's going to have that same value. And if you're playing it right, you're gonna sell high off of one uh, cryptocurrency, go into a stable coin, and then wait for adjustments in the market or go find something else at, the, at a nice price point. But stable coins have some real functionality and we're seeing more and more of that build, be built out every day. Instant settlement, global settlements, um, uh, regardless of, of what clock we're on, New York or uh, uh, Singapore or wherever. Um, central bank digital currencies, I know you had a presentation this morning on that subject, but that's another type of maybe not pure crypto asset, it depends on how it's being developed, but certainly a digital asset. And then uh, we start to go into the never, never land of DeFi. Now, what is DeFi? And where do crypto assets fit into that? Well, DeFi makes the use of your crypto assets much more powerful and gives you earning opportunities around it. And then, then we've got the DAOs, which is another overlay on the world that we live in. Uh, and that's a de decentralized autonomous organization, which uh, these are coming together more and more. Um, I'm certain that Gerard's got some idea for Dell in, the, in his mind uh, uh, in connection with the GBA activities. Um, but it's, it's another form of people coming together and pooling resources and being able to find a way to deploy them. And then finally, NFTs. And I will confess that I'm spending a great deal of time in the NFT world today because that's where a great deal of effort is going. Um, and what are NFTs? And I'll just leave it with you right now. Almost everything we've had on that list before that probably can fit into an NFT category in some way or another, but we'll get back to that. But bottom line is when we, in the US in particular, we regulate by function. So when we take that list on the left-hand side and look at all those different kinds of crypto assets, at the end of the day, we're really looking at what the function that crypto asset is. And that function is going to determine the regulatory scheme uh, under which we're going to be uh, operating. So as I've, if, you, if it's a currency, a pure currency, 
up until you know 2017 or so, the only real regulatory scheme we knew was money transmitter regulator regulation uh, at the state level. Um, but then you know, the SEC became more and more involved. The CFTC um, uh, takes care of a number of our issues on there. And I think the real issue today that we're wrestling with is what do you do about the utility token, the, truly, the, truly, uh, the token that's truly used for uh, a purpose uh, to make something work. Okay, so the next question is, I've, I've already said a lot. Why does this matter to us? Well, let me offer this up, is that the, uh, and this is thanks to the Cornerstone uh, research, is the SEC enforcement activity from 2013 to, through 2021, SEC brought a total of 97 cryptocurrency-related litigations and administrative proceedings, 10 delinquent filing orders, 20 suspension orders, and a number of subpoenas and follow-on administrative proceedings. At the end of the, uh, 2021, the SEC had imposed $2.3 billion in total monetary penalties against digital asset market participants. What this doesn't reflect is the fact that they probably put a lot more subpoenas out than, than uh, well, it says 90, 97, or no, it doesn't, it just says a number, uh, than the 97 uh, prosecutions that they had. For example, if you look at the John McAfee uh, indictment, um, there were at least 10 projects there, I think maybe only one of which ever went to an SEC proceeding, but were all recognized to be involved, it involved securities, uh, which is why he was charged, as you can see in the, uh, uh, on the side column with uh, his promotional activities before his uh, untimely death. Um, this doesn't take into account what's happened at the state level because we have mirror laws and regulations at the state level that empower the state securities commissioners, and there, there's one in every state, um, uh, to be able to take action when they see a problem. And they have been very active, and I can't tell you offhand, I should have checked before I came today, what the total cases they've brought, but I would say it's at least double, if not triple, uh, the number that we've seen altogether. Now, does that account for all of the ICOs that happened back in the 2017, early 18 time period before um, things sort of settled down because we had clear enunciation from the SEC that, yeah, we were probably going to act against you? Um, no, and why? Because many of the cases that are out there, many of these ICOs went belly up. The numbers, something like 97, 98, 99% of the ICOs that happened in the, in the uh, 2017, 18 time period, those projects no longer exist. Now think about that for a minute. What does that mean from an investor protection standpoint? What does that mean to the little guy who has no idea when they read a white paper of what they're reading, has no idea what the technological innovation means? I think that's what we really need to be thinking about. And I know this is gonna be highly critical and I know that there are people all over the world that are listening right now, but, but I think we lose sight of the fact that we do have laws and regulations in place to provide a baseline of protection. It may not, the administration may not be perfect. And I, I use small a administration uh, in this case. But it is, th these laws are there for a purpose. And as the regulators will say, we've got to do something at some point because they're going to come complaining to us anyway. Now, do we leave it then to the plaintiff's bar? to leave it to the private sector to bring the actions. We saw a lot of that in the early days, but not as much activity now because the dollars are just not there for them to pursue. So what do we use as a watchdog? So it's great to talk theoretically about opening the markets up worldwide and letting the small investor come in, but what's gonna happen to that small investor's money? Yes, what is it, you know, one in 10, one in 20, one in 30, 100 projects actually go somewhere? So I'll leave you with that thought for right now. Um, okay, so what are we dealing with? Why, why is this a security? Uh, I don't know, how, I, I'm guessing that many of you have already heard the word, or word the phrase Howey test. This was uh, the outcome of a, a, a Supreme Court decision that's now, I don't know, six, 70, 80 years old, I guess 60, 70, whatever. Um, 
But uh, it was an enunciation around investments in an orange grove. And I'm not going to go into all the details. But there were four. The, the issue is whether the people were buying an investment contract. And the Supreme Court set out uh, four factors as, as uh, key points. Is there an investment of money? Is it a common enterprise? Is there an expectation of profit? And is it uh, relying solely upon the efforts of others? Um, I'm not going to go into great detail on this because we could go down a lot of rabbit holes real fast on it, but I will draw your attention to a document that the SEC put out in 2019, which um, really went into each one of these elements, and when you're looking at a project or you're thinking about putting together a project or you're looking at somebody else's project, um, that for each one of these factors, they give you a lot of things to think about. You know, one of them is, you know, is the project itself taking efforts to get itself listed on an exchange to create a secondary market? Is that something that would be typical for, for uh, a project that's not intended for investment purposes? So I, again, I, I, we, could, we can talk at great length about that, but let's move on because we've got a lot of other things to talk about. So how do we, how do we get here? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'd like to go back the other way. There we go. So, uh, you know, in the beginning we had Bitcoin. Um, that was a native currency. Um, it was followed by, well, we had our first ICO initial coin offering. And as I've always said, if you're gonna, if you want to call attention to yourself, use something that sounds like something else. So what does ICO sound like? It sounds like an IPO. And how do we regulate IPOs? We regulate them through the securities laws. But in any case, the first one, believe it or not, was in 2013 followed shortly thereafter with the, um, uh, with the Ethereum launch. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And then things really um, exploded in 2017. There's a great graph put together by uh, a company that uh, shows uh, the funding going into ICOs, and I should have included it because it's, it's incredibly uh, telling, uh, that it starts with a very small little dot. And over the months of 2017, that little dot becomes huge and then starts to break out into all sorts of geographies around the world. So we had a couple of things going on. And it was, this is a bad word to use in this day and age, but it was a truly viral thing that was happening. And it was happening globally. Um, uh, and what, was, what were we seeing more and more? The original plans like Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum to a certain extent, and you know, a number of the blockchains, you know, they were creating something and creating something of value, but they realized early on, hey, we can make some money in the process if we're mining them first and we get to market first with them. Um, and, and so that sort of then morphed into anybody who had any kind of project that had any kind of technology associated with it, or even if it didn't, they decided they would come up with a token. And suddenly we had this absolute explosion of token offerings. And what were they being used for, for the most part, to raise funds um, uh, for the ongoing development of the projects? Uh, the investors, when they bought them, and yes, they were investors, were buying them with the expectation that they would go up in price. Now, someone who would walk, and then back in those days, I wasn't a client, a prospective client that didn't walk into my office, yes, we were still in person at that point, and say, um, I have, I'm going to do a token offering, but mine's a utility token. It's not a security. Well, as I said, the SEC chairman uh, subsequently had a very telling comment along those lines, and that was usually the response that I gave the clients to. Mm, looks like a security. Um, the other aspects, I said, these are traded on exchanges. So um, that's, that's sort of how we got to where we are. But interestingly enough, in 2000, and I believe it was 18, and this is, shows you how much your, your mind uh, there we go. Uh, have, have any of you seen this website before? Ah, oh wow, it's a virgin crowd here. Um, uh, in, I believe it was the, um, it was either May of 2018 or May of 2019, I think it was May of 2019, uh, at the big dance in the crypto space, the consensus conference in New York City, midday, this gets, this suddenly becomes the, the hot topic on everybody's phone. This, this was released, the Howie coin. Well, guess who released, released the Howie coin? This was done by the SEC, the United States Securities Exchange Commission. Build a website. 
and it built a website um, to launch an ICO. And the intent of the website was basically to show people, help people understand what they were looking at and understand what was real and what wasn't real. I think our battery needs to be changed here. Um, but the, it had all the elements. If you were watching, looking at ICOs back in that day, it had all the elements of how, they, how these things became a real industry, a real industry on how to market and sell and drive acceptance of an ICO, how to get them listed on a, get the token listed on an exchange and so on. Well, so the SEC really did this as sort of not a, it was a training tool or a, a education tool well, wouldn't you know it? There were ICO projects <laughs> that went and downloaded the SEC Howie coin and used it as a model for their own projects. Um, and I have to say that this slide in particular caught me a little bit off guard because mm, 20 minutes before um, the SEC release hit my phone, um, I had met with a woman who looked just like the second woman in the, in the slide there with the purple, purple or... Uh, um, Yes, whatever color her hair is. Um, and I was like, whoa, were they, <laughs> what did they know uh, at the time? Um, but in any case, so this is just showing these, these became very formulaic. Uh, you had to understand, but most people couldn't get to the bottom of what was there because the real sauce of what it was wasn't uh, happening. But ICOs ended up getting such a bad name, so what do you do? So you just change the name, right? Rebrand. I'm not allowed to mention company names, but we know how some companies have changed their names uh, uh, in the wake of, of, uh, of, uh, conf of uh, controversy. So what do we have? We've got the security token offering. We got the exchange, initial exchange offering. So we had the STO, we have the IEO, and that's sort of where we are today. And these deals are happening. If they're happening in the United States, the way they happen in the United States is that they're sold to accredited investors. So we're doing it within the context of the, the laws, under an exemption under Reg D. I don't think there's anyone who's yet fully come forward to um, register a public offering, and I may, I probably, for those of you who are listening online, I look forward to you uh, uh, showing me the ways of my error on this comment. Um, but in any case, uh, in the United States, there are two primary ways that companies can go forward. One is with a Reg D for accredited investor only option, and the other is a Reg S where it's sold outside the United States, not to US residents. Otherwise, if it's to be sold to retail investors, non-accredited investors in the United States, we still have the registration process that applies to publicly issued uh, uh, offerings. And what we have seen over time is we've seen exchanges around the world, uh, platforms around the world, who have offered these tokens to, um, to people. Now, what have they had to do? They have to make adjustments. So in the US, we see a, a set of markets that have, have evolved, uh, the ATSs as we call them, which uh, will facilitate trading of these kinds of tokens amongst the credit investors. And then we have some of, the, some of the biggest exchanges in the world, as you can see from this list, who will list these tokens for buying and selling, but for people located outside the United States. Raise is a really interesting compliance issue, because how do you ring fence and make sure that US residents aren't participating in it? And so we've seen a lot of development of so-called KYC tools, know your customer, uh, that would help sort through these geospatial uh, uh, issues. So I, I won't leave this discussion without a mention of the Ripple case, uh, which I won't ask for a show of hands on how many people have heard about Ripple. But what I can say is this is the Ripple is one of the oldest existing, ex, existing cryptocurrencies uh, in the US. A lot of people are not aware of the fact that Ripple was the subject of a government action back in 2015 where it signed an unusual kind of an agreement in the wake of a federal investigation on money laundering and other charges, it signed a settlement agreement. Wasn't a, a prosecutorial agreement, uh, a deferred prosecution agreement or a plea agreement, but it was 
just a settlement agreement. But if you read it, it read very much like a deferred prosecution or even a plea agreement might read in that there were a number of commitments and another number of acknowledgments of things that had happened. But it was prosecuted at the time, this case was brought in the context of the, um, of the money transmitter uh, rules and uh, the FinCEN rules regulating money service businesses. Never really a discussion of securities. And it's important to note that in the agreement, there was a provision, like often you'll see in these agreements, that said doesn't preclude any other agency, any other governmental entity bringing action. So there's a lot of discussion for a long time between Ripple and the SEC on whether Ripple itself, XRP, was a security. And, or is a security, I, that's, a, that's actually an important term. Is it a security? The SEC back in 2018 through uh, one, of, one of its top staffers made the declaration, and this is hotly contested in the, in the uh, Ripple case, but made the, um, made the comment that Bitcoin is not a security. And also said that Ether, as it existed, and this is 2018 timeframe, is not a security. But it, it was as, as of that date and time. Never made, a, made, never cleared Ether when it was originally uh, launched, when the Ethereum blockchain was launched, did not clear Ether as being a security then. So what's been the issue here, and I'll keep it quite simple, because it's actually over a 100-page uh, complaint that the SEC filed uh, in the federal courts. And what was, um, what's really at issue here is the way, the, uh, well, the way uh, Ripple was created, or the XRP, the, the, the token, and the way it was held in the corporate treasury, and the way it was used over time was the way a company uses a security. It was used for compensation. It was used for doing deals, for whatever it might be. And, um, and the SEC complaint uh, very well researched, um, well documented. Uh, as I said, it's over 100 pages long. It's a fascinating read if you ever want to have an idea of how the SEC builds a case as to whether something is a security. Um, but this case has now been in the federal courts for over a year. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth. We have communities that are, uh, uh, well, we have the Bitcoin maximalists, and I imagine there are a few of you here in this room, but um, they're also Ripple maximalists. Um, but this is still out there, and to be honest with you, I think as this case goes, I think the SEC is sitting on a number of other cases um, that have the same kind of issue underlying it, and we're probably the potential plaintiffs in the, or, or uh, defendants in those cases um, uh, are, have signed statute of limitations waivers because, guess what, if you count, 2017 when a lot of these ICOs happened, it's 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22. Whoa, that's five years. Statute of limitations is about to run on a bunch of these. So the question is, you know, how, many, how big is their, their file of, 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 of uh, statute of limitation waivers that they have sitting there, all sort of timed off of what's going to happen with this case? Um, so it's. It's an important case. It's going to be a watershed. It may or may not go to the Supreme Court, uh, but it's certainly worth watching. Um, so I said I would mention DAOs real quickly. Uh, you know, DAOs are, you know, if you're looking at what the big issues are going to be in 2022, uh, clearly DeFi, uh, I, DeFi's and NFTs, I think, probably uh, are vying for the top space. But DAOs are just bursting out all over. Um, the first statement of the SEC with respect to tokens in 2017, which what started to cool the ICO market off, was actually in the context of an ICO, or I'm sorry, of a DAO. Uh, and that's what I have here, is this is the 2017 case. Fast forward to earlier this year. There we go. <laughs> That time it went too quickly. Um, uh, there, we saw another case brought. And the bottom line is, remember I said at the beginning, function is how we regulate. It's really looking at what's going on inside of that DAO and looking at what that token that's associated with the DAO is doing uh, that will tell us what set of laws and regulations that we have to deal with. 
And you know, we go back to that, if it walks like a dog, or walks like a duck, talks like a duck, quacks like, whatever, quacks, quacks like a duck, uh, that's probably a duck. Um, I, I know it's not an answer that a lot of people want to hear, but it's something, it's, a, it's an analysis that they need to go through. And on that note, I don't know, did any of you invest in the Constitution Dow? Wanted to become a part owner of that uh, or part owner in the entity, or I guess I'm not even sure we can say it was the entity that owned uh, the Dow that would own, I guess, the last standing um, uh, uh, in, public, in the private arena uh, a copy of the Constitution. Well, you know, this was an interesting case because I think they raised uh, 40 plus million dollars to do it. Um, the first reports, it was an auction. Uh, that was conducted very publicly. Uh, first reports went out that said that they had won. And it was sort of like uh, um, uh, the Dewey Beats uh, Truman headlines because 15 minutes later, it came out that the Dow didn't win. And I think it was the founder of, of the Citadel Hedge Fund that did. Uh, but it shows you, you had people come together in basically the course of the weekend to raise 43 million, 40, 43, 44 million dollars, whatever it was. Some interesting issues on the backside. When they didn't win, what did they do with the money that they raised? Well, they decided to give it back. But they had so many small uh, participants in it that by the time they paid the gas fees to return the cryptocurrency that had been sent to them for the purchase price, um, it ate up a lot of the uh, contribution made by, by I don't know, something like 2,000 or so people. So again, just I'm flagging these things because these are the issues we're going to be wrestling with in the coming days. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of other things for you because the you know, securities laws, we often think of the securities and the SEC and the CFTC together because in a lot of jurisdictions around the world, the issues that each one of them dealt, uh, individually deals with are usually ha are often handled in a, a single uh, uh, government entity. Um, but we've seen the, over the years, the CFTC has come forward with some pronouncements on different points. But most recently, they started ta tackling the issue of the, the exchanges and whether the exchanges are dealing with uh, types of, of instruments that are within the CFTC's uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so I think the, uh, in last, last August, uh, they took action against BitMEX. And as part of an action that involved the FinCEN, there was a $100 million settlement and an acknowledgement that the CFTC rules do apply and that the entity should have been registered as a future commission merchant. And I'll just give you a little footnote on that, and this is probably more minutia than you would like, but it's, it's a really important piece that I don't think enough attention has been given to, is by moving uh, BitMEX and the next one, which is Kraken, which settled not too long thereafter at a much lower price, uh, point, um, that by moving them into that category and away from, remember I said money service businesses, the way we regulate currency, cryptocurrency exchanges or had historically, is where you've got a change in the AML compliance regime that applies. And what that means is it's a change in the KYC, know your customer standard, and the amount of information that's collected so as these companies were, those end up qualifying in a piece of that, that world, um, if they haven't been collecting full KYC like your bank does from day one, no matter what the size of your transaction is, they're actually in violation of that law and they're in violation from the day that they start that business. So this is really you know, a sort of a game changer you know, we've seen the exchanges up their game significantly on, on uh, the amount of customer information they're collecting, but this is, this is definitely a change. And I should note that the way we have our laws, remember I said we're all functional here, the way we administer our Bank Secrecy Act, our anti-money laundering compliance regime, it's done in a functional kind of a way. So the CFTC is the one responsible for this piece of the world, the SEC for the broker dealers and the bank regulators for the banks. And then if you're not there, then we've got a combination of, of some other folks. Um, so let's go to decentralized exchanges. And I wanna be mindful of the time here. We're coming up against the uh, wall here. But decentralized exchanges, 
Um, I was actually, right before I came here today, I was on, in a meeting. Uh, I had uh, a couple representatives of the U.S. Treasury Department speaking. Uh, and they said that mm, a lot more, they, they used to get a lot of questions on peer-to-peer -peer transactions and, and uh, stable coins, and now their questions are coming with respect to uh, DEXs, as we call them. So what are these exchanges? Has anyone traded on one of the, these exchanges? Okay, it's pretty easy, isn't it, to do so? And you're not really sort of dealing with an intermediary there. So it really becomes sort of a peer-to-peer -peer type transaction that you're engaging in. Um, you can just start to think that when you take, decentralized is just what it is. You're taking the there, there out of the equation. And from a regulatory perspective, who is going to be responsible for enforcing the laws then? I'm sorry, I didn't. Did someone have a comment to make? Okay, well, uh, I, and I put that out there because I, we're, we're at the beginning stages of these issues being worked out. Now, having said that, uh, the SEC has been pretty clear, I think, through the current chairman, and I think maybe even the past chairman, is that they don't really believe that there's really you know, much real decentralized activity happening. There's, there's still a there there. There's an entity that is putting, writing the code, is putting up the website, is you know, making money off of the transactions that are happening. So again, this is, this, is the, this is one of the biggest challenges, you know, is facing uh, securities regulations and facing uh, anti-money laundering compliance. Um, so um, I have, I'll let you sort of uh, delve into these slides, but as we move forward in the world of DeFi, so now we've got decentralized exchanges which are happy, ha helping take us into this world of DeFi. So what is DeFi? It's decentralized finance. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're seeing it in the lending world. You know, you can do a DeFi loan, and it can be structured in a multiple different kinds of ways, but the bottom line is you can become a direct lender or you can participate in a pool that's a direct lender. And no longer are you just depositing your money in a bank and then the bank's turning around and being the lender. You're actually playing a more, much more active role and you're seeing more of the, of the return from it. But De DeFi doesn't stop there. DeFi can go into the insurance world. DeFi uh, is definitely into the world of helping people earn more on their investments, on their crypto portfolio. Um, some of the APYs are quite astounding that you can get in terms of what you, the yields that you can earn by going to DeFi and earning other kinds of tokens. I saw one a couple weeks ago, 400 thousand percent APY. Um, I think that one did crash a little bit uh, after that. But, you know, there's a whole process that these, you know, we're bringing different pieces of the technology together and melding them in different kinds of ways that are allowing all of us to become much more active participants in the allocation of resources. And with that comes the kind of challenges that, um, uh, that you know, face the regulators because, as I said, that I just go back to that state securities regulator commissioner, and he said, you know, when the music stops, they're going to come complaining to me, and I'm going to have to do, I'm going to be held responsible. So, do they get ahead of it? Do they let the technology continue to develop and they do the cleanup on the backside? You know, you have to think about that from your own personal perspective. You know, where do you want them? It's great to say we don't want the government in our business, but. Can, can everyone protect themselves equally? Uh, and these, again, <laughs> it's fascinating. I was, I was doing an AML compliance panel uh, back a couple months ago, and someone said, how do you possibly keep up with all the changes in the technology? And I said, you either are a Gen Zer or you have to hire a Gen Zer. So I thank the Gen Zer on my team who uh, was able to put together, uh, pull some of these slides that are, are very interesting and things that you can look at in more detail. They're much too small for us to go, but they give you an idea of what's going on. So I want to close out with the non-fungible tokens. Um, there are 
bursting out in all areas. Some of the biggest plays we've seen are primarily in the area of collectibles and art, whether it's visual or it's performing arts or combined. And there's some incredibly exciting things, and this technology couldn't have come along at a better time because you had a lot of artists that were st st literally starving. You know, having been out of work, out of galleries, out of concert halls or venues um, for, you know, a year or so. And then early last year, I don't know how many of you have been in Clubhouse. I got myself into Clubhouse. And it was quite of an experience. But to listen to the stories of these artists um, that, you know, they hadn't had access to be able to sell either their, 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 their visual art or their performing art. Uh, and you start talking and they, you know, you realize what the intermediaries take from them in their process and how much of an actual transaction they end up seeing. And suddenly you've got technology that can deal with those questions. And that's what's so exciting about non-fungible tokens. Clearly the NFTs burst out with top shots uh, using it in the sports arena. We're seeing it in the games, virtual gaming. Uh, <laughs> 2022 is definitely going to be the year or the beginning year of the metaverse. Maybe not the beginning year, but definitely the year of the metaverse. Uh, and we're seeing all sorts of applications there. It's incredibly exciting technology, but at the same time, <laughs> we've got creative people. And they're learning how to use the NFTs in much the same way that they've used tokens otherwise for creating, creating or raising value. And so we see people selling NFTs that are fractionalized. We see them, um, uh, well, <laughs> there's fractional art, break down the art, but we're, we're, we're break down the real estate, break down whatever the asset is and sell it to a lot of people. Well, what is that that you have? You probably have a security. You know, you, you have to be very careful if it's not a, a security. Um, uh, it, it, just one, one situation, oh, this is, yeah, there's a, now you can, the NFTs in golf. You can buy part of a golf course, buy your right to get into other golf courses around the world and uh, lots of other experience. It's, a lot of it's about creating community. But with this, we're introducing a no, other, another realm of challenges. Um, I think the best thing that I can say is, while this is incredibly exciting, one has to have knowledgeable legal advice near them, and they, you have to not be afraid to take that, that advice. And on the other hand, don't just shop for the advice bec uh, and get the one that'll tell you what you wanna hear because that's a lot of what happened in 2017. And that's why a lot of people ended up spending a lot of money uh, with respect to the uh, uh, dealing with the SEC on the backside. So I'm gonna leave you with this, um, first of all, Crypto Twitter exists. Crypto Twitter is a real thing. Crypto Twitter is where you do find out what's going on, and it is minute by minute. And if you're off Crypto Twitter for a day or for a weekend, definitely, you've lost a year. Um, I probably spent more time in Crypto Twitter than I should, but this one, there's one situation that hit my radar screen um, a couple weeks ago. And it says vested uh, tokens locked with uh, tradable NFTs are going to be hot, hot. I guess I thought it was hot, hot, hot. But um, bottom line is it's sort of an exploding NFT. They take an NFT, the technology, you know, this, this non-fungible token, and embed inside that NFT in the smart contract another token that's an ERC-20 that then when you're ready, basically explodes and you can issue as much of that, those tokens as you want to off the ERC-20. Now tell me, is that a security? Is that a derivative? Is that a future? Or, because of the world I live in, I look at that, are you now a money, money, money uh, transmitter, a uh, issuance, issuer of, of digital currency? Um, I did, and what you can't see here on my, the tweet, uh, or the other, well, I've just advanced to, yeah, the, the tweet, the slide right before that, um, uh, I did tweet it out. I was trying to find a nice, graceful way to, you know, raise some questions on this issue, and I decided the best way to do it is securities law professors. Here's a final exam question for you to get for your students. And this particular tweet was like a series of six steps, perfect for a law school exam question. But that's where we are, that's where we're looking and we're dealing. And if we can go ahead to the next two slides, 
Uh, so this one, I just wanted to say, this, we're in real time. As I said, crypto Twitter is real. Um, uh, there are things that came out today um, from the SEC. Uh, people are reacting immediately on it. You do need to have an appropriate filter and learn the right people to, to, to follow on it. Uh, but it's a great way to, to enhance your learning process in this area. So we've covered a lot of things. I appreciate your time and your attention, and good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. All right, well now what we've been waiting for all day, we have our annual achievement awards coming up. And coming to the stage, we have our uh, master ceremonies for the uh, achievement awards, and that is Mr. Robert Levin. Robert? bringing up slides. There, now, could you bring up the slides, Jordan, for the presentation? Thanks. And we'll show this one in a minute. Join me in applause for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. So it's my honor and pleasure to now introduce the 2022 Government Blockchain Achievement Awards. So we have four sets of uh, finalists who were selected by three judges. And I'm going to show you the names of the judges. I'm the Master of Ceremonies, Robert Levin of Emerging Star Digital. I'm starting a fund which is launching uh, next month to invest in uh, decentralized tokens uh, on various exchanges as well as simple agreements for future tokens, which are pre-listed tokens, as well as yield farming and pre-IPO equity in the DeFi space. Um, so the awards are starting with the Social Impact Award, which has been sponsored by Brian Talebi. So uh, the award is called the the Brian Talebi Leadership Award. But first, I'm going to introduce our judges, Amelia Gardner, Bobby Muscara, and Frank Ricotta. Please join me in an applause for these three judges. <laughs> all, all three won the prior awards for leadership, innovation, and uh, also for uh, uh, social impact. So we now are going to start with the Social Impact Award, and I will be introducing uh, the uh, person who will be uh, discussing that award. So uh, could I now invite our friend, Tricia Chan, to the podium, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of Ahura AI to introduce the Social Impact Award named after Brian Talebi. Uh, Tricia uh, is an ed tech leader who has developed a powerful artificial intelligence uh, platform under Ahura AI, founded by Brian Talebi, uh, who's architected it and his, his vision and execution. The purpose of Ahura AI is to increase the speed, accuracy, and retention in learning to fundamentally help companies be more competitive and to lift humanity. Trisha is a brand and business leader and builder. By working with CEOs and leaders at Apple Computer, Hewlett Packard, Stanford Research Institute, uh, Tricia has been able to firsthand experience how technology has the ability to impact society for good. And uh, she's run other companies, including uh, a company where she's a board member, uh, not for profit studying human waste impact on land, addressing critical problems in mountaineering regions. She's also co founded 
another company called Wasted, an above ground sustainable sanitation development venture, reimagining uh, ways of dealing with sustainable uh, waste and harnessing the potential of what we leave behind. So I'd like to now uh, honor Tricia, who will be introducing the Social Impact Award named after Brian Talebi. Thank you. I'm going to wing this because I don't have slides. So I all do like hand puppets. and um, I love how Robert elegantly danced around talking about human one and two. Um, that's another conversation. If anyone wants to talk about the science of one and two, I'm happy to. Um, my name is Tricia Chan. I'm the CMO of Ahura AI. I'm really pleased um, to be here on behalf of Brian Telebi, who is an incredible human being. If any of you previously have had the benefit and privilege of spending time with him. You know he's a force of nature. Um, this is gonna be a different kind of presentation, um, mainly a story, more than anything, um, about Brian and his origins that led him to found her AI and what our mission critical work is within the company. Um, Brian was born in a home without water, running water and electricity in eastern in an eastern desert in Iran. Um, it really shaped him and formed him as a human being as he became a Turkish refugee. He came to the United States um, at the age of six. Uh, at the age of eight or nine, I might, I'm probably inaccurate. Eight or nine, he self-taught um, himself quantum physics and differential equations. Uh, he matriculated to being the youngest engineer ever hired by NASA at the age of 16 to work on a bunch of lenses um, for the Goddard Space Center. He really firmly believes in access to knowledge and learning and believes that everyone learns in a different way, which I think many of you probably would agree with that. Some of us digitally read, some of us read books. We like that oil on a newspaper on our fingers. Um, we apply what we learn. So he really wanted to create a powerful technology platform that really empowered and enabled any human being to personally learn retrofitted to their predisposition. So Ahura was born. Um, so we're an ed tech and AI. We it's the idea of taking a rather archaic, no offense to anyone that's in an institution that exists, um, model, and we ushered into the modern era with digital technologies to address the fact that each and every one of us learn at a different pace and way. That's really the holy grail. Um, we speak to lots of different people, and one person in particular who's really inspiring is a woman named Lorraine Stomsky. She's the chief learning officer, part of the leadership team at Walmart. And we talk a lot about how do you deliver education one-to-one, um, -one, as opposed to one-to-many, or a law of average, which is not dissimilar from other models in different sectors, i.e. pharma and healthcare. Um, we know the forecast based on McKenzie's recent study that about 400 to 800 million jobs are gonna be lost by 2030. That's within the decade, it's eight years from now, which is really daunting. We like thinking of it more positively because the number doesn't reflect the jobs that are actually gonna be created. So what do you do with that? Um, most of you probably have read across the transform, workforce transformation, what's happening in that space, upskilling is a buzzword that's been used for way too long. We need to reinvent a new word for that. Um, but it's this idea of skills-based learning, which isn't necessarily tied to a four-year ed four education at a, at a college institution. Um, so Ahura basically takes that idea. We work with existing learning modules, learning management systems, and we increase the speed, accuracy, and retention using AI and AI models to adapt over time to create personalized learning for that person. Um, we work with small, medium, and large companies to um, help create economic opportunity for every, you know, person within their human capital. Um, so how does this relate to blockchain specifically? Um, 
we recently had in early December the privilege of gathering together world leaders in AI, um, neuroscientists and blockchain people, um, neuroscientists, uh, entrepreneurs in the consumer space and the pharma space, people that are basically using AI to talk about AI for humanity and impact because of the existential risk potentially that AI presents. Um, we were fortunate because Brian has a really good friendship with Sir Richard Branson, so we did it on Necker Island, and we broke ground in an organization called Digital Guardians, which is essentially the innovation technology-based successor to the elders, if you're familiar with that organization. Um, with the idea of creating a consortium to ask the greater good and people in the machine learning AI space to really think about the responsibility that they hold as it relates to technology that's gonna to touch every human being on the face of the earth, um, and how do we uplift them, but also how does regulation play into that? What are the questions around data, which dovetails with the whole reason why you're all here, um, not necessarily governance, law, and money, um, but the use of data, and um, the blockchain can really help uh, protect people's data, and what we do as a company, um, we provide users with the opportunity to sell their data if they want. They have basically sovereignty over that data, and they can do what they want with it. If they want to keep it private, they keep it private. If they want to sell it, they have the ability to sell it. Um, we've made legally binding commitments by choice about three years ago. Uh, providing learners and users with the power to provide that access to their data by choice. And we know that the blockchain can help us do this. We're deep in technology development now and piloting it. Um, but we know that we will probably come to you all and ask for advice and guidance around what the best strategy and approach is for something like that, because it's a pretty broad scale. Um, I think... That that's it. Have I gone over my time? <laughs> now make the announcement. Sure. So, for the uh, Brian Talebi Social Impact, Brian Talebi Social Impact Award for 2022, and the winner is Kathleen Alcorn, Deputy Mayor for the City of Springfield, Illinois. Please join us on the stage, Kathleen. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. I have a presentation. I don't know if it's up or running, but um, I can wing it without it. So this award um, is based on a piece of legislation I wrote, which is a mental health task force, which would, um, it was a huge task force involving all stakeholders to discuss mandated mental health care for all students K through 12. And the purpose of this was to be responsible stewards of emerging technology. So our world and what we're trying to do is all well intended, but there's so many unintended consequences to the work we're doing that we can't fully predict. So with this initiative, we're teaching children emotional intelligence by learning how to utilize the language. So everything we do has a very specific language. If we teach the language of thought process and emotions, emotional intelligence, we empower our future leaders. Um, I ran into a lot of pushback because the task force was huge. The reason for that is if you don't involve all the stakeholders, you set up an initiative to fail. So you can either do something that's highly cumbersome for nine straight months. So my initiative had very specific timelines and data points. If you don't involve all the stakeholders, you then fight all the people you didn't involve in the process for 10 years. That's my prediction. Oh, thank you so much, Kathy. And I do wanna thank GBA, the judges, Kathy and Gerard, of course, and the GBA family. You guys are amazing to be here. 
Um, part of the language with legislation is knowing how to talk to legislators. So, for example, I, saw, I picked up seven sponsors in a hotly partisan bill by describing blockchain in two and a half minutes. I'm able to do that because I develop trust and relationships with all the leaderships. Um, when you come in with a piece of legislation, this is another language in that world. You thank the people that set up the meeting, you know the staffers by name, and then you ask, you make your ask directly and you have to be very specific. You need to make that ask in two minutes or two sentences, and then you explain why. You give your argument. If you don't give the ask first, all of the subject matter that you're presenting gets lost in the translation when you leave the point to the end. So that's really it for the sake of time. I'm gonna wrap that up, but thank you all so much. And I, it's a huge honor to be here. So thank you. And thank you, Brian Talebi. I have to add one more thing. Brian Talebi is one of the most inspiring people. And anytime I feel like I'm in a roadblock, I watch his speech that he gave to Davos. And if you haven't seen that yet, I highly recommend it. So thank you all so much. Again, please join me in a round of applause for Kathleen Alcorn, Deputy Mayor of the City of Springfield, Illinois. Thank you so much, Kathleen. So and now we're going to present the Annual Achievement Award for Leadership. And to help us do that is Amelia Powers Gardner, who won an award in 2020 from the Government Blockchain Association. She's the county commissioner of Utah County and put marriage licenses on the blockchain for the first time to our knowledge in human history and has had many followers since then and as a result has become CEO of InnoGov, which is a, a platform to help governments around the world starting in, in the US uh, put basic and essential services on the blockchain. And she'll explain a little bit about that and then make the introduction for the leadership award and we'll be showing the names of the finalists in a moment, and she'll announce the finalist, and then the envelope. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you so much. Thank you. So as he said, I was the 2020 Government Blockchain Association Leader Award awardee, and um, since then have become a county commissioner for Utah County, and I lead InnoGov. We are a technology company that leverages disruptive technologies like blockchain to help innovation come to government processes. Thank you. So I wanna talk a little bit about being a leader in the blockchain space. Being a leader in uncharted territories is not for the faint of heart. When I won the Leadership Award in 2020, I told stories of my ancestors, starting with William Brewster, who was on the Mayflower, going through Jonathan Starr, who fought in the American Revolution, finally to my ancestors who walked on foot from Nauvoo, Illinois, over the Rocky Mountains to settle the state of Utah. And I want you to know that any blockchain pioneer in this time and date is, is really a leader amongst leaders. The next giant revolution in our society will be not just decentralization, but, distri but distributed power through blockchain technology. And it is my true honor and privilege to get to announce to you the 2022 GBA Leader Award. So our finalists are Bill Rockwood, Executive Director of the Future Forum and staffer for U.S. House of Representatives, Pradeep and Frank, and well, you can see up there, the winner is already announced, I guess. So I guess I need the envelope, but. So spoiler alert, Bill won. Why doesn't Bill come up and I'll introduce him? So as Bill walks up here, I'm gonna introduce him, Bill Rockwood. Thank you. Yeah, 
Yes, Bill is the executive director of the Future Forum. He's the de deputy legislative director and advisor for Congressman Darren Soto from Florida's 9th Congressional District. And he is a policy advisor for the co-chair of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, who is Darren Soto. As a congressional staffer, Bill originated and drafted a variety of bills, amendments, and appropriations requests with a particular focus on issues related to technology, finance, and the environment. Bill also serves as the principal policy advisor for the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. Having drafted over 15 pieces of introduced legislation, the first two bills related to blockchain and digital assets to pass the House of Representatives were bills isn't that fantastic? I know. Um, and he's had over 30 legislative re language requests passed in the fiscal years 2019 through 2021. So he truly is a leader in blockchain in government. Um, he also chairs the blockchain project team within the security group of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center, who recently made its first publication. He's a graduate of Rollins College with an undergraduate in philosophy the Crummer School of Business with an MBA, and the Georgetown University Law Center with both a JD and a Master's of Law in Securities and Financial Regulations. It is my honor and privilege to have Bill join me as a leader in the blockchain space. I couldn't, we couldn't be more honored. And now, your address. Thank you, Bill. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, <laughs> this is incredibly humbling. Sorry. <laughs> All right, we'll start again there. Um, but people get involved in public service um, with the idea of making a difference. And um, uh, I believe that along the way, but today kind of marks a great point to look back and appreciate the journey. Um, first, a few thank yous. Um, first to the GBA, who um, always, always, always over deliver in events like this and connecting government leaders. They're leading the way um, and just encourage them to continue to do great things. Um, <laughs> to my mom and dad, who, um, you know, my mom kind of gave me the permission to, to dream and the resilience to uh, dust myself off when I fell. <laughs> and my dad was a 42-year uh, firefighter and uh, was a role model of public service and shows just by showing up every day uh, the difference you can make. All right. To, uh, that should be the emotional bit. <laughs> but um, I also have to thank my boss, Congressman Darren Soto. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I do need to say uh, that my views are my own and do not rec necessarily represent those of Congressman Soto or the Future Forum. But really, I'm, I'm the guy behind the scenes. Um, and, and Darren's the one with his name on the door, the elected official. You know, it really is a team effort uh, in what we do. Uh, he's, he's been very supportive in letting me pursue ideas, but ultimately it's him that introduces, puts his political capital, and he's, he's great. He has um, showed me that, uh, you know, sometimes he's hard to work for because he never says no, and is always gonna put himself out there. And um, he's really instilled that belief that you just have to keep showing up, you have to keep doing things for the people you represent, and over time, that adds up. Um, and finally, two more thank yous to David Bagby and Mike Nicola, who were my legislative mentors and really showed me the ninja stuff it takes to get stuff done on the Hill. And finally, to my colleague um, and really, you know, probably my best friend, Nicole McLaren, who uh, taught me a lot about working on the Hill, being a better person, and just being a supporter along the way. So briefly, um, I'll just, you know, I've, it's my first time where somebody reads my, my uh, bio before I, I speak. But we were 
so proud to get those bills passed. Um, like some of our prior speakers have said, it takes a lot of grit and determination to not only introduce these topics, but push them over the line. Um, we've talked a lot about things in the past, and uh, you know, I've been a big believer in this. People ask me that don't know about this stuff. This isn't the, the crowd I have to preach to about the importance of blockchain. Uh, or its potential, but when I go home and interact with people, they ask all the time, like, why do you care? Um, why do you spend so much mental energy on this issue? And I, I truly believe that blockchain and, and cryptocurrency have the potential to be the most democratizing technologies in our lifetime, like truly. We're, we're at the cusp now where we've learned some of the shortfalls of the large data sets and artificial intelligence and some of the privacy concerns and, and all that. And some of that was coming out. I remember being concerned as a philosophy undergrad and thinking AI was cool and you know filtered algorithms. Why could that be scary? So a lot of the incentives that AI promotes, there's a natural yin-yang effect with decentralization and um, these data farms and these energy consumptions. So when I explain blockchain to people, I explain its benefits. There's going to be an energy benefit, a data security benefit, and a um, paradigm shift in how we store data. You know, when I talked about data to government leaders, it's not AI, quantum, um, blockchain. They're all just different ways to do things with data. And I think some of the scary implications of large concentrations of big data have, have, are just starting to emerge. And just the literal way blockchain is constructed fixes a lot of that, or it has the potential to. And at the government level, governments have the most data out of anybody. Not to be scary, that's just how governments work, but um, it's not fully optimized for what it can do. Just imagine, um, take for example, I went to, um, to Walgreens this week and there was a supply chain shortage, so my medication wasn't there. And then I go to pay for my, um, you know, go to check out and the um, financial system was down because the credit card things go. So people ask why I care. It's about these specific examples that it can help. So. Um, you know, a lot of attention is paid to letters and pieces of legislation. And um, what my real role is, is I'm a translator. I can, you know, understand 50 to 80 percent on a good day of the technology, but I'm able to simplify. Um, and largely that's, you know, one of the, the hardships I overcame was uh, dyslexia. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, I'm very good at visualizing information and incrementally gaming out how we get to a bigger picture. So I think we have a lot of ambitious ask and we have a lot of um, things of where we need to go. My biggest recommendation for the folks in this ecosystem is you need to be able to simplify it from somebody that's never heard of, uh, heard of this stuff. You have to communicate the value first and then let them ask the questions about the technology. I sit in countless meetings where the tech is the exciting stuff to the engineers. But when you're talking to policy um, folks, a lot of times you have to distill the benefit up front and breadcrumb where we're going. So a lot of these successes have really come out from larger aspirations of providing regulatory clarity. Where are the lines between the SEC, the CFTC, Treasury? You know, I think those are all driving motivations right now for our innovators. But those are very complicated and take a while for regulators to run up to. So what are things we can do in the meantime? We can um, tell different agencies that they should consider pilot programs within their agency to address uh, problems. The one we've had the most success with is the um, FDA food contamination um, traceability study, where at first it was a feasibility analysis, then it was a, a pilot that showed success, and now it's being implemented on a larger scale. And what, what problem does this solve? You know, in government, you have to have a solution that isn't in search of a problem, but that actually does something. So with contaminated food, um, there was a lettuce, a romaine lettuce outbreak where it took six months to track down where the contamination was. Um, in that six months, they were only able to identify it originated in the state of Arizona. So they had to destroy all the lettuce in Arizona. And that shouldn't take uh, six months, number one, and you shouldn't have to destroy all the lettuce in one state. 
So a blockchain solution literally uh, allows you to trace it back to point of origin, localized to a single plot of land within a single farm, and you've addressed the problem much sooner. Um, some of the things I'm personally most excited about um, when, I, when I say what problems can it solve, healthcare costs, um, environmental issues, you know, this, again, some of the obstacles we're up against. When you're transferring your medical records to another hospital um, that you've never been to before, at this point in time uh, in this country, it takes an average of six faxes to get your medical records from one hospital to another. That's not emails, that's not digital, you know, <laughs> anything digital, that's literally six faxes. So there's a huge pace issue, and what happens if one of those faxes are missed? Um, so many health implications, and one-third of our healthcare costs in this country are because of administrative issues like that. So if you can layer in a blockchain solution, reduce that $1 trillion cost, and bring it down you know, to a fraction of that, you know, that's, that's something that literally could lower health care. Um, and I'll just conclude um, by saying that, um, again, it's this ability to not only see where you want to go, but to break it down into incremental steps. So I always have an ambitious ask that I like to put out there. And then the incremental steps you have to get along the way because it's going to take a lot of um, coalition building. You know, I, I am one of the, the policy chairs for the blockchain caucus. So half of my job has just been um, educating members of Congress and staffers that have never heard this stuff. And the other half is, uh, you know, organizing thoughtful uh, dialogues that kind of push the issue. And right now where I think we can really accelerate these things for instead of 20 years for the, some of these um, solutions to take place, we need our translators right now. We need people that can get in the middle, understand the engineering, and talk to it like, um, you know, like Einstein said, if you can't explain it to an eight-year-old, you don't really understand it. Um, so we're kind of getting to those points where we really need to do that. And, you know, I'll just end that it, it's so great that the four uh, awards are organized into leadership, social impact, courage, and innovation. Because those really are the four elements required to, you know, be in this room, push innovative solutions, have the courage to stand up when people ask, why do you care about this stuff? Um, and ultimately, we, we hope to maximize the social impact. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank everyone, and I encourage and uh, applaud everyone in their own blockchain journey, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bill. Bill, thank you so much for representing the House of Representatives Future Leadership Forum and, and all of the pipeline and innovation that's coming into the U.S. government, thanks to your fostering an ecosystem. So now it's my honor to introduce the 2022 winner of the Government Blockchain Association Annual Achievement Award for Innovation. As you know, there's a huge amount of capital coming into the blockchain space, the digital ledger technology space, protocol innovation space, and governance space using algorithms that are integrated into smart contracts along with hundreds of other services. In the financial services area, DeFi is an opportunity now to disrupt the whole financial system, and we see over $36 billion coming into this market for DeFi and CeFi. Last year alone, total of $55 billion over the last four and a half years. We're going to see it grow, 17 to $30 billion a year from now on, coming into the blockchain. So there's no shortage of opportunity and innovation, but there is a shortage of imagination and willpower from the government to adopt. So we need all of you to help one sector of the U.S. economy, the public sector, to be an early adopter of this technology. So I want to congratulate everyone in this audience and give you all an applause for being here. So you can see Albert Einstein on the screen there. One fact that people don't realize is that he was an advocate for civil rights before he passed away in 1955. That he actually went around the country to advocate for minorities in particular African-Americans, to try to help our society become 
uh, something that would have an equal opportunity for all citizens. So that's why we named it after Albert Einstein, not only because he was a great innovator, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, but because he was just a great human being. So now I'd like to, this time, have an envelope, please, for the innovation. But before I do so, I want to say that there were many top-level finalists and nominees, and uh, one of them flew here all the way from Honduras with his business partner from Miami, so I'd like them to stand up and be honored. From Del Norte, please join me in a round of applause for Anton Gloucester and Judd Ireland from Del Norte. Del Norte is an innovator that probably will win in the next year or two that has uh, developed not only ID on the blockchain, but also uh, title and deeds on the blockchain, which has huge implications for the world economy in allowing people who are not titled to lead or whose title is being um, obstructed or deleted by a government uh, or private sector actor in collaboration with the government, this technology will be immutable and allow for economic development. So we really appreciate what they've done. Del Norte, thank you so much. So now the envelope, please. Okay, so the, the finalists. Yeah, so the finalists for this for the Innovation Award are Joseph Lowe, Chairman and Founder of Maven Federal Credit Union, Prajeet Goel, CEO of Solve.Care, and Jim Sullivan, the Chief Technology Officer and Lead Instructor at the, at the Blockchain Academy. So the winner is? The winner of the 2022 Innovation Award for the Government Blockchain Association is Joseph Lowe, Chairman and Founder of the Maven Federal Credit Union. <laughs> Congratulations, Joseph. Joseph, are you here? Here he is, okay. As he comes up, yeah. As he comes up, I will, I'll read his bio. But also, innovation in government is all too often an oxymoron. And so all government innovators deserve to be recognized. Um, and we have obviously an amazing innovator right here in Joseph Lowe. Do you want to take a picture first? Let's do a picture and I'll okay. read your bio. Congratulations. Right. Did you expect it? No. This is a surprise. Okay. Come this way. Come on. All right. Yeah. This is yours. You have it. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. And now your address. Yeah. So I. Um, well, Joseph, I feel a little fondness with you because you're out in Laramie, Wyoming, and I'm in Provo, Utah. <laughs> But more than that, we actually both graduated from high school in the same year. Did we? So we're stuck in this chasm between Gen X and Millennials, where we're right on the tail end of Gen X and the beginning of Millennials. And I think that's why we're such pioneers in this space, because we have, we've had to pave our own way the whole way. Neither one of them want us. Right. So neither one of them want us, so we're going to make our own way, and that way is a better future for everyone. Um, so Joseph is the chairman of Maven Federal Credit, Credit Union, which will be the first credit union in the US for blockchain, obviously out of Wyoming. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> let me say, I, uh, I appreciate wow so much, and um, I'm horrible at these things. Um, so as I was falling asleep last night, <laughs> 11.30, I get a text, hey, just in case, by the way, you've been nominated and write an acceptance speech five to eight minutes. Well, I didn't write anything. So, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak off the cuff a little bit. I did take a few notes. I will tell you, um, so I met uh, Nabil about four to five years ago and uh, he introduced me. He's like, I gotta meet you. I gotta introduce you to this guy. I'm like, who are you talking about here? Um, he's the head of this association. His name is Gerard. And this is how the journey began. I became a member immediately once I heard the idea. Um, and then um, I had a friend at the time, he's actually here, uh, Jonathan Braniff with Block Junction. And we had a discussion. It took us about four years to get to this point. And um, what one of the things was is that we kept seeing a lot of uh, these startups and uh, they ended up being a lot of, uh, they were taking advantage of this, the whole crypto startup and uh, there's a lot of money flowing, right? Anytime you see a lot of money flowing, you're gonna see a lot of um, con artists, unfortunately. And so um, 
and they're out there selling, you know, unregulated securities. So it started this battle between the SEC and private companies wanting to sell crypto tokens. And it took us four years, and we're like, we have to find the language, okay? Um, both of them have very valid points. There's a lot of good actors that are trying to create companies for the good of all of us, and, uh, and the SEC is here to um, not be a, a punisher or a bad guy, but mm -hmm. to protect mm -hmm. us from um, people who might try to take advantage of us. Uh, but we knew what we were trying to do was not a security. So what was this language? So January of last year, we finally found that language and we reached out to the NCUA and we spoke to them and began engaging with the federal government about this idea of a blockchain credit union. Not necessarily, again, not necessarily a credit union that um, adopts blockchain and sells Bitcoin to people. Um, I can get that done with a cash app or whoever else, you know, Coinbase. Uh, but a, a, a consensus model um, based on a common bond association. And they, they were all ears for it. They were, they were very open to it. And what we found after about 700 to 1,000 pages of reading, uh, yes, I read the whole Federal, Federal Credit Union Act. I read Regulation 701. It was obviously a part of it. It's uh, 700 to 1,000 pages. I read it in a couple days, and I read it several times. Mm -hmm. uh, I absorbed information. Um, so. Uh, what we found is that the languages are identical uh, between credit unions and distributed ledger technologies. Um, so the Maven Federal is, yes, it's already pre-chartered. It's very successful. Um, we're running into uh, raising capital now. It's all uh, donations. But the, um, it's the first uh, blockchain credit union in the United States and also the world uh, using the credit union model exempts us from regulation by the SEC, the CFTC, um, and uh, obviously the OCC. We are only regulated by one federal agency, and that's the NCUA. They're very open. They're, uh, they're wanting what we are doing, and everything we're talking about in this room, they want us, right? It's, uh, it was really weird. It's an open door type policy, and um, the, um, Again, forgive me, I didn't really prepare a speech. I didn't know. Um, so we, uh, again, we became one of the fastest chartered credit unions in the United States and doing it in uh, uh, pre-chartered credit unions in the United States. It's a two-step process. You have to get your pre-charter and then you have to get your charter. Uh, the pre-charter allows you to raise capital without you know, getting in trouble with the SEC. And we did it sub six months. Um, so it's one of the fastest in U.S. history. Let me tell you something, though. This credit union, I want to clear something up. I met a lot of you outside. Absolutely amazing and wonderful pe people and absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, this is not my company. This is not a private for-profit uh, uh, for entity, okay? Um, this is not my bank either. This is our bank. Maven Federal is sponsored by the GBA. This is GBA's bank. Everybody in this room has access to Maven Federal once it gets its full charter in April. Understand, this is your bank. I didn't win this award today, and I didn't innovate this. This is our award, and we innovated this, okay? So uh, with saying that, uh, you know, be the bank. Don't, you know, put everything we can into this. Once we're chartered, I'm taking my money out of every bank, every cash app, Coinbase I can get. I'm putting it all into this. I'm 100% in. There's a couple of people I'd like to thank, starting with the three G's. Um, <laughs> my three G's, uh, God, Gerard, and the GBA. <laughs> I like to thank all uh, the Maven team that's out there watching this right now. I like to thank my wife, my kids, my mother, uh, my friends that are here today from Block Junction, Jonathan and Gio. Um, everybody that supported this and will support it. Yes, I've been getting all your text messages and your LinkedIn's and uh, yes, we will do this together and we will have our own bank. Thank you. So congratulations again to Joseph Lowe. Let's give another warm round of applause for Joseph Lowe. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so now our 
biggest award is the Earl Hall Courage Award. And I want to give a little bit of background first um, about, about Earl. He's um, the CEO of the FinTech Access AI. Access harnesses the power of cloud-based enterprise quality, hyper-secure blockchain security to collect mission-critical data from land-based casino industry in more than 40 countries to empower cashless, responsible gaming, anti-money laundering, business intelligence, and real-time analytics. And I just thought, I'm going to introduce somebody from Toronto who can help create contactless cards, DCR strategies, headed by the, their president, uh, Diana Fletcher. So that's something I think I can help you add value to your platform. Uh, Earl G. Hall is an internationally recognized Canadian entrepreneur, two-time TED speaker, visionary and innovator in several fields of technology and neuroscience. Earl is a graduate of the Royal Military College of Canada and a veteran army officer. He holds, he holds a master's degree in public administration and has undertaken doctoral degree studies in organizational psychology, which I think all of us need. So Earl is the vice chair of the International Gaming Standards Association and focuses on ethical artificial intelligence and integral traceable data. As well, Earl is a member of the Global Government Blockchain Association Standards and Certification Committee. So it's my honor and privilege to introduce Earl Hall, who will introduce the awardee, and we'll get the envelope in a minute to find out who has won the Courage Award. So please join me on the stage, Earl. And we'll show the, uh, the finalists after we open the envelope. So could you give us the envelope, please? And first, Earl will introduce himself. I've already given him an introduction, but then he'll, right after this introduction, we're going to introduce the finalists. You want to perhaps read the finalists? Yeah, I'll read them. Okay. No and, and then after that, you'll ask for the envelope. Thanks. As long as my phone doesn't die, I'm good. Okay. So the finalists for the award are President Nayib Bukel, the President of El Salvador, Dr. Robert Brown, and Burst IQ. You told me to do my presentation. Great. Yes, you'll give your presentation after we open the envelope. So we'll create more suspense. First the presentation and then the envelope. Okay, great. Great. Hello, everybody. I'm here to speak on courage. It's probably a subject most of us would aspire to at least be able to say that we were courageous at some level, sometime in our lives. I don't have a clicker, I'm sorry, so I have to do a, a wave movement. Thank you. So what I propose for the next seven or eight minutes is I would like to take you on a journey of some of my idols and some of my mentors. First of all, we're standing in a very famous place, on a very famous podium, that a very famous person gave an incredible speech a long time ago, it's John F. Kennedy. Please remember, it doesn't matter who or what the human has done. History always favors courage. Oh, I couldn't come here without bringing Steve, of course. Because when you do what we do, Blockchain, crypto, stable coins, all of that stuff. Everybody's been hailing us for 10 years as completely crazy. Heretics, the words that I've heard over the last 10 years are completely nuts. But history will favor those people as well. Once again, having sat in his chair in his house in South Africa, Nelson Mandela, from prison, was hailed for what he did for conquering fear, because you cannot speak about courage if you do not talk about conquering fear. Rosa Parks, if you don't know who this is, she is very dear to my heart. And what she left behind besides her amazing legacy was the simple thing, if you think and you know it's right in your heart, do that. Yeah. I brought this one from Gerard, Gerard, the president 
the founder, the visionary of GBA. He says this one all the time, and now it's just stuck in my head. The more courageous you are, please remember, the more scared you are. It's a fallacy to even think that you can be courageous without fear. And the person that I wake up and go to bed with every single day since I was an officer cadet at the Royal Military College, the greatest thing about having courage is to be able to balance out the extreme anxiety of the fear it takes to be courageous. And now I have to take a small pause for my brethren. So please remember forgotten and fallen soldiers because they are the only ones that understand what the ultimate courage is. Why? Because of the last line. No personal gain. I'd like to end off my definition of courage with another famous person that stood here before me. And please remember that courage cannot be disassociated from change. It is easy to remain in the, cur in, in, in the current system, in the fiat system, to do what we've always done. But change requires courage. The bigger the change requires courage, and please remember, that requires continuous and constant struggle. And to end this off, once again, courage. It is the ability to master the fear, to do what you think is right, to leave behind a legacy, whatever the price you must pay. And now for the Award for Courage, once again, the Award for Courage is a very important one because it recognizes actions that have a global impact. Why? Because blockchain is changing all of the traditional paradigms. Right now, 99% of the world doesn't understand how important, how positive blockchain is from security to distribution to finance to real estate to everything. But they will. Why? Because there's courageous people out there evangelizing why we have to move to legitimacy. So that being said, I have the extreme privilege of announcing the winner of the 2022 Award for Courage. And the envelope, and I'll give you the honor of Thank announcing. You. Oh, I do? Okay. Thank you so much. And the winner is His Excellency Nayib Bukel, the President of El Salvador. to accept the award on behalf of His Excellency the President is the Ambassador of El Salvador to the United States. And if I may, Ambassador, I would like to introduce you, please. Ambassador Milena Mayorga was appointed to the, as the Ambassador of El Salvador to the United States on September 23, 2020. Prior to her appointment, Ambassador Mayorga served as a member of the Legislative Assembly of El Salvador and was a member of the Committee on Children and Gender Equality in both Legislative Assembly and Latin America and the Caribbean Parliament. Moreover, as, uh, Ambassador Mayorga was a member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. During her time in Congress, Ambassador Mayorga demonstrated her commitment to fight against corruption by introducing an anti-corruption bill. Ambassador Mayorga supported the creation of the Permanent Commission Against Corruption and the creation of an international commission against impunity in El Salvador and a law for the repatriation of stolen and evaded capital. Listen to this, please. While in Congress, she presented a bill to facilitate access to credit for women entrepreneurs, and business owners with a special focus on women who have been the victims of domestic violence wow, <laughs> and presented a law for comprehensive care for cancer patients. And Besser Moriego holds a degree in communication. Yeah. <laughs> the 
That one blew me away. <laughs> With all due respect. Ambassador Moyega holds a degree in communications, completed additional studies at Tulane University in Louisiana, United States, and under a certificate in theology at the Institute for Theology by Extension. Prior to entering Congress, Mayor Orga had a successful career in marketing and communications. And most importantly, Ambassador Moriega is married and has two children. So congratulations to the, uh, the president of El Salvador. And on behalf of the president, we introduce uh, the ambassador from El Salvador to the United States. And I hope to see all of you at the first Bitcoin city at the base of the volcano uh, sometime in the next 12 months. OK, thank you. Congratulations. if you'd like to talk. Thank you. Hello, dear guest. Courageous. What has been the performance of Latin American governments? They have been mostly corrupt and subordinated their decisions to the mandates of anachronic international financial institutions. Countries need courage to control crime. Countries need determination to end corruption. Countries need strong government action to control pandemics. We need courage, leadership, and determination to achieve economic freedom. As a result, of President Bukele leadership, El Salvador is the first country to achieve economic freedom. Nearly 150 days have passed since the Bitcoin law entered into force in El Salvador. Take note of this. Before this law, only 30% of Salvadorans had access to financial service. Now, over 90% do. <laughs> El Salvador is a developing country with the largest number of people with access to banking service. Please also take note of this. El Salvador has its own electronic wallet, Chivo Wallet, and over $500 million had been transferred to El Salvador free of financial commissions. Luckily, companies that charge uh, fees and commissions to process remittances are unhappy with us. Dear friends, I am deeply humbled and honored to be here representing the best raider and most popular president in the world, Your Excellency Najib Bukele. To receive this award on his behalf makes me feel that we are moving in the right direction. For the Salvadoran people, 2022 is the beginning of Bitcoin City. And we want our country to also become your new adopting country. Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert have been decided to become Salvadorans. And they are in El Salvador, living in El Sonte. We're waiting for all of you to follow their footsteps. The government of El Salvador is using the first profit derived from Bitcoin to build 20 new schools and the first hospital for pets in Latin America. <laughs> but we still need your investment to create the jobs that our country needs. And 
At this moment, I welcome you to El Salvador, a country with the courage to become economically independent. Thank you on behalf of President Najib Bukele. Let's make history. Let's do it together. Thank you. Gracias. If you could present the award to the ambassador for His Excellency Nayib Bukel. Thank you. Ambassador, on behalf of the Global Blockchain Association and the Government Blockchain Association, I would like to present you on behalf of the President with the award for courage. Congratulations. Wonderful. Congratulations, Earl Hall, the CEO of FinTech Axis, and congratulations to the Ambassador and His Excellency Nayib Bukel. Thank you so much for accepting the Courage Award for 2022. So, so I want to say that in the history of Latin America, uh, certain countries like El Salvador, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina are advancing in the field of technology. Chile. I've met the head of 5G in Barcelona at the World Mobile Congress, and there's so many people from Latin America who are on the frontiers of blockchain and technology, including the one I mentioned, Del Norte, earlier. So what we need now is to not only recognize these achievements, but to invest in these opportunities for infrastructure, because they will transform the economies of Latin America and other countries in the world. So again, congratulations to all of you for being here. I want to thank Gerard Dache, Kathy Dache, who's our special events director, Jordan, who's been orchestrating the technology, and all of this will be streaming online on demand. And I also want to just say that our four awardees really are remarkable. And I encourage you to reach out to them and invest in their projects. So with that, I want to conclude the Annual Achievement Awards for 2022 and thank everyone for attending and look forward to 2023. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. All right, well, that was exciting and, ex and inspiring. So we have a couple quick announcements. Uh, the first one is regarding uh, the event tomorrow night, and we have Kathy coming up to talk about the reception. First, I just want to say, uh, Ambassador Mylena Mayorga, that was lovely and wonderful. We are so proud of you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm just going to make a quick announcement about the uh, Roaring Twenties evening reception held tomorrow night at the St. Eve's, D.C. If you don't have a ticket, you're really missing out. So I want you to uh, consider getting a ticket. You can go right outside to Maria Escuela and get yourself a ticket. We are going to be having a a 1920s roaring, uh, roaring 20s reception, and this is where the dealers are going to be made. So I'm inviting all of you to come. Feathers, fedoras, and fringe are not required, but highly encouraged. I brought up my props, but I'm done. All right. And, and this is Kyle. I wanted to introduce him. He's our, our member services. And do you have any questions about GBA? Please talk to Kyle. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm Kyle. Uh, Kathy basically covered everything that I was going to say. Um, I take care of uh, member services and customer service, so if you have any questions about the website or anything about the general workings of the GBA website, anything like that, I'm your guy and I'm right over at the member services booth. Greg? And lastly, we have Greg coming up here and he is going to tell us a little bit more about the app. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Gerard and Kathy. Thank you for everybody uh, making this event what it is. This is um, 
I think the second um, GBA event that we have built an app to help you all connect. And so what I'd like to do is sort of just really quickly tell you about the GBA website slash app that will help you all to meet each other afterwards. So you don't have to scan a ton of business cards if you don't want to. Uh, just find each other on the app. So does everybody have a phone? If you haven't yet or you haven't had the email, go to gba.community. Okay, gba.community is something we put together for you to see the speakers, to see the events and who is coming and what's happening. And then after that, you see on the screen up there, after that what happens is that, well, this is what we do, we build apps for communities. This is what my company, Cubix, does. Um, you can connect with whoever and whomever has the same interests as you, uh, who went to the same uh, breakout events and heard the same people. Sometimes a deal flow can happen afterwards and we help to facilitate that. So rather than having to scan a ton of business cards, I highly recommend you get this. And also, uh, we're going to be working on releasing the GBA app in the stores, uh, app stores. So you're going to be able to actually meet people. And year after year, there's an extended community because this is a family that is growing every year. And so I'm proud to be part of that family and hopefully can help contribute to it. So definitely, if you have a chance, gba.community. Um, if I was to just uh, give a plug for my company, we do this for many different communities around the world. But this is one of my favorites. And uh, I hope to come here next year as well. So thank you very much to everybody. So it says here that we have a break coming up, and it's going to be for 10 minutes. So everyone enjoy the break, and we'll be back here in 10 minutes.
All right, if I could get everyone's attention, we're gonna go ahead and start the next panel. Um, yeah, thank you for rejoining us here and for those in virtual world. Uh, we have a great dis discussion set up for you. Um, the broad theme we're working with today uh, for this panel session is national governments and just the impacts of cryptocurrency and blockchain on national government and the reverse of that national government's impact of those technologies. Um, I'm gonna do a brief introduction and then gonna be joined by some very distinguished panelists, um, but just gonna run through two or three slides to kind of frame some of the discussion uh, themes and then we'll get going and, and do a panel format. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Um, so just some broad uh, framing of the issue. As I mentioned, the, the first two items that, you know, this is kind of a new issue. Um, you know, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and all that revolution got going, you know, I think we're at 12 years ago. Um, and it used to be just a lot of rogue innovators is the phrase I like to use. And, you know, it was largely developed in the emer uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. But I think these past few years, we're, we're seeing folks like El Salvador and now the US government through uh, provisions in the infrastructure bill where this is becoming a very serious dialogue, much more engaged. Um, so we just want to kind of discuss through some of those themes, um, you know, what are different countries doing, uh, the impacts of the strategic formation, and, uh, you know, largely, that means, um, okay, sorry, I'm just checking here. Go back one more. But, uh, so the impact on how that impacts different layers of government and the, the ways they're rolling out their strategy, you know, not everyone is gonna have the same approach. You know, there are smaller uh, emerging countries that may pursue some paths and then some other more, uh, more, uh, mature markets or whatever phrase you want to use, some of the, the bigger economic um, nations might have a, a different way of approaching this issue. So um, last, you know, we kind of put the panel together and I thank them for, for attending that we wanted to, to keep in mind that we have various layers of government that we need to, to think from. You know, we do have national representatives here. We have folks from municipal, um, state, and national governments. So when we're, we're talking about this, this is gonna be a little bit of a uh, emphasis on the national government part, but we need to keep in mind that a lot of these things develop from municipalities uh, to the state level, to national level, and then finally the international dynamic. So when we're thinking about these topics, we have to keep in mind the layers of government and all the uh, you know, is this state versus federal? You know, all those different dividing lines and the different government officials involved. Uh, lastly, uh, kind of just speaking to the, the point I just mentioned is, um, you know, what are the basic driving forces of, of some of these decisions that you hear countries like El Salvador and, and China coming out with the Belt and Road Initiatives and, and countries like Malta and um, Estonia t really taking the lead in Europe. That, and, and now that the US is starting to more proactively look in those decisions. So, you know, how are those different sizes of countries, their, you know, goals of economic leadership, capital formation, what are some of those motivating decisions and, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of you know, being the first of, of uh, you know, to be really lead on the issue versus trying to keep up. Um, the last theme is really the, kind of the two driving forces at, at bay here as we look at this from an international perspective. There's, there's a, a bit of a uh, competitive component right now where a lot of countries are trying to lead. You know, you can see this with a lot of exchange regulation with countries like Singapore and Switzerland really trying to push forward and capture this, these new markets. Um, so there are real motivations and benefits to leading these discussions. Um, and I think you see that right now where, where, where certain countries are trying to establish themselves as thought leaders and um, innovators in this space. But also we have to realize that a lot of these conver uh, 
you know, transactions are they're digital assets that occur over um, the, the internet. You know, jurisdictional lines aren't always clear. Um, so there's also a competitive element here, but we need to make sure that we're being thoughtful and collaborative in some of these efforts because we, we don't want to encourage jurisdictional hopping or um, ambiguity as these large uh, multinational corporations work across jurisdictional lines. So with that, I will um, introduce my esteemed panel. Um, I consider them all personal friends and so grateful that they're all here today and join me in this discussion. Um, I guess we'll do a, uh, I'll introduce, they'll, they'll do the walk across and, and then we'll, we'll get going. Um, first, I'll, I'll just take the opportunity to recognize Gerard Dache, really the, um, the man, the myth, the legend of, of this. <laughs> This fine event, um, Gerard and I have been working together for several years, but they, they truly do a great job, and I'm honored to ha uh, have some of these discussions with him. I'm honored for you to be here. <laughs> All right, we also have uh, Paul Belzano from, um, he's a professional, house, uh, professional staff member on the uh, Committee on Agriculture. So he's one of the thought leaders in the, the commodities and exchange space. So we're honored to have Paul here. And finally... Bill, Bill did you say he's a professional housekeeper? <laughs> professional <laughs> staff member. Oh. My apologies. Um, I, I, I think I saw our other panelists run out the door. So I... Oh, ah. there he is, getting, getting water, like a, like a true gentleman. Um, we have Silvio... Casto with us, who is the founder of Logos Capital and also one of the leaders on, um, you know, a lot of the work that's going on in Miami right now in their crypto leadership. So with that, we'll um, we'll start and just double check. This should be a live mic. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, all right, sorry, I, I, I gotta be able to see everyone here. All right. And sound check can, yep, okay. And then I'll just pass uh, the microphone um, to each. I guess we'll, we'll kind of start out with, with Paul uh, here and, and kind of the time hopping. You, you've been a, a professional staff member um, for a while working on the Agriculture Committee and were around in, in Dodd-Frank and have, have seen some, some serious developments on that. Um, so I'm kind of curious, I know you were uh, around for all the, the swaps regulation for Dodd-Frank, so I, I kind of wonder if you could make some parallels for what happened 10 years ago to what's going on right now. Sure, thanks. Uh, let me start by saying uh, my views are my own, and don't, this is sort of the standard government disclaimer, uh, don't represent the views of uh, my boss or the other members of the Agriculture Committee. Um, but uh, swaps, I think, is an, is an interesting place to start. Um, uh, it's a it's an asset class that um, we have brought into regulation uh, since the the financial crisis 2008 and Dodd Frank, um, but prior to that they were uh, sort of largely unregulated and uh, the government sort of made a choice uh, in 2000 to to not regulate swaps, um, but and then prior to that. Uh, there was a big fight between the CFTC and the SEC. Uh, so we have this asset class in history, right? That uh, is in sort of the same way as crypto, uh, infinitely variable, right? Swaps can represent all manners and uh, be constructed in uh, in an infinite number of ways. Um, and there was a fight amongst the financial regulators about what a swap was and sort of whether it should be considered a security or uh, or a futures contract subject to the CFTC's regulation. Um, and so it's not the first time we've sort of been through this process of trying to get our arms around what is this thing, what is this asset class, and, and how should we regulate it. Um, so it was an interesting, you know, fight. We're sort of still you know, mostly done with sort of what is it and where should it be regulated, but we're still trying to unpack sort of all of the rules around how we do it. <laughs> yeah, and I think more folks um, here are, are probably have, have seen some of the things by the SEC um, in recent years. So I was kind of wondering if you could just lay out some of those jurisdictional lines, you know, what the current, not necessarily how they apply to crypto, but just for the non-crypto sphere and kind of what the dividing line um, for investment protections between a security and a commodity. Oh, I will, I will try. I'm okay. not a securities lawyer, not a lawyer. Uh, but 
Um, generally, uh, the securities regime is a disclosure regime. So if you want to uh, issue a security, you have to go through a disclosure process with, with the SEC. And um, generally, the SEC regulates capital formation, right? So the pooling of assets to be able to accomplish uh, and for investment purposes. Uh, the CFTC is, um, I think, we generally think of those as, we call them risk transfer markets. So uh, markets where one entity has a risk and they would like to transfer it for a price to somebody else. Um, and so futures contracts and swaps um, enable uh, an exchange of payments, which can offset financial risk and other types of risk. Um, <clears throat> so uh, equities markets and securities markets are generally about capital formation, where uh, the CFTC's derivatives markets are generally about uh, um, Risk management, thank you. Uh, risk transfer and risk management for, uh, for market participants. Well, thank you. That, that's very helpful, and I think folks can maybe draw some parallels with what's going on these days. Um, I'll jump to Gerard next. And you know, but before we get to Silvio and, and get his, his perspective, I um, kind of just want to get you know, broadly with the, the Government Blockchain Association. You, you deal with all layers of government, and this is a very up and coming topic where you know a lot of uh, regulatory regimes are considering these things for the first time. So I, this is just a very broad question, but I was wondering, you know, what's been your experience? You know, the the pace of uh, teaching and you know the the knowledge acceleration. Like, what what's that like in in your world? Sure. Well, uh, let me start with a standard disclaimer. Right, my views are not my own; they're my wife's. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just. Also, I'm noticing that we're like brown, black, brown, black shoes. So it's almost like we've done this pattern thing. So, uh, but unlike our shoes, um, the, the, the state of blockchain uh, and, and crypto adoption globally is very, uh, not, it's not uh, systematic, it's, it's very eclectic. And um, I was just sharing a story, uh, maybe, about, maybe about two or three years ago, right before the pandemic hit, I was in um, uh, a country in, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And I was having a conversation with the ICT minister. So ICT is Internet Communications and Technology. And she reports directly to the president. In fact, we were outside the president's office. And um, we were talking about blockchain. Now, the president uh, had just, he, he, had, he wins every year in a free and fair democratic election. He'd been the president for 38 years at that point. So very loyal uh, population, love him. <laughs> and. Um, she, she said to me, we're interested in blockchain in all of its applications, except for our voting system. Our election system works just the way we like it. Right? <laughs> and, and I would say that you have some places at local, state, national uh, uh, governments where there is a lot of integrity. And you have other places where there's not so much. And in the places where there is integrity, right, we, you don't really need blockchain. But that's going to be the easiest place to implement it, and, and mostly at the local levels, right? The places where it is very corrupt, it's going to be very hard to implement blockchain, but that's where you need it. So my recommendation is for business owners and, and, and politicians and policymakers is try to find the easy spots. Implement blockchain in those places. You know, get the advocates in those places, right? Talk to a guy like you know uh, Mark Stewart from Chandler, Arizona, right? Where they're where they're they're positive, and look, this is still a very brand new technology with lots of problems, right? We don't have enough technical resources. There's not enough understanding. There's not adequate infrastructure. Let's build it in the easy places, right? All these people want to go to the toughest places and implement blockchain. So I, I, I have some military background. I spent um, a number of years in Army infantry and intelligence, and. Um, a lot of people think that that's an oxymoron. But uh, <laughs> in my case, there, it's true. Especially in the Army, <laughs> Especially in the Army uh, which is where I was. Um, but we, used, we wouldn't take green troops and put them in, into the, the heaviest fighting, right? You, you, you go through training, and there's a process to harden troops. And we need to harden blockchain. Um, and we need, to, we need to do it in a way that really makes sense. So I, that, that's my, it's very eclectic all over the world and, and our strategy ought to be go for the easy stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's great advice and we're, we're trying to figure out what that means at all layers of government uh, you know, in, in a thoughtful way. And I'll pivot over to Silvio, who um, both in his uh, activity in the private sector and the founding of his company and now in his work down with Florida, is literally seen, you know, 
private sector and now the government in trying to get a government initiative up and running. So I can kind of want to get you know your take on what that experience has been like, what, what have been some of the lessons learned in, in um, trying to move this at a, at a local government level. Yeah, th thanks, Bill. I appreciate that and uh, really appreciate your story, Gerard, of like, hey, everything's fine. The, you know, we want to apply it across the board, except in this part, you know, this, this is just, just what we wanted. Um, yeah, I think that that, that actually uh, really resonates, right? But I've been, what I've, what I've seen is there is, a, there's a bit of a sandwich effect. Like the federal government has like been really interested and they're like calling on us to volunteer for our opinions, to get together, to chat. Central banks have also like, I think I got first flown out five years ago to central banks, but they were also like really quiet about it. The state, on the other hand, was like, for the most part, like, okay, cool, maybe, eh, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe let's look like we're doing something. Uh, but the hyper, the local governments, the mayors particularly, I think are the ones that, that um, can see the most to gain immediately from doing something. And I think it goes to, to, to Gerard's point, which is like, where's the easier place to implement? And, 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 and like I mentioned in the panel, that I was talking about earlier, unfortunately, sometimes when you are at the municipal level, you do need to go back to the state level to push on legislation to let you do what you need to do at a local level. For example, if we wanna work with, I know we got, we got the Government Blockchain Association now, we're doing like an Earth ID for our own ID management system. If we would like to do that in a place like Florida, we would need to interconnect with the DMV. It doesn't matter how much you know, Mayor Daniela wanna do it at Miami-Dade County, or it doesn't matter how much Mayor Francis Suarez wants to do it in the city of Miami if you don't have a DMV integration, can't be done. Mm -hmm. so, so that would be, in a perfect world, maybe the, the first thing you should do that enables a number of other things, uh, but it's not as easy to do, you know, unless you have that multi-layer approach. When we originally met, and I think four years ago, thanks to Jordan, when we walked over, we were talking about the smart city project in Miami, we were talking about, all right, maybe like if I would be developing a smart city project, that would start with energy mm -hmm. to create like a distributed mesh network and resilient, network in case you have an EMP or whatever it is go off, you know, do you have a resilient infrastructure design? But in Florida, uh, and I should, I should have prefaced it like you guys, all these opinions are my own. <laughs> um, in Florida, we have the 800 pound gorilla, which is next to our energy, which is Florida Power and Light. And, and so you have a lot of like tricky legislation that happens there. So it's like, you can't, you know, it's like, that is not the road less traveled. You do not want to go there and poke the bear. So he said, okay, well, let's then look at supply chain. You know, being four out of every 10 jobs are supply chain in Florida, believe it or not. Um, and, and, uh, and so we said, okay, well, let's look at supply chain. But when we talk to like the ports of Atlanta, for example, I know Randy uh, did a lot of work to talk to the port, the port authority is like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, thanks, but no thanks, right? Go figure, right? Um, and so even if, you, even if the port said yes, to wanting to do a project, then you have to go back, let's say, to maybe GSA. And then I'd have to maybe apply to the GSA to be approved as a vendor, and then maybe get like a federal ID to then, or then apply also at a local level. It, it, so it gets really tricky very quickly. Um, even with people giving guidance, it's still like kind of murky. Um, and so at that level, let's say you do want to create a smart cargo system or a smart port system. We have no smart ports in the US, by the way. We have no smart infrastructure, really very few, very, very little smart infrastructure. Um, but, but there are places that are really poised to do it. So four years later, we still have not been able to do a public-private partnership. Go figure. Um, and I don't know if it's because Miami, like Atlanta, and, and, um, and places like Vegas are like number one, two, and three for human trafficking, for example, right? Huge issue. If you had blockchain and smart systems that can maybe you know, support some of this, it wouldn't be as much of an issue, but also at the same time, like Gerard was mentioning, maybe you don't really want you know, that technology to expose what's truly happening. Now, assuming they did, then we would have to have an integration with the federal or, or, and state, Florida Department of Transportation, Federal Department of Transportation, Customs and Border Protection, if we wanna be able to use artificial intelligence to know what the food quality is that's coming into Miami in the refrigeration, then we need to have an integration with the USDA. So there is not very singularly um, uh, hyper-local examples and easy wins that are so evident, right, like um, uh, uh, to get it done, right? We can get into other examples, but I'll take a pause there. Yeah. And can I tag on something? 
Just real quick. I think that that's, that's exactly why. And by the way, do you guys enjoy having something like, these are brilliant people uh, that we have in our midst, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 so I just met Paul today, right? But yeah. when I met these guys, I was just blown away by how smart they are. Um, but that complexity, that interconnection, right, is one of the reasons why I think the adoption in the United States is so slow, mm -hmm. right? And we're gonna have a talk later um, by uh, the, the co-author of an act in Liechtenstein. So Liechtenstein's much smaller. They, they established a, um, a blockchain, a cryptocurrency blockchain framework about two years ago, and in a place like Liechtenstein, they could just do it like that, right? right? Um, so going back to the easy point, you've gotta find places that are as uh, independent as possible and not as interconnected, right? Uh, but I thought that that was a brilliant point, Paul. I mean, uh, Silvio. And I'm glad it, it tied into one of the themes I was hoping we, we'd really get at, and that's why we have countries like El Salvador who really see these as opportunities uh, to grow and, and to birth these things. And then you have other countries like like China and, and you know, and, and hopefully the U.S. and, and maintaining leadership in this. It's a bit of a different uh, calculus, and I, I should also say these views are my own and not necessarily representative of uh, Mr. Soto or the Future Forum, um, that there are inherent challenges, and Florida has a lot of benefits, too. Um, you know, for example, we were talking about ag right before this panel, and one-third of the food supply comes through the Port of Miami. So that's a huge logistical challenge, and while we want to make sure these you know, and I agree with the assessment that a lot of these innovations are going to occur internationally, and you see um, Latin American and African countries really investing aggressively because they see these as leapfrog technologies. Mm -hmm. Not only technologies that will allow you catch up, but literally, um, you know, leapfrog uh, some other countries. So I, I, I think, you know, and I'll, I'll pivot back to Paul. He's probably a little nervous because he doesn't know where I'm going uh, with this. But with, with a country like the U.S., it's incredibly important, such huge um, stakes for getting it wrong. So there's always a balance of speed of uh, bills or regulation and, and clarity while there's this pressure, but the, the consequences are, are kind of huge if you don't uh, you know, dial up the metrics correctly. So you, you uh, worked on you know, probably the preeminent commodities bill uh, to be introduced, or I'll, I'll say though that um, Paul's modest. Thanks. <laughs> um, that is really leading the way for uh, defining um, exchanges and, and exchange clarity in this country. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, and so I could kind of just, as a broad question, some of the challenges and some of the pressure and, and, and what are some of the dials that you turn to make sure you're, you're balancing those um, you know, kind of competing variables. Sure, um, it's a good question. Um, and I think it relates kind of to the, the same things we've been talking about here, right? We, we have in this country very established systems and um, well, I think we can all find places where they don't work as well as they would like. Largely they work and largely they work fairly well. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of sort of institutional buy-in to the way in which things work in this country and a lot of uh, you know, folks are comfortable with the processes that we have. So every time somebody comes along and says, uh, I have a you know, bag of magic beans and I'm going to reinvent uh, how, how we do these things, um, you know, that's a real challenge for the folks that are very comfortable with how we do things today. Um, and you know, financial regulation is, is the place where, where I work at the Ag Committee, um, sort of maybe surprising to everyone here why someone from the Ag Committee is here, but uh, we have oversight over the Commodity Futures Trading Commission um, and uh, most of the nation's derivatives markets. Uh, so that's sort of how I come at this discussion. Um, and clearly we have two very well established financial market regulators in this country, this Commodity Futures Trading Commission and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and both those agencies are stocked with very smart people um, and they have, you know, a hundred years of law that they have applied and, uh, and case law and sort of history that um, helps them and they have used to sort through financial markets of, um, and decide sort of how we regulate things. And so as we look at uh, swaps, I think we sort of started with swaps, right? Swaps is a great example. Um, 
you know, we didn't know how to treat swaps 40 years ago. Um, and there was a disagreement between the CFTC and the SEC about uh, who should have jurisdiction over them. And um, much like we're sort of facing with crypto today, um, you know, that's because we have rules and sort of institutions that have built up over time. So as we think about how to integrate new things into them, you got to start from where we are, right? And so we're in a place where you have financial regulators and, um, and that's the starting place. And, you know, sort of similar as we talk about port security and, you know, every other thing that we, we may want to do, um, you start from where you're at and then sort of figure out how to go from there. Um, I'll pause there. Oh, oh, that, yeah. That's hugely helpful and insightful. And, you know, I, I think I'm just thinking a lot of these big picture questions. So I'm going to, you know, let uh, Gerard wax poetically, and I'm just kind of intrigued, you know, we're, we're trying to answer a lot of these big picture questions, and a lot of these insights are very helpful. But even like how you undertook the, the Herculean task of, you know, starting your own uh, association and, and all the background work that you do, like what even got you into this, um, you know, how'd you get the blockchain bug, and, and what are the, some of the things that excite you most about um, as this evolves? Well, um, so I had, another, I had another career. I was traveling all over the world evaluating uh, companies to see if they were mature enough to, uh, uh, to win large government contracts. And I told you that I had a background in Army infantry and intelligence. It was odd. I started getting calls from China asking me to come out and uh, evaluate Chinese defense contractors on behalf of its Chinese government. Does that seem weird to any of you? Right? <laughs> So uh, I said, listen, you, you do know that I'm a former United States Army intelligence professor. And they said, yes, no, we know about, we actually know a lot about you. I said, that's very comforting for me to know. Um, but we have it on good account that you can't be bribed. So a little bit of backstory, integrity is a really important thing to me. Um, and uh, at the time, my, my son had just bought um, uh, a little bit of Bitcoin. And when, he, when I say a little bit, I mean under $5. And when he sold it, he paid for a car, a motorcycle, um, uh, his college tuition and uh, his living expenses, right? And I hated him, <laughs> right? Now this was at the very, very beginning, right? Nobody really knew, knew anything. And so, um, so uh, I kind of got my attention. And uh, so I did, I, blockchain was a secret sauce, so he held a meetup. And, um, and at, you know, nobody really kind of cared about this in the early days, right? But what, what was a driver for for the internet was email. Because everybody wanted an email address, but to get an email address, you need an ISP. Well, once you had an ISP, you could have a web page, and once you had a web page, we're off to the races, right? You can, you can find a wife, you can jump into a stranger's car, go to a stranger's house, sleep in their bed, and then I'm just not, you know, wherever that goes. Swipe right, swipe left, our whole life changed, right? <laughs> Social media, right? Um, but it was email that, that drove that for the internet, right? Well, it's cryptocurrency that, drove, that, that is driving that for blockchain, right? And I remember in the early days, the, the sophisticated people in government said, talk to me about blockchain, but don't just talk to me about crypto. That's scammy, you know, stuff. But uh, quite frankly, you know, healthcare, supply chain, blockchain, it just it wasn't moving anything. It just, it just wasn't. And it wasn't, it wasn't until the ups and downs and all the craziness. Now, um, uh, Yovan, is Yovan in here? <clears throat> Yeah, so Yvonne, was, uh, Yvonne is, um, uh, basically leads all of our uh, global operations, right? And, and uh, by the way, thank you for the incredible work you do. We, GBA's got 120 chapters around the world, and, and, and Yvonne's been instrumental in, in building and maintaining that. But, um, but he, uh, he shared with me an article earlier, and, and uh, what does it say that Biden is uh, attempting to, is it outlaw crypto, or what, what was the detail of that? An executive order about uh, significantly reducing, uh, uh, whether it's illegal or whatever, being having, having a, right, a, a tamping down effect on crypto. Well, he also shared with me that Russia tried to do the same thing, and it was defeated by the, the, the House internally. And if a centrally planned government like Moscow, like Russia, can't get it through, right, crypto has become pretty ubiquitous here in the United States, right? I don't know what the current numbers are, but I would not be surprised if 20, 30% of people don't own crypto, at least some. They've all heard about it. I mean, you, you, it's on the evening news, right? So the government's gonna have a very, very hard time tamping down on it. The genie's out of the bottle. Now, here's why it's important to the cities. 
cities can't print their own money, right? When, when the pandemic hit in March of 2020, the, in March of 2020, the total number of dollars in circulation was $4 trillion. One year later, the total number of circulation, $18 trillion. Because the government said, we got to shut down the economy. Well, people still need to eat. We got to pay them. We got, let's do all these stimulus things. Well, it's not like they had bags of money. You, you guys in Congress, you didn't have bags of money sitting in some. Oh, I do under my desk. Oh, you do? OK. We've got to become better friends. Yeah. I just met you today. That's just not fair. But, um, and, and the government's already in debt. So what do they do? They told the banks, well, go ahead and just loan out more money. They dropped the fractional reserve requirement to zero. So now all of a sudden, you now the federal government can do this, the states and the cities, they can. So the government starts essentially devaluing the economy. The banks don't need your deposits anymore. So what happened to the interest rates of the bank? They plummeted, right? Who needs your, who needs your deposits for liquidity? The exchanges. So the exchanges started offering five to, five to 30% while the banks were offering zero. Where do you think all that money, where do you think all the, uh, the savings went? Into the exchanges. The actual number of people that own crypto is much larger than I think most people realize. And so now you've got the folks at the national level trying to control the national economy. All of this stuff is happening, and Bill will tell you, Paul, you, you may know too, the folks on Capitol Hill don't have an idea, a clue as to what's happening. It's getting better, but it's, it it's... Well, because of your education and leadership. But I, I think it's... I, I'd plug the blockchain caucus, it's, okay. uh, and, and I'm a part of that. Yeah, I know, you're a part of that, but you're here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but so this thing is running out fast, and the reason why places like El Salvador and Miami are running through this is because, because the, the U.S. dollar is hurting. And when we devalued the dollar, we didn't just do that to people in America. 65% of all foreign reserves are, are, are in U.S. dollars, right? So I was on a, I was a con conference call with folks from Pakistan, and they, they basically call this economic imperialism. We are essentially making them poorer, so they're looking for alternatives. Well, where are they going to look? Right? China, Russia, right? And any other national fiat currency has got the same problem. They're looking to crypto. So, so we are on the precipice of a massive change, change happening. And quite frankly, I think that most, the reason why we're seeing all this activity at the federal level is because now they're realizing too many crickets, this is real, right? The, 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 banks, the banks tried to tamp it down and said it was all just scam money. Now what are they doing? Look, if you can't beat them, join them, mm -hmm. right? So now, now the, the national government is looking at what the banks are doing. And what about private companies, right? You got, we're not far from, Michael Saylor's place, we had invited him to come. He, he, uh, he wasn't uh, able to schedule it. But how much did he put into it in his uh, treasury, right? I, I don't know, I think it's like a billion dollars or something. So the corporations are doing it. They, all of this stuff is happening. And, um, and the national government in the United States is, try, is trying to, to keep up, but it's running out way ahead of them. And it's really, it's Miami, Florida, these places are leading. So anyway, I'm sorry, I, I monopolized the... Uh, no, no, and I, I think we started about five minutes late, so uh, we got... Okay, so I'll, I'll ask Silvio. It's going to be a quick question, and then we'll do a, com a concluding uh, thought, um, you know, down the line. So you mentioned some of your, uh, your pain points and, and kind of shifting from the private sector, and now you, you, you've kind of seen government can be a very deliberative AKA slow process sometimes. So I'd be interested to hear uh, the other side, some of your positive lessons learned. And, and um, you know, if you could maybe just limit to you to like a minute, minute and a half, and just some of your, your things you were pleasantly surprised with when um, you started working with governments. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, for sure in, 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 in there's, there are a few th leaders that really see uh, and are willing to step out of the comfort zone towards uh, what the promise of innovation can bring to the masses, right? And so somebody that's really coming at this from the private sector, I I honestly, I don't have enough of an incentive to put as much effort and energy into like trying to help the government. But it's not about the government, it's about the, the us. It's about the people. It's about the kids I grew up with. It's about the people that don't have a seat at the table, right? And that really is what continues to be my inspiration. And every so often, I come across other leaders in government 
that really appreciate that and still share that original ethos of why people go into policy and government to begin with. Uh, and then they, you know, they just, they want it. You know, they'll call out for it. They'll call me, they'll text me, they'll ask me to come out, they'll ask me to hold a sunshine meeting. They'll say, you know, can, how do you help with this? How do you help with that? Can, uh, and so that, that process has been really encouraging. And now, more specifically, four years later, finally we're getting a chance to say, hey, look, this is all the other things that we have worked on so far to get to this point. And finally getting the calls from our own local community to, to ask, okay, well, what else can we do? And finally feel that it is the right time, that it's not just you know hitting the wall anymore. There can be a, a, a way forward. Uh, so, so I feel more motivated than ever uh, and more inspired than ever, especially with the recent leadership that we've had, especially in the, in the county and, and the whole like, crypto task force and the fact that, um, uh, and the collaboration, right, that, that, that it opens up because when there's not enough of a, of a knowledge uh, and understanding of what's possible and we can really come to the table with something that is truly innovative and, and has depth and meaning and, and meat, meat to it, uh, then, then I think there's, there's a lot more that can be accomplished and, and there is a silver lining, uh, I think, because government getting involved is the leverage point, ultimately, that will free the masses, right? And that really continues to be my inspiration. Well, that's great to hear and uh, need a lot of motivation for the, keeping up with this uh, dynamic eco ecosystem. Crypto never sleeps. So we'll wrap up. Um, we'll give each, each panelist uh, one minute to either, you know, what is a project or uh, that you're most excited about or um, a piece of advice you would give, you know, our, our great audience out there as they start to engage with government. Like, what's, what's a pearl of wisdom you you'd have to offer? I'll go first. All right. Uh, so um, Bill alluded to it earlier. One of the things that we're working on at the House Ag Committee is um, trying to think about how to integrate crypto into financial markets, right, and to bring uh, some more clarity to when things are securities and under the jurisdiction of the SEC and when things are not securities and theoretically commodities and um, w what that regulatory regime should look like. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of folks that have uh, felt the pain of being under the SEC's uh, watchful eye. Um, and part of that is because there is a lot of fraud and there is a lot of malfeasance in, in crypto markets. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, as we think about regulation and, and how to uh, regulate the marketplaces where people may meet to buy and sell these things, uh, you know, we think that there is uh, a need to, well, things shouldn't necessarily all be considered securities, that there is still a need to have investor protections uh, and be able to protect people who are trading in those trading venues um, while still permitting them to take those away from the venues and, you know, use them as we would imagine people use crypto. Um, your second question, uh, you got to come in and talk to us. I think that's by far the most important thing. Come in and talk and be patient and um, help us understand what you're doing and, uh, you know, don't be afraid to meet with staff. And um, I think we have a lot of folks that are very eager to learn um, and uh, are very, very willing to take meetings. But it you know, starts with folks reaching out to them because they don't know who you are and how to, how to reach you. Great segue. Uh, Paul, are you learning anything here? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Good, little good, bit. good. I well, know everything, as it turns out. No. <laughs> um, I would like to encourage members of the Blockchain Caucus to, to engage with us and even potentially, I think it'd be great uh, if we could even do a course, right? Do a, you know, a one day course for a, a congressional staff, for one or two day course. I'd, I'd like to make that publicly available. Um, in your uh, brochure, there's a couple QR codes. I would say uh, one of them is to our newsletter. So we have 50 working groups. And so you asked about some of the projects we're excited about. Um, we're working on something called the, I mean, it's just too many, the blockchain maturity model, right? Our, our, our credit union project, our voting and elections project, uh, sustainability, and there's so many. One, one of our working groups is putting on an event in May at the Mayflower Hotel. We have, I think, five or seven ballrooms, 12 breakout sessions, three floors of the Mayflower Hotel for three days, and there, one of our 50 groups is essentially planning that event, right? We're, uh, we're launching media uh, uh, platforms, I mean, it, there's just too much. But if you, if you hit that QR code and subscribe to our newsletter, you'll, you'll start finding out about all these things. And, and then you can connect with the ones that make sense to you. Um, and then the only other thing I'd like to say is I'd just like to thank uh, all you guys for, for um, just the incredible work that you do. 
It's awesome. Uh, one pearl of wisdom from you, Silvio, and then we'll bring it in for a landing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll uh, I definitely would start, a, a, and I know we got to be quick about this, but I think there's really an important opportunity with a project we're working on right now called Sustain the Cities for taking it smart cities a step further towards climate accounting. So the US just got back into the United Nations Paris Climate Accord and, um, and the, the, the ultimate game, I mean, sort of like how much crypto we have, how much money we have, what the social status is, is completely irrelevant uh, unless we sort of meet this global goal of the sustainable development goals and, uh, and get our environmental um, uh, game a bit together. It, not to be an environmentalist per se, right? But just to say what is actually happening. We don't know enough about what's happening. So smart, sustainable cities is focused on creating partnerships with, with cities. We want to do it across the US, across the world, 10,000 cities with the United Nations. And, uh, and it's creating a smart city, offering smart city as a service. So being able to finance the hardware and the sensors so people have a baseline. Then climate accounting as a service which could be open source, um, uh, an open source way to let other universities and other be involved to find out what is actually happening in the environment and the air quality, the water quality, temperature, heat, et cetera, to have the data to make the decisions and then sort of correlate anything else that's happening and then ultimately moving towards net zero as a service, right? Uh, how do we, you know, lowering uh, uh, greenhouse gases or emissions for different governments at different levels uh, whether it's state, local, et cetera. But all these things have to nest within each other so I finally uh, uh, have a way, uh, an excuse to use all the relationships up and down the ladder for international, national, regional, state, and local under this nested accounting system. And that's why we want to have this inter-alliance of municipalities agree so that we can have a data sharing that starts with something as altruistic as just the environment. Not, no competitive advantage of hoarding your environmental data you know, uh, in one way or another. So I think that's the, the, what I'm most proud of. And uh, the projects that we're working on right now, but like Gerard said, there's 50 that's, that are more relevant, you know, depending on the, the audience member. And the nugget of wisdom is um, research, stay curious, stay hungry, uh, be okay with failure, uh, and uh, just to keep at it, honestly. Um, so stay hungry, stay foolish. Well, thank you so much. I'll, I'll add my own. Um, again, this is a completely personal prediction. Um, but if you don't know what a data oracle is, I, I'd give that a Google. Um, and just some of the really cool applications, I, I think that, to my mind, like I didn't know what it was until a few years ago. And um, I, I interact with a lot of crypto and blockchain folks and sort of had an a internal limitation that's like, well, maybe this is going to be hard to scale because you have to have all the data on chain. Mm -hmm. And that goes right back to the, the problem of centralized data. It's like, what are we solving if you have to have all your data on chain where only a few companies, because it's, it's very um, resource intensive. And so this is just my own personal prediction, but um, data oracles are what um, you can have a, a separate pocket of data that will interact with a smart contract or a blockchain. Um, that allows you to develop an, a protocol or a solution without having to have the whole data set yourself. So when we get trusted sources of data, whether they're, you know, the DMV or something that they could, you know, use an identity layer or, or whatever. I just, as somebody in the ecosystem here, a lot of different folks, when I learned what a data oracle, it, it sort of got me really excited because it solves some of the scalability issues that we're currently facing. So suggest you give it a Google and, and go down that rabbit hole. And the word of advice I would have is just to realize we're people. You know, I think we're all incredibly excited by these things. Um, you know, but these are, are passion projects. There aren't a lot of uh, layers of government that are. So instead of being expressing all your frustration with, with what isn't perfect, I, I think we have to be very encouraging and patient with those people that are just coming on board. Um, seek out leaders in the space, but also be willing to be a translator for those that don't know. And I'll just conclude, well, I'll, I'll add, just say that you have to be ready to meet people where they're ready to have a conversation. 
you know, if they ask you a question about crypto or whatever and it's very elementary, you got to be willing to, to talk to them because they're real, literally reaching out to you as somebody that knows more. You know, a lot of condescending comments or crypto Twitter, you know, kind of, I think that kills a lot of enthusiasm and uh, would just really, really encourage that the cooperative, you know, kumbaya stuff is what, what really matters right now. Amen, 100%. And where you can do that is at the Roaring Twenties reception tomorrow night, right? It is, listen, I, I, I don't know how much you know about it, but I've been listening to the playlist. Kathy's been putting the playlist together for the last month. The music is gonna be incredible. If you haven't seen the venue, it's gorgeous. And uh, the, it's gonna be an experience. We're gonna have, a lot of the folks that are sort of experts in this field aren't coming to the daytime seminar, right? They're going to the evening reception. Uh, because that's where you're really going to meet a lot of the, the leaders in this space. And so, uh, and you've got a bunch of friends from Capitol Hill that are coming to the evening reception. Um, if you see Bill with, uh, with a pretty young lady, I want you to go up and really say complimentary things about Bill in front of her, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that for uh, the yeah. live video feed. But, yeah. uh... <laughs> just, just trying to help, Bill. <laughs> No, it's appreciated. But thank you so much for everyone uh, that's in the audience and at home watching. Um, and hopefully we see you tomorrow night. Thank you. Hey. I would start to tell a joke, but I don't know when they're going to go live. All right. So uh, again, my name is Gerard Dache, Executive Director of the Government Blockchain Association. I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, at our last event, we were fortunate enough to have uh, uh, folks there from the uh, uh, Embassy of Liechtenstein. In fact, we had the ambassador uh, show up. And, uh, and since then, we've developed a little bit of a relationship. I've actually been at the ambassador's home uh, in, in the last year or so. But, uh, that kind of opened it up a door, and we found out that uh, Thomas Dunsler is, was going to be here. And I just want to say a little bit about uh, Mr. Dunsler, uh, Dr. Dunsler. Um, 
he, he has co-authored uh, the Blockchain uh, Act, or the Black Blockchain Law for Liechtenstein. So they actually have done this about a year or two ago and have a year or two of actual real-world implementation. So uh, we have invited him, and he, he comes all the way from, from Liechtenstein to, uh, to share with you the experiences that his country has had. So with that, Dr. Dunsler, I'm, I'm ver very uh, happy to invite you to the stage. And good luck on using this. Everybody else has had to kind of figure it out for themselves. So. Okay, good luck. <laughs> I'll give my best. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, it's great to be here. So um, it's great that it's possible to, to meet you, in, uh, um, not virtually. And uh, so I'm a, I'm a trip um, through US in the last week. So it's, it's perfect to be here. And I'm talking uh, with, uh, about uh, our regulatory experience um, when creating the Blockchain Act in Liechtenstein and also um, what happened since then. So the Blockchain Act in Liechtenstein, we started to draft uh, this, this act in 2016 and it entered into force um, on the 1st of January 2020. So we have now a certain experience of, of um, how it works in practice. But maybe... Can you speak up? Yeah, okay. I stand here, so it's better? Okay. <laughs> Um, maybe uh, first uh, I start with uh, some, some uh, words about Liechtenstein because maybe not everybody of you has been in Liechtenstein before. So it's a, uh, it's a small country uh, in the center of Europe. It's only 160 square kilometers, so it's rather small. And we have only um, 40,000 uh, inhabitants. But the special thing about Liechtenstein is that we have um, as many jobs as inhabitants. So um, every day, um, half of our population comes in over the border and increases the pop population there. We are um, a constitutional, sorry, this was too fast, a constitutional monarchy, we have a prince and a parliament. Uh, and um, uh, Liechtenstein is famous for its uh, financial center, um, but we have also a very important in industry sector. So um, we are one of the most in industrialized countries in the world, 45% um, of our GDP is coming from. Uh, industry and 25 from uh, financial center. And we are also a member, no, this is really um, very, <laughs> very active. Uh, we are also a member of the EEA, the European Economic Area. So the financial market regulation is, um, is coming from Europe. Um, and this is also a, a reason why our act is, is done like this. So, uh, and this is a picture of Liechtenstein. Um, it was a picture of Liechtenstein. It's, um, so you have seen almost half of the country. Now we are at the right slide. So uh, if you talk about tokens, um, I mean, we, what we see now and what we have seen also in 2016 is that the uh, variety of applications of, of tokens are um, quite big. Oh, this is not, this is. Um, so, and uh, we have seen cryptocurrencies, we have seen utility coins, stable coins, and security tokens at that time. And the, the challenge from the regulatory point of view is that, now I have, um, the, the, the kind of applications, how we uh, use those tokens is, is very, very manifold. So um, the first three of them uh, can be used for initial coin offerings. Um, security tokens um, offerings are called STOs. You know that certainly uh, they can be used for payment purpose, uh, for trading uh, platforms, for uh, private investment, but also uh, for financial services. And this makes it a bit complicated from uh, to talk about blockchain and, and tokens. So every maybe. Are you controlling? Okay, so uh, press three times. One, two, three, four, five. Just um, until you see, so the animation was, <laughs> I didn't see that. So uh, the, the point is, um, if, you, if you look at the payment applications, uh, we have some challenges like, uh, is the, the banking law applicable or the taxation of, of um, utility coins, for example, or uh, AML, CFD, and sanction regimes, uh, are they applicable or not? Um, please further, and another. So uh, please go to the next slide. Yeah, the, 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 you can just skip the animations until every, every field is full. Thank you. Oh, that was too much, thank you. 
Uh, if you look at the trading platforms, we have other challenges. So uh, we have uh, the application, uh, our differential market laws of um, stock exchanges applicable. Um, uh, how are investors protected? Uh, questions about stability of financial market and also the application of AML um, laws and so on. Uh, next, please. But the, the big question still is and, and was also for, for us, uh, is this everything that is possible with blockchain? Um, and this next slide. And then we, when we started our um, working group, we have seen that, um, that there are a thousand of uh, other applications of, the, um, of tokens or blockchain that are possible. And one example uh, is the tokenization of art. So um, uh, you can tokenize, for example, the property right or exhi exhibition right, the lien, the copyrights, and use that as a, as a part of the digital economy. So um, you can use this token as a part of the proof of ownership uh, for digital contracts. So if you sell um, a piece of art, you can just exchange the money token versus the, um, the property right token um, and so on. So, uh, so uh, at this point, we come to, to uh, functions or services of the digital economy we know um, already. But um, the token is, is used as, a, as, a, as a, just a, an object in, the, in those uh, processes. Next slide, please. Um, another example is real estate. So um, uh, we could tokenize uh, property right, uh, usage right, a lien, a lien, a lien. So uh, we can use it for proof of ownership or to simplify the mortgage pro processes. Um, uh, for example, if uh, in the future I, I would, would rent an, an apartment for vacation, I could, just can do it by token, and so it can be done. Um, online without any, any um, um, just uh, process risk we, we see today. So uh, next slide, please. Another example is uh, uh, cars. So car leasing, car sharing can be used a token. You can uh, open a, a car door and start an engine with tokens. So there are th uh, tons of applications that are beyond the uh, things we are discussing now in the moment. Next slide, please. And another example is, for example, a drink voucher, just uh, simple applications that are uh, far away from uh, financial market applications, but are um, maybe um, it's, it's uh, good to have a, a blockchain technology for that. Next slide, please. So what we are talking about uh, with blockchain, to, to our opinion, is the um, a, a shift in our um, legal system in the future, so that. Um, the, the things that are possible only today in the physical economy, that it's uh, um, possible to exchange um, goods um, step by step. For example, if, you, uh, if I buy a bicycle uh, by another person, uh, we can exchange the bicycle and the money um, directly step by step and there is no transaction risk in between. Next slide, please. But in a, in a digital economy, um, we need another um, set up. But uh, with uh, blockchain technology, this is possible also in a digital economy. Um, so that, uh, for example, the, um, the bicycle, uh, the EID of the, uh, the identity of the bicycle is created. Uh, we have a property rights um, tokenized. And uh, then we have a digital contract um, that we, uh, where we agree that uh, we sell this uh, bicycle to the um, 200 dollar or euros. And, um, with this contract, and this is called smart contract, the both um, parts of this, this contract can be delivered, settled uh, directly by, uh, by the blockchain infrastructure. So, um, and at the end, we could also uh, tokenize the transportation rights so that the, um, the company that's delivering uh, this, this bicycle to me uh, can, can prove that it's um, allowed to, to transport this bicycle and um, when agreed that it's, uh, it's delivered, then um, the payment is, is settled. So, such are our visions of the token economy with blockchain. And this is far away from the concept of uh, only digital assets uh, than we are talking usually. And uh, uh, next slide, please. When, um, when we drafted our law, uh, we just wanted to cover those applications. And at the end, that's the vision of this, this kind of a, uh, a new legal layer of our digital economy that we have seen uh, when we drafted the law, is that um, you can uh, just put all, all bullet points. So that's, we, uh, we get a, a kind of a global peer-to-peer -peer transaction system of, of rights in, in tokenized objects. And so this is more a digital layer that is added to the uh, world economic, uh, economy, uh, economy. 
sorry. And if you look at the uh, Internet of Things, Internet of Machines, and Internet of Values, so those visions, they need some kind of, um, of uh, blockchain technology uh, and tokenization technology um, to, to be functioned properly. So the, the ability to transfer money um, on, a, um, on a program is, is essential for an Internet of Things. And the, the result of that is a high level of security um, for, for um, business processes worldwide can be applied to, to trade and so on. So, next slide, please. Yeah, and low transaction costs, of course. Yeah. And now we come to regulation. <laughs> and so sometimes um, the, the business people look at regulation as a, um, as a kind of a killer. So, um, one, one bon mot is that uh, you know, uh, the regulators are the no in innovation. Um, so, next slide, please. What's, what we did, with the Token Act in Liechtenstein, uh, we wanted to, to foster this development because we, we see an enormous potential uh, in this uh, development to the token economy. Um, so um, the first step we had to do is to, uh, to clarify the application of the financial market laws. So what um, application falls under the financial market laws and uh, what uh, does not fall uh, under the financial market laws? Second step was the classification of token. So just to, to define by law what is a token, um, I come later to that point. And the uh, third step is uh, we have introduced a token as a new element uh, in Liechtenstein law. That means we have, uh, it's now legally defined the term token uh, in our token act. The fourth step was uh, to regulate important service providers. Um, but sometimes the, the blockchain is seen as trustless technology and where no intermediary and no service provider is necessary anymore. Um, but if you look closer to, to the all applications in token economy, we see that many of um, service providers will be there and will be necessary for, uh, that uh, the, the token economy will be efficient. And, uh, and we regulated the most important service providers and in total it's about um, 11 roles that we have regulated. Uh, the, interesting thing is that we uh, have tried to make an innova innovation friendly way of regulation. That means that we have uh, introduced a role based approach. So the, we don't, did not regulate um, the, the uh, business models that we see today, but only functions. Um, so that's, um, for example, custody. And if somebody makes custody uh, on behalf of the clients, uh, it's, uh, he has this bears some, some risk and we have to regulate that but it does not matter which kind of uh, business model he's doing uh, besides of that, but if somebody does custody, uh, has to be regulated and has to comply with the law. And um, so in total, you can compose your, uh, your business model with the roles. So um, a, a crypto exchange, for example, has to, to cover about four roles uh, in this regulation, but then, of course, is really doing, uh, or this, this exchange is doing these this activities and has to be regulated. And so this is kind of a, innovation-friendly approach. Uh, another um, topic is the principles-based approach, uh, so that we do not regulate every detail, uh, which is quite common in our legal system and also more in the um, uh, civil law system. Uh, and this is something that is not innovation-friendly. So we try to make a principles-based approach uh, so that um, uh, technology, innovation, and, uh, and the dynamics we see there that do, is, are not hindered by, by regulation. And of course, uh, the, the last step was the clarification or the application of due diligence laws. Next slide, please. So uh, let's uh, move on to the legal classification of, um, of the token. So um, usually we talk about digital assets or crypto uh, money, cryptocurrency, uh, and this is applicable to uh, Bitcoin. This is uh, a purely virtual um, digital asset where it suits perfectly. But um, as soon as you think of a car, and uh, it, it becomes clear that the tokenization of a car uh, is another step. And this is the reason why we introduced the concept um, with the, what we call token container model. Um, so um, the token is seen as a container where, where we could put in any kind of rights of our legal system. So in the case of a car, we can uh, put in this container um, uh, just the, the property right of a car, the usage right of a car, uh, and, and this is um, uh, the, yeah, the meaning of this token. And so the, the token is meant to, um, as a representation of a, of, uh, of a right, but the token can also be um, empty. Um, 
And this refers uh, to the concept of Bitcoin, for example. Next slide, please. So in, in this, uh, this slide, you can just uh, click three times, I think. Yeah, so, so the, um, with this concept of, of the token, we were able to, to cover all kinds of applications um, that we see today, like uh, the, the digital assets, um, crypto assets, but also the future applications when um, uh, it's about tokenization of, of physical items. So um, a currency can be the right to, to get um, banknotes, for example. A security is the right to vote or to, to get dividends from a company or uh, interest payments, uh, a voucher is the right to, to get a good. Um, uh, um, and we talked about the car and so on. So this, this concept is, is able to cover every application and therefore we int introduced this token as a new element in, in Liechtenstein law. Next slide. And this means, um, and this is kind of, of solving the problem uh, of, of, of the classification. So uh, if you, um, with the token container model approach, uh, it's, um, it's clear that not automatically uh, the financial market laws are applicable if you talk about token. So uh, of course, if you talk about the security and the financial instrument, financial market laws will apply. But if you talk about currency, um, uh, the, the system of, of um, uh, exchanges and, um, and financial market laws are not applicable, maybe the banking laws. But uh, if you talk uh, about the tokenized voucher or tokenized war warranty, we have other laws that are applicable. If you talk about IP rights that are tokenized, if it, uh, for example, uh, with the music, um, then uh, the IP laws of our country are applicable. So uh, this solves kind of the, the problem that not every token or not every application is, is uh, meaningful uh, to be covered with financial market laws. Next slide, please. And, and the next step we did uh, in our regulation is the, the, the legal status of tokens. So we have introduced a new civil law of tokens so the, to answer the, the just fundamental questions uh, that are raised if you, if you own a token. For example, um, can a token be owned? Can a token be stolen? Um, can a token be transferred to a delegate? What are the legal implications? Can a token be pledged? Um, the legal protection of token buyer uh, and so on. The last question is also important, is it possible to cancel a token? So um, if you think only um, to Bitcoin, uh, it's not, not possible to, to cancel a Bitcoin because it's money. Uh, but if you think um, at the security, it's necessary. If you lose the, um, the access rights to a um, security, it's, it's necessary to, to, uh, to have the right to cancel that also with a token and uh, to issue a new uh, security token, for example. Next slide, please. So. Um, maybe, uh, can you uh, get back uh, to the last slide? Thank you. So the, um, what we did in, in our law is to create a new level of, um, of um, uh, the concept of ownership as a, uh, and, and um, possession. So, um, and a new term for ownership of token and possession of tokens uh, to be clear that it's uh, something different uh, compared to property law. Um, so um, this is necessary if you want to uh, tokenize um, um, physical items, it's necessary to have a different concept. Next slide, please. The roles we have regulated are uh, mentioned on this slide. So we have um, uh, the token generator, token issuer, uh, the, the custody roles or depository roles, uh, exchange service providers. But I think one of the, the most important uh, role for the, for the token economy is about the physical validator. So if you um, want to tokenize um, a piece of art, um, and uh, somebody wants to, to sell it to you um, just uh, without showing you the piece of art. You need a kind of a trust system um, that, you, that the, the buyer is, is able to trust uh, that the piece of art is, is still there and it's the, that's the right one. And that's the role of the physical validator. So we try to implement a, a setting where um, the, the legal certainty in that, that sector is, is um, enhanced. So this is an overview of all, about all chapters of the Token Act. So we have the civil law of the token, we have the supervision of service providers, uh, some, a section about the basic information sheet is kind of a, um, a new um, prospectus regime for, um, for tokens. Um, we have a segment about answer, uh, digital shares, uh, so uncertificated rights, that's a, a proper name, and also about email uh, duties of, of uh, service providers. Thank you. Um, maybe another important point 
uh, to, to be mentioned is the European markets and crypto assets regime that is now in discussion. Uh, there will be an enhancement of our token act, so the, the financial market um, applications of, of tokens are now regulated in this, um, uh, in this new law that is uh, applicable uh, throughout Europe. So the, a, a kind of a legal security in, uh, throughout Europe is established, which is uh, very important uh, for, for the market. Um, so you see there uh, the, the financial markets regulation is now evolving uh, in Europe, um, and so it's uh, just the a dual concept of the token act uh, with a civil law that is necessary that, uh, to, re to be regulated in every country uh, and the, the pan-European uh, regulation of, of um, financial market application. Yes? Um, how's the time? Do, do I have um, some time to expand? Okay, so uh, please go back to the last slide. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that um, the European regulator decided to, to introduce uh, some concepts also from, from our token act. So the token container model is basically took over. Um, so and the, um, the role-based regulation, the principles-based regulation is also um, at least partially taken over so that <clears throat> the, the crypto asset providers like um, the placing of crypto assets or trading of crypto assets, trading platforms, are regulated um, in, in roles so that it's easier for innovation uh, to be uh, covered in, in that regime. Um, uh, Europe has also um, uh, plans to, to introduce the concept of e-money tokens, which is um, about stable coins uh, with the backing of, of fiat currencies, and um, the regulation of stable coins um, like uh, Libra or DM is, is one example. And uh, one important part is also the uh, the pilot regime for financial instrument tokens. So uh, if you tokenize a uh, financial instrument, it still um, uh, it, it falls under the financial market laws, but um, they solve a problem in the secondary market so that it's possible to have a, a tokenized um, market for, for uh, digital securities. And this is also a very important step uh, for the development of this market. So then uh, I'm at the end of this presentation. Thank you. All right, guys, I have the pleasure to announce that we are sh uh, shifting now to our keynote speaker, uh, Derek Conan, who is the Director of Policy for the Blockchain Research Institute. Is that correct? Blockchain. Bitcoin policy. Bitcoin. <laughs> I told you I'd mess it up. All right, come on up here. Correct me. <laughs> Thank you everyone for sticking around till 5 p.m. I've been to many conferences and I remember the 5 p.m. club, the few, the proud, the ones who stick around. Hope you guys weren't here since uh, 9 a.m. Hope you're entertained enough to stay to the end. 
Uh, we don't have a clicker, so my colleague Grant over there is going to be on uh, clicker duty. And uh, away we go. I just wanted to start off by, um, by thanking uh, the organization here for that gracious introduction and to thank the, government, the Blockchain Association for hosting this conference. Uh, as we all know, in the past year, issues related to blockchain, crypto, and mining have become topical and under increased scrutiny. That makes a conference like this here today even more important. My name is Derek Khanna. I've been interested in Bitcoin and crypto for quite a while. Uh, about 10 years ago, I first encountered Bitcoin, and I've been initially engaged in some of the initial conversations in Congress on Bitcoin and other policy discussions um, in other places. I've been particularly excited with how crypto allows average people to come together and operate collectively. I think we're on the next slide, Grant. Next one. Uh, this is a company that I had before, uh, which was Draftly, uh, to just highlight what it was like to operate collectively as a whole without crypto. Um, and that's why I've been so interested in this uh, crypto world. But in the past few years, the conversation on crypto has shifted increasingly negative, focusing on the environmental costs of Bitcoin. I was particularly concerned by the environmental harm, and I've tried to evaluate these questions to help more concretely separate the fact from the fiction, wherever the facts led us. We are here today to talk about Bitcoin and the environment. Bitcoin, as many of you know, makes up about 60% of market cap of cryptocurrency. It also makes up the vast majority of transactions and essentially any other indicator that you may use. For years, criticisms of Bitcoin's energy use have made the headlines. It's become a common trope in the media, something cited but rarely understood or investigated. They say Bitcoin uses as much energy as Argentina. Statements like this uh, intend to shed a light on these questions, and they are a legitimate concern, but they do so without offering a fair comparison, and when taken out of context, they are misleading. As many, for many of you, the environmental impact may be the main issue that you have with Bitcoin today. You may see the benefit of a decentralized currency as offering an alternative to the fiat money system, but you may ask, how can I reconcile that with its environmental costs? Well, I'm here to address your concerns because it's likely true that much of what you have heard about Bitcoin and the environment is wrong. Now, originally the Bitcoin community, as many of you know, was commonly defined by its libertarian ethos. But today, to the extent that was ever true, it is now superseded by events. Bitcoin is not that stereotype anymore, if it ever was. Bitcoin is commonly held by Hispanics, African Americans, and other minority groups. It includes many people of different diverse political perspectives, including those who take the environment seriously. And that's where I come in. And I'm here to have a more nuanced conversation on Bitcoin in the environment, to separate the facts from the fiction. So today, this evening, for those who stuck around till the 5 p.m. hour, we will be discussing proof of work and how it is a central innovation. We will be rebutting misleading media information on Bitcoin. We will be explaining how Bitcoin can redefine and vitalize our green energy system. We will be sharing real world examples of how crypto mining is already a pro-green technology. And we will be discussing how banning Bitcoin technology isn't really possible anyways. Then we will be examining the energy impact of Bitcoin in the context of the value that it expends. All right, starting at the very beginning, first principles. Well, I think this is particularly important to do because everyone talks about Bitcoin. They use phrases like proof of work. They use phrases like proof of stake. Sometimes we have to go back to first principles. Now, as many of you know, Bitcoin is a decentralized currency without a central bank or central administrator that can be sent from user to user without an intermediary. Now, in developing such a system, Satoshi encountered two central problems. How do you issue money fairly on this network? How do you trust people to not manipulate the network to their advantage? And Satoshi's innovation was proof of work. I mention this because increasingly on energy conversations, people will say, why do we even need proof of work? We need to go back to the context of proof of work as a central innovation. Proof of work is a consensus mechanism that requires network me members 
miners to expend energy to propose and order transactions on the network, and then for nodes to validate those transactions once they are so ordered. Then, to do so, uh, the computer solves a randomly generated puzzle and is rewarded with a set amount of Bitcoin, which is how new money is issued into the network. Now, why does Bitcoin run on this proof of work system? Well, the energy expenditure to propose and order transactions and the fact that thousands of nodes run on the network to validate those transactions is the innovation that makes it very hard to manipulate or attack it. This allows people to trust the network without a central party to manage it, which is, in most ways, fundamentally different from every other prior financial system. Bitcoin is the first global monetary system where this new money issuance is distributed based upon a fair, open market competition. This is truly revolutionary, and it's a key reason why Bitcoin uses the energy-intensive model of proof of work. Now let's examine the alternatives briefly. Well, an alternative is appointing a single authority. This is what happens with the Federal Reserve. Or granting certain users special access to money issuance. This is what commonly happens in proof of stake. Proof of work has created a novel system that allows for anyone, anywhere in the world, to compete for Bitcoin's in issuance. This decentralized system ensures that no individual person has special privilege. This is very unlike our current financial system with its distinctive advantages for gatekeepers and the wealthy. It's also unlike proof of stake blockchains, which typically require users to hold a certain amount of money or dedicate specific computing resources to compete for new issuance, which tends to, again, advantage wealthy participants. These users are often essentially privileged within the network. In short, proof of work democratizes a global financial network. It allows from anyone anywhere in the world to mine Bitcoin. Miners just have to follow the rules and provide computation. As such, energy usage is inherent to the value of Bitcoin. Thus, Bitcoin does not waste energy. Rather, this energy is used for computational work, which is how the network itself functions. All right, we talked about basics. Now let's examine how the media evaluates Bitcoin today. While the system inherently requires energy usage for the reasons I already stated, media predictions have been pretty erratic on Bitcoin's future and continued energy usage. For example, Newsweek predicted that by 2020, Bitcoin mining would consume all the world's energy. Um, if we could flip to the, the slide with the Newsweek one. The interesting thing about the Newsweek prediction is that the Newsweek prediction was made in 2017, three years before 2020. Anyone know what the actual percentage is today? Any other guesses? Point one. All right, pretty good guesses. Best estimate seems to be about 0.27%, at least in 2021, less than 1%. The World Economic Forum claimed in 2017 that by 2020, Bitcoin would consume more power than the entire rest of the world. Again, off by an order of magnitude of 200. Now, how does the media keep messing this up? Well, in part, I sympathize with them. It's actually a difficult question to answer, which I've encountered in the past year working on this problem. And the problem is made more difficult with shoddy academic research. Some of the most widely cited and foundational academic research on the topic, specifically on mining and Bitcoin, is from this paper by Mora et al. and is the one cited by Newsweek and the World Economic Forum. Uh, we flip to... You've seen a lot of these news articles, I'm sure. There we go, the, the Moore article. Uh, so this Moore article is widely cited. It's the basis of almost all of these other articles, except it's been widely disproven. And it was published in Nature Climate Change, one of the highest rated uh, climate journals. Except when it was de debunked, it was actually debunked within climate, uh, climate change and other outlets including by uh, experts saying that it should not be, it's fundamentally flawed, so sufficiently flawed, and it should not be taken seriously by researchers, policymakers, or the general public. Yet this study continues to be cited even today. Uh, now, again, I'm not saying this is a simple question, but we can't rely upon faulty research to get to the answers that we're seeking. 
This study in particular has a series of misunderstandings. It uses a per transaction energy cost, which we'll talk about more, as typically being fundamentally flawed. Now that phrase of a per transaction energy cost is often repeated not just by the media, but even the US Congress. Uh, two weeks ago at the January 20th Energy Committee hearing, uh, the hearing memo said, quote, the energy required for a Bitcoin transaction could power a home for more than 70 days. Again, using this concept of a per transaction energy cost. We will talk about that because Bitcoin's energy use is not primarily related to the number of transactions. Instead, its energy usage comes from mining, at least almost entirely, which is energy spent to keep the network secure and running. Again, we will delve into that more substantively because it's actually a very critical and complicated question that we need to address. All right, so I mentioned the stat on how Bitcoin uses as much energy uh, as the entire country of Argentina. You may have heard other stats. Um, basically any Nordic country will do. It uses a lot of energy you hear, but so do domestic use of uh, dryer tumblers or residential air conditioners. Almost any device used at scale uses a tremendous amount of energy and often more than relatively smaller countries. Saying that something uses as much energy as a random country sounds scary, but it actually doesn't tell you very much about how much energy that thing is using. For example, Bitcoin mining accounts for, as we said, roughly 0.27% of global energy production. But the gold industry uses more, albeit with a higher volume, and has other economic implications. But yet people typically don't say gold mining uses as much energy as Argentina. So let's, let's evaluate some of these misconceptions that we're seeing on the environmental question. First misconception, if you are assuming that Bitcoin is having a massive economic implication, you probably aren't aware that renewables account for the largest share of Bitcoin's energy use around the world. And this matters a lot because when evaluating the environmental impact, it's a very relevant question and it's an oversimplification just to focus on the amount of energy. 100 megawatts of energy from coal is much worse than 100 megawatts of energy from solar and it's arguably worse than 1,000 megawatts of energy from solar. So the question is, where does the energy come from that goes into Bitcoin mining? And you can see from this chart, it's about 56% renewable. Now it's difficult to get the stat. There are a few stats that are slightly deviating from it, but in general, it's significantly more sustainable, sustainable meaning including nuclear power, than the broader energy mix in most places of the world, including the United States. So why? why why is this? Is this because Bitcoin miners are members of the Sierra Club? I mean, that may be the case, but that's not really what's going on here. It's economics. As most things, economics is what's going to drive actual structural changes in the economy. Miners are seeking out the cheapest energy available. Renewable energy operations often generate more power than they could possibly use. They generate more power than they can store or sell to the grid. And this drives prices low or even negative during these periods of mismatch. Now, following China's ban on Bitcoin mining, miners flock to places like West Texas, where renewables generate roughly three times as much energy as can be stored or transmitted in the average year. Today, according to some estimates, renewables account for approximately 56% of energy pr production, as seen here. More, pre more pre precisely, 56% is sustainable. For comparison, the U.S. grid is approximately 21% sustainable for energy consumption. This fact has gone largely unnoticed. In fact, it's gone unnoticed even by crypto advocates. In July 2001, after initially accepting Bitcoin and having Bitcoin on the balance sheet for Tesla, Elon Musk suspended payment of Bitcoin, saying that he wanted to be sure that Bitcoin was over 50% renewable. Never mind the fact that Bitcoin has likely already reached this benchmark. Well, here's what's particularly interesting about this. Let's do an energy mix, any energy comparison to the energy mix powering those Teslas. Well, 80% of Tesla charging is done at home, and for the average American, 21% of their energy is renewable. Thus meaning, Bitcoin has by far a greener energy mix than for those Teslas. Yet, 
Tesla is held as the standard bearer for greenification of the economy, and Bitcoin is often made out to be a villain. We should ask Mr. Musk, does that mean that Teslas must be put on hold until the energy used to charge them is more than 50% renewable? That's a great question. That's why I asked it. We tweeted at Elon Musk uh, several weeks ago asking this very question. We got other people to retweet it. We haven't got an answer yet, but I think if the people in this audience uh, would do me the favor of retweeting that or tweeting your own question li or line to it, we may actually get an answer. Second, second point to make tonight. Bitcoin energy is not just more green than other users. It is increasingly so. That 56% renewable statistic is not static. The renewable portion is increasing rapidly. Bitcoin mining, and this is because Bitcoin mining, as already alluded to, is a unique consumer of technology. If you think about it, it's particularly strange. It can be done anywhere in the world with access to the internet, with electricity and some basic hardware. It can be done 24 seven or during certain hours or even for a few seconds. This makes Bitcoin mining extremely unusual as an energy consumer. For example, data centers, potentially the closest analog, they have to be somewhat co-located with delivery of the data. Whereas Bitcoin mining could happen on the space station. A main input for mining, as you all know, of course, is the cost of the energy. If the energy is too expensive, then mining will not be profitable. Again, for that day, for that week, for that minute. If it's cheap, or if the energy is free, or if the energy is negative, then it can become profitable. Increasingly, smart grids providing real-time pricing. We are seeing free and we are seeing negative pricing for energy. Why? Because if the grid has too much energy, they have to shut it off. They have to shut off access. They actually have to get rid of the excess energy. Now, given that mining is location agnostic, economic actors will favor the cheapest energy. And there is no cheaper energy than when the sun shines or the wind is blowing too strong. More precisely, when it is shining or blowing too strong for the energy demand at that precise moment. In fact, for safety, the grid needs to shed this excess energy. Considering that Bitcoin mining trends towards the most affordable energy anywhere in the world, and the cheapest energy is most often renewable energy, as can be seen here from the Bloomberg New Energy Finance article, logically, the energy mix will continue shifting towards renewables. All right, next point. This actually is my favorite. I'm not sure if this has been articulated uh, anywhere else. Um, so excited to present to this audience this today, which is in all the rhetoric about Bitcoin mining, people talk about it like the energy is fundamentally lost. And that makes sense when we talk about energy for planes or for cars. Yeah, the energy is lost. But what we're gonna find out today is that for Bitcoin mining, it's actually slightly different. And this is essentially an error when looking at the energy consumption because energy used for mining is not the same as jet fuel for a plane. Why is this so? To mine Bitcoin, typically speaking, it involves powerful computers with ASIC chips to solve these cryptographic puzzles, which involve computational power. I'm sure you're all familiar. That requires electricity. But since electricity does not get converted to movement, and since under basic physics principles, all energy must be conserved, that energy is converted to heat. As competition for Bitcoin mining has increased, today, mining is typically done on an industrial scale. At this level, recapturing the heat is not only possible, it is increasingly necessary for the economics to work. And early on, Bitcoin's pseudonymous inventor, Satoshi Nakamoto, realized this, predicted it. He realized that if Bitcoin mining were to, he, he, he predicted that Bitcoin mining could help replace existing sources of heat. And in so doing, it would require no additional power. This recapturing of heat energy is a huge deal because it means that the energy used in Bitcoin mining is not inherently wasted. Only the energy that cannot be recaptured is lost. And waste energy recovery can be around 50% efficient, significantly reducing the actual net energy used by Bitcoin. 
Now what I'm talking about may seem theoretical. Maybe you've never heard of it before. Let's see it in the real world today. Because what I'm talking about is not theoretical. Let's go to North Vancouver. Has anyone been to North Vancouver? I'm a big skier, I wanna to go to North Vancouver. Uh, maybe my team will fly me out to North Vancouver, Vancouver. Because in 2019, the city of North Vancouver passed a motion to increase its greenhouse gas reduction targets to achieve net zero by 2050. How to do it? Well, one of their solutions was Bitcoin mining. Part of the strategy involved a partnership with Mint Green to use excess heat from Bitcoin mining to heat city buildings or to use that heat for sea salt production. We can, I think we have a, a, some slides on how, how this whole process works. We've got the ASIC, ASICs, we've got the boilers. Next slide. Next slide. And that's not the only example. We have Bitcoin mining being used to warm greenhouses. We have Bitcoin mining being used to distill whiskey. We have the uh, captured methane, methane from pig waste being used to run miners, waste, methane that would have already been um, flared. And another example of this in action that we can learn from within the economy is data centers. So again, data centers use a tremendous amount of energy. And similarly, data centers convert that energy to heat. Data centers, their energy impact is much larger than Bitcoin. So we can see what data centers are already doing as a precursor of what Bitcoin is going to do and is already doing. And within data centers, particularly we can study the Stockholm data park model in Sweden where this heat is currently today being recaptured at scale. Now why is this a big deal? What can we do with all that heating? Well, globally heating accounts for 40% of energy related carbon emissions, so significant that climate advocates have argued for only electronic heating systems, one of which is commonly known as a heat pump. The Sierra Club estimates that installing heat pumps will reduce heating emissions by more than 45% in the next 10 years. Again, which is of the 40% of energy-related carbon emissions. Now, what if those heat pumps included a Bitcoin mining device? Well, not only did Satoshi recommend something similar, but there's a company already doing that today. Let's flip back to the previous one, if you can flip back. I think it's interesting to actually recognize Satoshi in his own words talking about this. The heat from your computer is not wasted if you use it to heat your home. It sounds pretty fantastical. Who's gonna do that? But this next one, maybe the consumer would buy a heating product that actually does that for them. You could flip to the next slide. You can go to this company right now, Wise Mining. They explain uh, how, how it all works. It's pretty fascinating. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a good little infographic. Use the energy from hot water versus use the energy from Bitcoin mining. Um, that's another product you can buy. If you go back to that one for a second. Uh, a water boiler, Sato. All right, next thing to examine. As I already alluded to, the concept of a per transaction cost for Bitcoin often fundamentally misunderstands how Bitcoin works. And that's because energy use does not scale linearly. I wanna repeat that for a second. Bitcoin use energy, Bitcoin's energy usage does not scale linearly. That means that if you doubled the number of Bitcoin transactions today, energy usage would not go up by twice as much. It would not go up by 50% as much. It would not go up by 25% as much. Do you see what I'm saying here? It is important to understand this fact. We need to examine why this is the fact in order to understand the future of energy usage from Bitcoin. At the same time that I say that, however, I want to be careful of my language. More transactions over time and under various scenarios is likely to increase energy use. That part is true, but not linearly, and that part matters. So let's delve into that. I may even stop to, if you have questions on that, because it is important. Uh, and this is a common trope that we hear in the media. We have Eric uh, Halthus saying, he's a top climate journalist, at current consumption rates, Bitcoin could never replace the global financial system. He claims that Bitcoin would need more energy than exists in the entire world just to power the network. 
Bill Gates, who I normally enjoy his comments, said something very similar. And he said it recently, last year. Bitcoin uses more energy per transaction than any other method knows, known to man. Both of these statements and the Newsweek prediction are based upon taking the current energy usage of Bitcoin and then dividing by the number of transactions. And for Halthus, he takes the value and extrapolates it to account for all transactions globally into the future, multiplying out how many times Bitcoin would need to expand. Now, myself, coming from a consulting background, this is a common technique used in accounting or used in business strategy, uh, except it's just wrong here. These lines of reasoning are fundamentally flawed because they assume that the amount of energy Bitcoin uses scales linearly with the adoption, as we already talked about. As an example of linearity, it uses a certain amount of energy for 100 transactions, 200 transactions would be double, but it's not that simple. And the reason is because the energy usage does not scale linearly because the vast majority of energy, almost all energy in the network today, is used for mining. And mining is for the creation of new blocks, new currency to the Bitcoin network. And it uses slack capacity to handle the transactions. Thus, the main analysis of the future of increased transaction levels would be to forecast mining into the future under those scenarios. Now, there are, however, limiting factors through this increase. So Halthus is talking about if we had enough transactions for the entire global financial system. There are limiting factors within the Bitcoin network to get that large. There are limiting factors on the number of blocks. And these limiting factors somewhat limit the ability of Bitcoin to completely replace the global financial system. And that should be acknowledged, but it should be caveated because that's not a sophisticated analysis of the situation at all. It is true that at the base layer of Bitcoin, there are not enough blocks for that level of volume. But if we think about that hypothetical for a second, if Bitcoin were to scale to the level of the entire global financial system, the Bitcoin community would have two options. One, a hard fork to increase the number of blocks to accommodate this scenario, which would increase computation amount, but not linearly. Or, much more likely, they would rely upon second layer applications, such as the Lightning Network, which is increasingly becoming the standard for Bitcoin transactions. And in practice, today Lightning is already widely and commonly almost exclusively used for most Bitcoin transactions. Sorry, not almost exclusively, very commonly used. This concept of the second layer for those who have been around for long enough may know, it's quite similar, at least in concept and terminology, in how the internet works with various layers. Now with Lightning, one transaction on the Bitcoin network can confirm up to a million payments at a time. This is able to scale, either in the current configuration of Lightning or in one in the future, to accommodate all global transactions. This increase in Lightning would have a cost. I want to realize that. I'm not saying this is a zero cost proposition, but that cost has nothing to do with the current cost of the Bitcoin network because the Bitcoin network is almost exclusively Bitcoin mining. Nonetheless, even if we disregard the layer two applications, those quotes are still misleading because Bitcoin would not stay constant in that scenario. All right, another thing to, to share on Bitcoin being more pro environment than you may suppose. Methane flares. In North Dakota, Equinor and Enerplus have used flared gas to mine Bitcoin. Crusade Energy contends that its mining system can deal with, it can avoid two thirds of the methane emissions that would occur if, as is the alternative, the gas were vented or flared. North Dakota and Wyoming recently passed laws giving tax breaks to producers to provide uh, gas to cryptocurrency and other data miners that would already be otherwise be flared, again, cutting two thirds of methane emissions. Next slide. You may have heard the analogy that Bitcoin is like a battery. Well, this isn't entirely true, but there are similarities and those similarities and disparities are worth exploring. Disparities, while Bitcoin cannot store energy, you cannot recover it, it can monetize excess energy production especially energy that would otherwise go unused if not for Bitcoin mining. 
When the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, as already said, wind and solar are the cheapest forms of energy. But they often can't provide, or to some experts, they can never provide, base load. And they can't easily time shift for demand curve spikes that don't exactly line up with wind and solar. This may require expensive batteries, reliance on dirty energy, overbuilding to handle the situations, or other cumbersome situations like pumping water up a mountain. But when firms are able to tap into either new battery alternatives or something like Bitcoin mining, it can change the economics. If a company can mine Bitcoin in times of low energy demand, but where they have abundant supply, then it allows for overbuilding or investing in other forms of batteries to supplement. That's a big deal. Next, uh, next slide. The last thing I want to talk about today, uh, on a piece of mis misinformation, is almost all the analysis on Bitcoin's energy usage. We've already talked about how it's more green than most forms of energy already existing and that the composition of the energy matters more than the amount of the energy. We've already talked about how it's not going to increase linearly in the future. But it's important to recognize that the equation is actually more complicated than that. Because if Bitcoin transactions are displacing some other transaction, then what you actually should be evaluating is the delta, the increased marginal, the marginal increase in energy usage from the customer changing their activity to use Bitcoin as opposed to the alternative. And in fact, when this analysis has been done, it's actually been quite illustrative. So let's break down what's actually occurring within the Bitcoin network. As a general matter, Bitcoin transactions, Bitcoin investments, Bitcoin speculation, everything you've heard about with Bitcoin, I propose goes into roughly four categories of human behavior. Category one, store of value, long-term holder of value or wealth creation protection, like a bank account. Some may argue, not the best bank account. I'm just saying it's a form of human behavior. Second section option, long-term speculation, long-term investment, or otherwise day trading investment. Some may call this speculation. My colleagues would call this investment. Everything in that category. Third category, day-to-day -day payments with Bitcoin like you would use your credit card or you would use cash to buy a coffee. And fourth type of transaction is large transfers more akin to a swift uh, wire transfer or a check. That could be me paying my international employees on a monthly basis. That could be remittances back to my family in another country or buying something substantial like a house or a car. Now, for these four categories of ac actions of human behavior, if there was no Bitcoin or cryptocurrency alternative, the counterfactual, what that customer would have already done, would still involve energy. So the relevant analysis is actually the delta between the analog behavior and the Bitcoin enabled in behavior. Uh, as a lawyer, we would call this the but for analysis. What is the delta of those two? And the delta is what matters. It also matters if you have a induced demand curve. If more people would have speculated versus if there did not exist at all. Those are the two factors, the increase in behavior and the delta between the analog behavior. So let's examine these four factors of human behavior. Long term, the first is the uh, as a holder of value. Sorry, we don't have that many slides on it, so you're just gonna have to look at me and follow along. Okay, so if people didn't buy Bitcoin to secure and hold as a store of value, maybe they would buy gold. Well, how green is gold trading? Well, for more energy is used by the gold industry approximately 60 to 70 percent more than for Bitcoin mining. And that energy isn't capturable. Further, as many of you know, gold is a dirty business in other ways to the environment. Why? Because gold has to be mined and removed from the ground. Now, where is it mined? The number one location for mining is China. The number two location is Russia, not countries known for their environmental protection. Gold, weighing a lot, is then transported from that mine to a vault or a secure location with special weighted vehicles. It is then transferred when they need to move for physical custody changes. It needs to be in special buildings with huge vaults made out of more metal. And then it's protected, perhaps, with cameras running on electricity, 
other protection systems, maybe electronic wires, armed guards, and heated facilities for those armed guards, with computers, networks, and digital systems to maintain those facilities. I'm not an expert on this. My knowledge mainly comes from Goldfinger, but you get the picture. This is not environmentally free. Second use case, as an investment or speculation. Okay, so not all people are investing in gold. Let me rain on the next scenario. You may say that instead of buying gold, they would speculate, invest, choose your language in equities with stock. Great question. According to a recent analysis, regular equity investments have a carbon emission profile to consider. In fact, quote, there is lower carbon intensity for Bitcoin than the average asset in a typical equities portfolio. Let's consider that for a second. If somebody took the money that they had in Bitcoin and instead transferred it to an average equity, we would expect for their, Bitcoin, their environmental impact to decline. So if it's one or the other, if you had to choose between buying a stock, there's evidence to suggest that Bitcoin is actually greener. Next scenario, let's talk about day-to-day -day payments, buying coffee. Well, when you swipe your Visa credit card, we all know how inefficient that is, how expensive it is for the merchant, but it only uses a tiny bit of energy for that swipe, right? Well, what happens before and after that transaction? Well, the money has to move from your bank account to another bank account. That involves authorization steps, clearing steps, and more until you get to a settlement. And throughout this complex process, there's an entire system that needs to be supported. Computers to run these transactions, computers to monitors the, monitor the computers, servers to watch for intruders. These transactions are overseen by real people, real people in offices. You have materials to create these massive bank buildings across the country, across the world. The heating and cooling of these buildings and gas used to transport physical goods across from one bank to another. Now you may say, well, these are marginal costs, but they are real costs. And again, if we're going to compare consumer behavior of their Visa credit card, they need to be taken into account. There aren't buildings uh, that need to be heated and cooled the same way for the individuals for Bitcoin. It's the Bitcoin mining equation, which we're already taking into account. Bitcoin mining expert Nick Carter put it best. Bitcoin is a complete self-contained monetary settlement system. Visa transactions are non-final credit transactions that rely on external underlying settlement rails. This entire system, is my proposition, uses a massive amount of energy, and it requires more analysis to find out exactly how much. But suddenly, the environmental impact of Bitcoin starts to make a lot more sense in the context of how our global monetary network system actually works. Next scenario, large scale checks, SWIFTs, bank transfer transfers. Until recently, the Federal Reserve had to operate its own airplane fleet. This airplane fleet physically flew checks across the country. While today, due to changes in regulation and technology, checks do not typically have to be physically exchanged, more analysis needs to be done how bank checks in the SWIFT network also has energy implications. Because under the SWIFT network, according to the Financial Times, transfers pass through multiple banks before reaching their final destination, making them time-consuming, costly, and lacking transparency. These transactions in SWIFT happen through 10,000 financial institutions in 200 countries. Again. Those 10,000 financial institutions have servers, they have to have duplicate ledgers, they have to have offices, personnel, and heating. That's part of the equation. All right, next section. How Bitcoin can actually help the environment. So now we have examined some ways that the narrative on Bitcoin is more complex than media or the politicians often discuss. Let's next understand the overall energy mix and how Bitcoin mining may incentivize renewables and promote the development of a stronger grid. Well, as mentioned, Bitcoin mining has a unique energy demand profile. Its miners are portable. They can offer in a wide range of geographies, climates, even without a, uh, a, a typical grid connection. They're especially price sensitive as part of a global zero sum market. They are deployable at scale and they are interoperable and, interoperable and flexible. Now, interestingly, because older and newer machines have different profitability profiles, 
Bitcoin is especially well suited in filling key niches in the energy system and developing symbiotically with renewable producers. Mining in very non-obvious ways may be a powerful tool to shift the change from an energy system from a dirty one to one based on renewable sources. Additionally, as already implied, it creates a profit mechanism for waste methane cleanup. And as prices stabilize, at least some portion of energy miners may replace large heating elements. All right, next section. Bitcoin may be powerful in accelerating the shift to an energy system based upon renewables. Why? Because energy needs to be at or below a certain cost threshold in order for Bitcoin mining to be profitable. If it's above that threshold, mining doesn't make much financial sense. And miners simply shut down their systems. As such, miners will seek out the cheapest form of energy in order to maximize their profits. In the United States and increasingly around the world, renewables, as I already said, are often the cheapest source of energy. Renewables have an issue, however, that limits utilization. It is very hard to create a base load to meet the man curve only using renewables. So here's where we're at. Renewables today are vitally, vitally important, but they're somewhat underutilized because of unreliability, lack of profitability. Now, if renewables were more not reliable, more profitable, then it's likely that more energy grids would utilize even more wind, solar, and other forms of renewable energy as their primary sources of usable energy. This is where Bitcoin comes in. Companies that produce excess energy can mine Bitcoin with that energy to make up for lost revenue. Firms can make a conscious choice to overbuild renewable facilities, knowing that they will likely produce significant amounts of excess energy, except that that excess energy will not be wasted. They can instead utilize the energy through Bitcoin mining. This can be the difference between a profitable and unprofitable energy production operation. And in theory, areas with an abundance of energy production will be incentivized to build even more renewable projects because they can subsidize them with Bitcoin mining. This is how Bitcoin can have a role in solving our energy crisis, our global warming price crisis. Now, what I'm talking about sounds theoretical. Again, let's see it in the real world. I have a few projects here that you may not be familiar with. First project, Lancium in Texas. Lancium raised $150 million to build Bitcoin mines, Bitcoin mining facilities in West Texas that run on renewable energy. It also helps them provide grid stability. Now, right now, Texas has some of the country's highest winds. Texas is known for their cheap solar electricity. Despite this, renewables only make up 26% of Texas electricity. Reliability and profit issues stop that number from budging much higher. Sustainability energies, su sustainable energy, aside from nuclear, struggle to provide that base load needed for the Texas grid. But with operations like Lancium, this calculus begins to change. When there is excess energy produced in Texas, Lancium will collect the energy and use it for Bitcoin mining, helping to avoid the wasted energy supply. Their mining sites currently have 2,000 megawatts of capacity, 10 times the amount of energy needed to power downtown Dallas. As the CEO of Lancium put it best, Bitcoin mining is a fundamentally decarbonizing technology. Next example, the Virunga National Park in the Congo. Forget the slide on that one. In 2014, the European Union helped finance a 15 megawatt hydroelectric plant in a small tributary in the Congo. This plant is owned and operated by the Virunga National Park. As the New York Times wrote in 2017, these plants, quote, may save a park and aid a country. This is because due to the difficulty of grid construction, the park's management has not been able to use the power that they've created right away. Instead, in 2020, it started to mine Bitcoin with the surplus energy. Now, normally generating energy right, revenue right away from a remote power plant in the mountains or jungles or deserts is nearly impossible because the energy is not connected to the customer. But with Bitcoin, the facility can profit even without distribution lines or local demand. This time of when you generate revenues is critically important to any business. Now, as the local demand rises, the miners will eventually turn off. The Bitcoin miners need prices in the range of two to five cents per kilowatt to run profitably, profitably generally. 
but practically every other electricity user will pay more. So if, when there is competition for the energy that Bitcoin miners are buying, the miners will tur turn off their machines. And this addresses something that people often misunderstand, that Bitcoin mining is competing for energy. It's generally using energy that is wasted or not used by others. And these are not the only examples of projects of this happening today. We have TerraWolf, which raised $200 million to build a zero uh, carbon mining effort. We have the Grid Infrastructure Project, which is profitably and vertically integrated Bitcoin mining that owns both the energy infrastructure and the mining. And last year, Compass Mining announced that they were working with a nuclear fission company to divert excess energy produced from the microreactors towards Compass's Bitcoin mining rigs. Now, overall, today, Bitcoin miners and companies are increasingly helping create a greener future. And at least the Bitcoin system is rapidly shifting towards renewables. All right, so we've discussed this. The next thing to talk about, regardless of your thoughts on Bitcoin and its energy implications, it's here to stay. Now, as some Bitcoin, as some members of the media, politicians, and activists have tried to make Bitcoin the boogeyman for its energy impact, they act particularly foolish when they call for banning or heavily regulating Bitcoin mining in the United States. And this is increasingly common to hear comments like that or to have hearings on the topic of banning Bitcoin mining. Now, obviously, we've already examined how Bitcoin's environmental impact is more nuanced than most people give it credit for. But moreover, the call to ban Bitcoin mining belies people's lack of understanding of what Bitcoin is and how it operates. Bitcoin does not have an, an off button. While the internet was built to survive a nuclear holocaust apocalypse, nuclear apocalypse, Bitcoin will sur similarly survive as long as there are people in the world who want Bitcoin and there is a functioning network. Even if you ban its use or mining in the United States, the network will not go away. But here's what could happen. And this is a bit of speculation. But whereas today, much of Bitcoin mining is done at an industrial or business level scale, those American companies could not operate here. But average people could still use their ASICs and mine Bitcoin with relative impunity. To the extent that governments could stop Bitcoin mining in the United States or in the EU, large scale mining could go to almost any other entity in the internet with access to power. Now, uh, uh, this is funny, uh, Dr. Strangelove, how he le learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. I thought that was pretty appropriate. Now, my background is in, originally was in intellectual property. There's something known as the Berne Convention that provides copyright protections all over the world. And it's part of the reason that when companies like the Pirate Bay were banned in most of the world, they had to shift to third world developing countries or even non-countries such as Sealand, uh, which we have a, a slide on next. Now the ban of, of Pirate Bay and other uh, pirate websites demonstrates how difficult it is to truly shut these things off from the face of the earth. But what's interesting is a company like Pirate Bay has difficulty actually monetizing what they do. Uh, this is because they don't make that much money necessarily. It's difficult to get advertisements for what they're doing because no reputable company would get advertisements. I don't mean to say that they make no money. They certainly have some money, but it's difficult for them to monetize. This is not true with Bitcoin. So you could have a burn convention of Bitcoin, ban it all over the world, but there's still a profit incentive that is significantly higher. And even for piracy with relatively minimal profit incentive for the underlying actors. That's impossible to ban. Similarly, it's impossible to ban Bitcoin mining. Now we saw what happened when China banned cryptocurrency. Billions of dollars of uh, banned mining cryptocurrency. Billions of dollars of mining operations simply moved to the United States instead. And in that case, it actually made Bitcoin mining greener because China primarily used coal for mining, whereas the US has a more focus on renewables. Now, if the United States were to ban Bitcoin mining, it would simply be denying the network some of the largest and cheapest sources of sustainable energy on the planet. Logically, miners would migrate elsewhere and simply continue mining while using much more carbon intensive energy stacks. So, so long as Bitcoin has value, miners will be incentivized to create it. And if the US pushes mining to other countries, to countries with less rule of law and regulation, 
Do we think that Bitcoin mining in the United States, Bitcoin mining will become less dirtier when it's done in rogue countries? Banning Bitcoin mining in the United States is merely outsourcing Bitcoin mining to dirtier countries, and it would make the overall cost of Bitcoin worse, not cleaner. All right, we're, we're almost done, guys. Thanks for sticking with me. Uh, we're on our nearly our last section, which is the value of Bitcoin. Now, we've examined a lot today to understand Bitcoin and the environment. But what often gets lost in this conversation is that so much technology and industry has some environmental costs, yet we choose to use it. And while we try to make it greener, we don't write off a technology simply because it's not net zero. Let's imagine that airplanes were invented today. We wouldn't say that airplanes are suspect because they aren't a net positive for the environment. They aren't. And we don't freeze in time all technology before we were more woke on environment from the previous times as grandfathered in and okay, and then condemn all technologies that come thereafter with any environmental impact. And even for airplanes, today we are on the cusp of a new age of supersonic travel, which is more likely to use even more energy. We are on the golden age of commercial space travel, yet few condemn the goal of weekly or daily space missions for its environmental costs. And the reason is because we recognize the value in each. There is a value in flying and connecting society. There is a value, at least to the consumer, in flying faster, faster than the speed of sound. And there is a value in weekly or daily space missions, even though rocket engines are not particularly clean. So what is the value of Bitcoin, the value that justifies its energy impact? I would argue it's significant. Bitcoin has a value. The idea of adding a payment layer to the internet is one with a long history. And increasingly today, Americans are using less and less actual cash, instead using digital payments. Now, as many people in this room likely know, credit cards charge a 2% fee on all transactions. That is a huge tax on the economy. In some quarters, this interchange fee appears to be higher than Walmart's net profit margin. Think about that for a second. Those who are international in the audience may have to uh, do some research on U.S. interchange fees because they're actually quite different, at least in the United States, higher than Walmart's net profit margin for some quarters. The SWIFT network is roughly 50 years old, and while a substantial update has been made with the global payment innovation system, this does not appear to have been widely adopted. And that means that settlements still take days. The average cost for setting remittances remains 6%. Bitcoin's value is certainly subjective, but priced on the open market, it provides one measure of Bitcoin's financial value. Bitcoin market capitalization, the price market multiplied by its total supply, is currently over $800 billion. The collective judgment of the global market, the participants in the global market, is to find Bitcoin as worth more than the three largest metals, as the third largest metal, as nearly as valuable as silver. If compared to currencies, Bitcoin would rate, be rated as the 15th largest, around the size of the Russian ruble. If compared to corporations, Bitcoin would be the 8th largest, just ahead of TSMC and behind Meta, Facebook. In the broadest sense, it doesn't follow that Bitcoin mining is wasted energy at the point where individuals and firms in an open market are willing to pay for it. But more specifically, however, I would argue that Bitcoin provides immense value to society. The backbone of the global financial system, SWIFT and its correspondent banking system, was developed in the 1970s, an analog solution unfit for the digital age. The Bank of International Settlements has commented on this trend, detailing how correspondent banking relationships are declining while costs remain high in Latin America and Africa, and cross-border settlement volumes have increasingly flowed to alternatives. Now, while Smith Swift had a major update several years ago, as I already alluded to, again, this has not been widely adopted. But nonetheless, it still requires banking infrastructure, banking infrastructure from the past. Here's what matters. Most people in the world lack access to a bank. And the frictions associated with cross-border payments have given rise to a number of alternative solutions. 
as many of you know, some of you represent. These solutions are the latest in fintech. They are private blockchains. They are CBDCs. They are other cryptocurrencies. And they are Bitcoin. Now, each of these systems has distinct features, benefits, and risks. And as of now, it's unclear which of these solutions will capture the majority of cross-border capital flows. But nonetheless, the technology that we use to replace the legacy system will have profound implications on the global economy. Ultimately, the market will decide which of these solutions is best. Today, Bitcoin has the largest market penetration and market cap of any cryptocurrency, with over 100 million users and adoption rates on par or greater than internet adoption in the mid-90s. But it isn't just a market that's choosing Bitcoin. It's the people who need the alternative financial tools the most. Today, over 1.3 billion people live in countries with double or triple digit inflation. Billions more live without basic property rights or access to the internet, where access to the internet is more common than access to a bank account. Despite its volatility, Bitcoin provides some monetary certainty. Now, it's difficult for Americans to see this monetary certainty, but let's compare it to the Venezuelan Bolivar. The famed economist Hernando de Soto has written extensively about the link of economic growth and development to securing property rights, particularly focusing on countries just like these. Now, as Bitcoin guarantees property rights and provides effectively a bank account on your phone, it is likely to be a key factor in lifting these economies out of poverty and into a developed economy. Now, the overwhelming majority of the world today is forced to use a currency that is other than the dollar, the pound, the euro, the yen, and the renminbi. In short, billions live without the same currency assurances those in highly industrialized economies are accustomed to. As an example of this, it recently hit home to me a few years ago because I have family members in India that woke up one day to find their large denomination bills as effectively no longer legal currency effectively confiscated. Now, unsurprisingly, data shows that Bitcoin adoption is disproportionately high in places that are marred with high inflation, weak respect for property rights, and poor governance, which are often the same areas underserved by swift and correspondent banking. Now, while Bitcoin is far from the only solution for individuals facing these circumstances, today, it is the money trusted by the world's activists by the world's most vulnerable to financial censorship, surveillance, and repression. The Human Rights Foundation's Alex Gladstein has documented this trend over the years. His reporting demonstrates how pro-democracy activists in Belarus and Hong Kong, how the feminist coalition in Nigeria, and how the women's rights activists in Afghanistan all trust Bitcoin to enable their fight for basic civil liberties. In short, Bitcoin is worth its energy usage because it's an open source solution to current payment frictions and sets the standard for what a global, natively digital monetary network should look like. Bitcoin was the first system to achieve distributed consensus in an adversarial environment, reliably securing hundreds of billions of dollars over the last decade, with over a 99% uptime. Now, of the aforementioned solutions to the need for digital money, there is compelling evidence to assert that Bitcoin is the most proven, the most reliable, the most secure. But even if you disagree, and I know many of you work for alt currencies, and maybe you think that Bitcoin will be replaced by these, the existence of Bitcoin ensures accountability in the proliferation of alternative solutions through competition. Bitcoin works today. It has desirable qualities for the monetary network that are embedded into its code like property rights, open access, equal representation. In a world without Bitcoin, prop proponents of alternative solutions would have the burden to prove that theirs is not just superior to the legacy system, but also to Bitcoin itself. And I should add, it's an active competition. Bitcoin can change, and new layers built on top of it will leave significant room for innovation, such as the Lightning Network. Now, if alternative solutions don't match up, the market will continue to move to Bitcoin. In this way, Bitcoin holds whatever blockchain solutions we develop to a high standard of openness, fairness, privacy protection, and security. All right, so in conclusion, 
We've already gone through how most projections on the future of Bitcoin's energy use are based upon faulty premises. We've examined how most of Bitcoin's use is more sustainable than other energy sources and how the counterfactual, what would have been done if not for the Bitcoin transaction, is likely to have also been quite energy intensive. Energy intensive likely using a much dirtier mix. We've examined how proof of work is central to the innovation of Bitcoin and it has a unique value, albeit that uses energy to work. It requires energy. We've examined how a number of the, uh, Bitcoin has a number of pro-environmental aspects that are still undercovered and underexplored. We've examined how banning Bitcoin mining is just not practical. And such, locale, such actions will simply outsource Bitcoin mining to even dirtier geographies. And we've analyzed, or I've at least stated, that Bitcoin has a substantial value. Overall, based upon these, it's clear that the environmental concerns of Bitcoin's impact are overblown. In fact, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Bitcoin could face play a much stronger role in a greener future. That said, I'm the first to acknowledge these questions are complicated ones and they require further examination, rigorous examination, academic evaluation. This is why I helped found, help co-found the Bitcoin Policy Institute, where we will be evaluating these issues more concretely to separate the facts from the fiction, regardless of where the facts lead us. We are not denialists who are not concerned by the environmental questions, quite the opposite. We think this is extremely important and topical, and these are questions that we need to resolve to the extent we can. Now, if you are interested, I hope you will reach out to us and help us work on these important issues. Thank you. some questions. Uh, Derek said they'll be available for a couple minutes. Take this off. Um, tomorrow, so if you need to leave, by all means, please do. We start tomorrow morning at 8.30 uh, in the morning. Tomorrow we're going to be focusing much more on the legal. But Derek, if you've got a couple minutes and if anybody has some questions, that was a fantastic presentation. I, I'm sorry due to the time. I know a lot of people had to leave, but we did record it and it will be on our YouTube channel and we've got a fairly large uh, following. I also want to introduce you to uh, Bruce Porter. Is Bruce here? I guess I think he's probably already left. Um, Bruce has a following of about two million people, and so he, talk to yeah, he's doing interviews uh, for for uh, those of us. So we will get you in touch with Bruce. Okay. Um, and again, uh, that was such a great presentation. We definitely want to uh, blast that out. So uh, on our YouTube channel, you'll find this presentation, guys. Please hit it and um, and, and promote it. Um, but I'm sure some people have some questions, and there may be, be even some people that disagree with you. Okay. Um, and incidentally, uh, Priya, could you come up to the stage for just a second? Um, Priya leads our sustain, uh, and I, I never get it right, even though I think I, I was the one that came up with it, sustainable environmental stewardship, and she's going to be hosting our event in May, Okay. Uh, and I think I mentioned before, we'll oh, be there. I would love to have my team uh, meet with you and That's get nice. to uh, know your work. Nice yeah. to meet you. So uh, that event will be the Mayflower Hotel. We have three floors, I think it's seven ballrooms, 12 breakout rooms. We're going to be covering uh, environmental, uh, sustainable environmental resources from a variety of perspectives, healthcare, technology, everything like that. Um, Priya is, is the lead in, in designing that program, but um, uh, yeah, so it'll, it'll be great. So Priya, I don't know if you want to see it. Let, let's get some questions for you. Does anybody have any questions that they have for Derek? Absolutely, Sounds like she has, a, she has some questions. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then, I'm going to ask my questions from there. So that's okay, yeah, that's great. But, but anybody, anybody who's interested in that event, please touch base with, uh, with Maria. You can ask your question yeah. on the main mic. I don't want to, uh, on the camera. Yeah. Okay, I have the question um, okay. before me, so I let him go first. You have sure. questions for Derek? And, and thank you guys for saying. I think this is very, very meaningful because a lot of people would disagree with you, and you, and you presented a lot of facts. And what we really need to do is bring both sides uh, to the good. table. And, and, and so, any questions? And by the way, anybody who wants to after this, we're going to be meeting on the rooftop of the um, Washington Hotel for food and drinks and stuff like that. So if you'd like to jo just join and hang out, we'd be uh, happy to see you there. Okay. Well, uh, you can, you know, just, you can shout. I'll, re I'll reiterate your question if you like. 
Yeah, just go ahead and shout your question out. He'll, re he'll, he'll repeat it. So my, my name is Ryan Cooper. I represent Bowie State University. Uh, the Bowie State University Blockchain Association Club. He, he's just, the president of this, <laughs> the club. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there's anything that we can do globally for uh, HBCU, historically black colleges and universities, to try to reach out to them. I know about Mouse Belt University. Mm -hmm. I know about uh, Ripple doing things with Morgan State University, but I'm just curious, if, is, is there anything that you can do to try to replicate and reinforce what we're trying to do? Sure, so Ryan's asking about how historically black colleges can get more involved on this and other related issues. Uh, we'd love to work with you, uh, I guess is the best uh, answer to your question. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, the black community disproportionately is using cryptocurrencies and uh, the reason why is interesting and how cryptocurrencies are more appealing to this community or solving more problems in their community is important. So I think stories from historically black colleges talking about how the existing banking system has historically failed uh, this community and how Bitcoin is hopefully more democratic and more open. It doesn't mean that things are perfect, but historically has been much better. I think those anecdotes and stories are great, helping uh, unbanked populations uh, but would love to work with you because that is actually very important to our mission, what we're doing. Can I, can I Did I adequately uh, capture your question? Right, Ryan, don't go anywhere. Um, so uh, we've got a close relationship with the um, Minority Business Development Agency in the Department of Commerce, right? I don't, I don't know if you met um, uh, J.R. J. R. Vagany, right? So uh, we, what I'd love to do is, and when you said um, disproportionately, disproportionately high or low? Oh, disproportionately high. Okay. Yes. So uh, what I'd like to do, and I'm offering this as a GBA, we'll do a, at least a Zoom call in, in the near distance future talking about this topic and, and minorities, right? And let's, let's get some folks from uh, the uh, Minority Business Development Agency and even possibly maybe Robert, Dr. Robert Brown. I don't know if you had a chance to hear his, his talk. Um, and then we'll invite you, and let's let's talk about how that can be a good thing. But, and Ryan, why don't we work together to, to plan that? Happy to help out. Thanks for the question. Great, great. great. Uh, Terry, great presentation. I mean, I lead Sustainable Environmental Stewardship Group, and I'm the UK President for Government Blockchain Association. Um, I have to say, I was very courageous of you to <laughs> find Bitcoin Policy Institute because as Sustainable Environmental Stewardship, I know how much wrath I get from people that how do I even talk about blockchain and sustainability in ones and tens? Uh, to the point that one person actually who was interviewing me for an opportunity refused because I was related to blockchain. So, uh, well done you. But I think my question is, why Bitcoin Policy Institute? And was it because Bitcoin was receiving more rats than the other cryptocurrencies? Why not Cryptocurrency Policy Institute? And uh, is it just proof of work? You're a fan of proof of work? Just the story behind that, I think. Sure, great question, and would love to work with you. Uh, and and uh, I do have some clarification in some of my remarks. So I hope nothing came across um, incorrect, but I can uh, correct after the record if there are some errors. Uh, we, we came together on this issue because we believe that Bitcoin faced unique policy challenges. It is the, you know, obviously the vast majority of currency, uh, of cryptocurrency, but yet it faces unique policy challenges, specifically related to proof of work, but not exclusively. There are other ones that are relatively unique, and we felt like it wasn't getting um, particular representation on that issue. There are definitely organizations, and we work with a lot of them, that are doing fantastic work in this town. Some of them are in this room or hopefully watching in the, the live stream. But we felt like when the conversation was all broader cryptocurrency, proof of work often wasn't adequately represented. And an example of this is the January 20th energy uh, hearing, where they were on, the hearing was on the energy use of Bitcoin mining. And there were essentially no representatives of the Bitcoin mining community at that hearing. Now, luckily, we had some, uh, some fans, some advocates on our side. It wasn't like we had zero representation, but we didn't feel like there was adequate representation on these issues. We also felt like these questions haven't been adequately explored. It's not like there's a simple answer. A lot of my slides, it's not simple, and I'm not trying to say that it is simple. And so we felt like there's a lot of work to do, and there are unique challenges, and that we can be allies with the other organizations and other currencies. 
join us for the May event, Sustainable okay. Economic Growth, for those who don't know. We, GBA is hosting another event in May from 25th to 27th, Sustainable Economic Growth, and the title is Let Thousand Flowers Bloom. And the idea is that how can blockchain help uh, sustainable and resilient turn, uh, turn into a sustainable and resilient economy, how blockchain can help with science, technology, and a uh, resilient ecosystem, basically, and we'll be covering all of those topics and much more, and their presence would be really, really appreciated. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. So much. And bring a flak jacket. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions before we wrap up? Guys, did you guys learn anything today? Was, uh, was today a good day? Oracle. Yeah. Oracle. <laughs> you, you know what I learned today? Um, is that Bitcoin uh, wasn't, uh, didn't come into being to replace the fiat system. It came to compete with it. That was my, that was my big takeaway from today. But Ralph, was that your comment? No, it was no. a good one, so yeah. I'll take credit for it. Okay. <laughs> but, Gerard, if I can just have one tiny little point, it would be more respectful to call the uh, incumbent system a fiduciary system rather than a fiat system. Yeah. Fiat sounds, fiat was coined to sound arbitrary and to sound artificial. Yeah. Uh, uh, can, yeah. Can, I, I just want to repeat your point because it was really, he said, that rather than call it a fiat system, we should call it a fiduciary system because the folks that manage it see themselves as fiduciaries, meaning taking responsibility for it. And, and I think that that's a much more respectful term. With regard to that, we welcome a, a diversity of opinions we believe that people ought to come and disagree respectfully, make, make their cases, and hopefully we, we learn from it. Unfortunately, I, I believe the world right now is, has too much of this. Uh, we can't disagree with each other or we're, we're offended or we're, we're canceled or whatever, right? I, I like kind of offending people, right? But I like to do it respect, respectfully, so. Well, Lord, you can get Fiat Motors to sponsor you. Fiat Motors, I like that. And stick with Fiat. <laughs> Until that <laughs> uh, no more free publicity to Fiat Motors. All right, uh, Derek, thank you so much. Uh, we'll see if you guys want to. We'll be at the rooftop of the uh, Washington Hotel. Does anyone else have any questions? I wanted to make sure I answer the questions. I think we're good. Your, your presentation was very thorough. I, I did have two quick uh, corrections. I, I don't like to say something wrong. So sustainable and renewable are commonly not synonyms. Uh, I, I use them perhaps as synonyms. Uh, so I just wanted to make that clarification. Usually sustainable includes nuclear. Uh, and so generally I meant uh, sustainable including nuclear, that's, that's my position. Uh, I also uh, wanted to, um, uh, I think that was, that was the main correction I, I, I noticed in, in recollection, but uh, if I made any other errors, you know, this is a work in progress. We got other experts working on our team. So please message me and I'll correct the record on, online if possible, because I want things to be rigorous and that's, that's our goal. How about putting Due to modesty. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, uh, if you want to do any kind of follow-up, right, uh, what I would say is, um, uh, what would I say? <laughs> time. we got to go. All right. <laughs> you, thank you, Jordan. Jordan keeps me straight. Every time I mess up, he's the one that gets me back on track. So, and Evan, thank you, you very tweet much. Tweet at me. I respond to it. Okay. What's your, tweet? What's your address? Uh, at Derek Khanna, D E R E K K H A N N A. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 8 30.